glad to be here this evening. I ask uh, the pastor, do you think anybody's going to come out for two continuous services like that? He said, you just get here, the people will be here. I'm glad to see you. I was beginning to wonder I was going to preach to five people. <laughs> but uh, we're going to go over a few things this evening. And uh, how many people here have never heard the word Illuminati before? Oh boy, I have a problem here. Uh, rather than go over the history of what it is and how it came into being, I'm going to concentrate on what it's doing today. Now many of you accept too many things that are just because they're there, and you don't question why are they there. So many things in America we've accepted as normal because we're used to them. And we've grown to accept them, and that's just exactly what the Illuminati wants you to do. Now, I promised the teenagers the other day that I wasn't going to let their parents off any easier than I let them off. So you've got it coming to you. But uh, quickly to tell some of the people some things. The Illuminati is an organization that the Luciferian religion or religion of the occult or witchcraft or paganism or the force or whatever you want to call it is its religion and its priests are those of witchcraft but it is a political financial organization and real quickly um, well, rather than have you take out a one dollar bill or any of that you can do that later I'll draw you this and try to explain the Illuminati through this and then we'll go on with the, the teaching I'm not used to one of these things I'm used to a blackboard so we'll try the best Now, I only write the stories that took publication. I, oh, now I've learned. Okay, we'll just roll it over. We go from this direction. Which direction? This way? Oh, okay. I was wondering why everybody was laughing. I knew I wasn't that bad of an artist. I'm terrible, but not that bad. We do it right. Yeah, we did do it right. How about that? This is the Illuminati. I'll describe it before I describe myself. The I in there means Lucifer, and the capstone is a Rothschild. And if you notice, it's suspended from the pyramid because the Rothschilds are considered deities, supernatural beings dwelling in human bodies, gods to be worshipped, not human beings. And so they are the Godhead, and their priest is the Council of Thirteen or the Grand Druid Council which I was a member of. So the things I'm saying, I'm saying from here, up where I know what took place. The next council is the Council of 33. That is the 33 highest initiate masons in the world. And the next is the Council of 500. That is what many people refer to as the Bilderbergers. That's the people you make rich every time you go shopping. Now, where I come from is the Todds were originally called the Collinses, the particular branch of the family that I'm from, and they have been in the Illuminati since May 1st, 1776, when it was organized. In fact, they were one of the organizing families. They were also uh, the originators of witchcraft within the United States. They brought it here in 1626. So this is where I came from. I was raised a witch, and all my life I thought I was into witchcraft till 1970 when I shot and killed an officer in, in Germany after re-enlisted, and the Illuminati stepped in with the aid of a senator that later became attorney general and a congressman and about three generals from the Pentagon ordering my immediate honorable discharge and the destructions of my military records and court-martial records, which was done. And then I learned that witchcraft was more than just casting spells, that there were political and financial people involved in this thing. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. Rather than being a lot of people like Gary Allen, who starts back in 1776, I'm going to start at an interesting time. I'm going to start in December 1963. The reason I'm starting there is that is the time uh, in fact, the 21st of December 1963, that it was decided that the Christian church, the fundamental Christian church, 
was a threat to the Illuminati within the United States. And at that time, they thought they could take care of it by infiltration, by bribing, by blackmail, and by scandal. Now, as of a year ago, they decided that that's useless and that the only answer to the Christian church is to burn it to the ground. And we'll be talking about quite a few things like that today. But this is what I came off of. And at that time, the reason, I'm going to say a few things. If they're contrary to things you've heard before, traditional, just pray for me. I'm sure they're going to be. The reason that the Christian church became a threat to the Illuminati is that a particular president existed that time. And that president, through the man that helped set up the Bay of Pigs in invasion, became a Christian. It was one for the Lord, and that's John Kennedy. And because of this, they thought they could threaten and force him back in. They tried for three months. In fact, 30 days before his death, the Pope ordered him to Rome to appear before him and accept communion at his hand. And Kennedy walked out of the Vatican refusing communion. And that's when they decided that he had to go. So he ordered his death. So if you're wondering they're ever going to solve the Kennedy assassination, don't you believe it? Now, I, when I joined the Illuminati, knowing, I guess I was a member of the Illuminati since I was 14, but I did not know it was the Illuminati. Now, I'm going to give you a chance to ask some questions, and the reason I'm going fast is I have to leave here and go preach a service. So uh, I'm going to try to go through some of these things and wise you up to some of the things the Illuminati has been doing to the Christian church. That's all I'm going to concentrate on is what they've been doing to the Christian church. And then I'm going to let you ask a lot of questions and try and go back over the pieces I've skipped over by accident. Now, when they decided to do this, they knew that demons were very real. There's nobody that's ever come out of the occult that would say that the devil's not as active as he was during the time of Jesus and therefore neither is his army. And they're extremely real today. I, I would like to say more than ever, but I'm sure they were just as real in Jesus' time. And they know that there are weak Christians as well as there are strong Christians. There's two types of Christians, and they're familiar with this. In fact, I learned this in witchcraft, not in the Christian church. There are Christians who have accepted Jesus as Savior, and there are Christians who have accepted him as Lord. And there is a difference. In fact, I was telling the pastor's wife I love the gate of trio because I've learned more about the Lordship of Christ listening to their music and their testimonies than probably anybody else. And they have a beautiful illustration on one of their live albums of where the woman's two-year-old boy was down at a picnic and the grandmother and him was playing ball with plastic ball and bat. And he got mad and threw the bat down and started stamping on the ground and says, Grandma, you missed my bat again. You missed my bat again. And that's just about us when we get in trouble or when we don't think the Lord did it our way. We say, Lord, you missed my bat again. That's because we're trying to run it and tell the Lord what to do. Now that's being Savior. When he's Lord, we say, Lord, what am I supposed to do for you today? How do you want it run? And there's a difference. And they know the difference in the occult world. And they try to keep everybody at the Savior station. They figure they've lost them anyway, but they'd like to make their testimony so weak and so void that they're not a threat to them. And they use several things to do it. Their number one instrument in destroying a Christian's strength is music. Now, I'm sure a lot of you parents had great testimonies and your kids going home about how great a speaker I am and so on on rock music. Uh, that's because my favorite thing is to burn rock music. I just get such a pleasure out of destroying that garbage. And there's a reason that I get that pleasure. I used to lead Zodiac Productions, the largest rock booking concert agency in the United States. They've decided they ought to change their name. They do this quite often, the Illuminati change their name around. But at that time, they're the main reason that the Beatles and the Stones and Crosby, Still, Nash and Young and uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival and other groups that belong to the occult had concerts in this country. They have now had such influence, and since the Illuminati has bought most of their record companies anyway, 
You cannot produce records in this country as a new group getting started like KISS unless you are a member of some occult brotherhood and have an initiation scar on your wrist. Now, I was shocked that one of the young people here knew a particular story that happened about six months ago. KISS was having a press conference of our new album they were releasing, and this press conference was being held in Hollywood over at one of the record companies. And somebody said, well, KISS, that's a strange name. What's it all about? And the guy stood up and says, well, I guess we ought to tell you all about ourselves. We didn't get together and form our own group. We were told to form this group by our ministers, by our church. And they said, oh, we didn't know you were Christians. Oh, I like the way the guy thinks. And he said, oh, we're not. We're Satanists. We, and they all pulled out their minister's cards and showed they were priests of the Satanic Brotherhood of America. And they said, oh, and they, they kind of skipped over. They were trying to get away from it. They didn't realize they weren't going to get away from it. And, the new, and one of the guys stood up and says, oh, well, you know all the teeny boppers really, really like you. And they say, well, we're not too interested in the girls. We all like the guys. And they all said they were homosexuals except one. That destroyed some of the girls the other day. And then they went on to say, by the way, our name means kings in satanic service. That's what KISS stood for. Now that's just one group. A lot of them are out there. Uh, most of the groups pick their names for their band according to which language. Now how many sea beers do we have here that talk on the CB? Come on, you can confess that. The Lord will forgive you. Okay. Now, I have a CB in my car. I try to not to use it unless I have to. But I have learned one thing, that supposedly CBers talk in what is called English. I'm not so sure some of the times. But you know what I mean. They have the words smoky and uh, tin four and everything else and on down the road and so on. Okay, they have a set of code words. Unless you know what they're, you know, what they're talking in, it's a lot like what the teenagers talk in today. Unless you know what they're talking in, you can't understand the conversation. Well, the witches have had a language for several thousand years old that they communicate in. And it's English, I think. And it consists of many words. It means many, you know, phrases and so on. They call them, actually, what they call it is witches' roots. R-U-D-E-S, roots. And most of the rock music is written in which language, okay? And many of the groups pick their names by phrases out of the witchcraft Bible, the Book of Shadows. And uh, the Beatles, now, there's one of the most potent charms within witchcraft is the scarab, which is a beetle. And that's why they chose it. Most people who are great beetle fans, and this goes back to some of the Ulsters here, uh, do not realize what the occult calls the Beatles. They call them the four prophets, the four angels from Lucifer. And they believe in them so strongly that for the first time in witchcraft history, a record album and the words of that record album have been adopted as part of the witchcraft Bible, the Book of Shadows. And that was the double white album that the Beatles song. They consider every song on there to be a prophecy from Lucifer of the end times. Okay? Just to give you a little clue. Now, don't rush out and buy one, but you can rush home and burn the one you got. Now, I know a lot of the rock singers firsthand because of booking and because many of them were in occult brotherhoods that I used to go and minister at and so on when I was and was over. Three Dog Night all came out of one coven in Tempe, Arizona. And uh, I know Santana, they were brought up from, from down in South America and his brother started another group. And I know many of the groups. In fact, my closest friend in the world is David Crosby from Crosby, Still, Nash & Young. And I saw him, in fact, I'd like you to pray for him because I do really feel for him. I saw him about three days before Christmas last year, and the man is almost dead. He's on $200 a day worth of cocaine. And I talked with him, I said, you know, I've been out of this a long time, Dave. I'd like to know, 
So they still require at the record company that when a song is ready to be pressed, in other words, the records are pressed and sent out, is it required over in one of the temple rooms? See, most of you don't know that all the major record companies have a room set aside about this size for a witchcraft coven to come in and do right that for the company. I said, is it still required for the coven to come in and perform a spell over the music so that people will buy it? They said, oh yes. Now the reason for rock music is not to make money. The Illuminati doesn't need money. They got most, probably 99, 9 of the money in the world. They don't need money. What they want with rock music is the same reason that they created the jewelry I'll be talking about in a moment. And that is to weaken your Christian life. Now when a record is done, the priest of that coven ordered demons to follow, one demon to follow every rock record that comes off of that master copy. Now if you don't think it's done, too bad. I want you to stop and ask yourself, what strong Christian, what soul winning Christian do you know that plays rock music? I've made a statement many times in my meetings. You show me a strong Christian, and don't come up and tell me you're a strong Christian and got the rock music, because I'll set you down and we'll go over your life. I've never met one. There isn't any. Only weak Christians listen to rock music. By the way, only weak Christians witness, listen to Jesus rock music also. Now, I know a little story about Jesus rock, as we're talking about infiltration. I was in Phoenix on a guest speaking tour. I was living in San Antonio. I was there on a function at one of the Grand Druid meetings. In fact, it was an extremely important meeting that was taking place that was discussing the destruction of Jerry Falwell's church. Oh, yeah. All the big churches are discussed one time or the other. And when we were there, I was given a check that was made out on the Lords of London Bank in London that, well, that's where it originated. It was actually made out on the Chase Manhattan Bank here, but it was funds from that bank. It was stamped on it. And it was to be delivered to a Reverend Chuck Smith, Costa Mesa, California. Now, old Chucky, he had started out with, and started a thing called the Jesus People. That's really where it got started with him. And the occult got very upset. The Illuminati was extremely upset because ministers were standing up and preaching against rock music and the kids were burning their music. Now, they just couldn't stand the idea that these demons weren't in Christians' homes and affecting Christians' lives. And they couldn't understand. It was puzzled me how the Christians found out about this. We thought we were so carefully had it hidden that we couldn't understand why Christian ministers were preaching against rock since they didn't know the real reason. But something inside ministers across the country was saying, this is wrong. So how do you get these demons, these same demons, in the people's hands if they're not going to play the rock, you make it Christian. Standard term in, in the Illuminati, so you can't beat them, join them. So this $4 million check was the second $4 million this man had received in, the, in a two-year period. And with it, he built Maranatha Productions. And Maranatha Productions started what we call today Jesus Rock. Now, watch out. I'm going to give you a little warning. The Illuminati just bought the biggest Christian record and music company in the United States and probably in the world about a year ago. And already we're seeing a change in the music. They bought Word Ministries in Texas. RCA bought them up. And RCA belongs to the Illuminati. And they've already brought out a company called Murr. Okay? And Murr's emblem is the ruins of Stonehenge. That's one of the strongest witchcraft sites. That would be for a witch to go to Stonehenge would be like a Christian to go to Bethlehem. It's that holy of a place in the occult. And they mark their records. And one particular witch we can't stand that a lot of Christians have in their home, we enjoy burning her records as much as we enjoy burning the Beatles. And that's Honey Tree. And she sings for them. Now, we know many of these people because they started out in rock music and they were ordered over into the Christian rock. So if I can get you Christian rock music, that's almost as fun as getting your rock music. 
Now, the other thing that I want to say before we get back to politics a second is this. Five years ago, I could stand in a meeting and say, this is how you tell a witch, by their jewelry, and this, these are the symbols. I can't do that today because the Christians are wearing the same jewelry. Now, most people don't know the significance of an inanimate object when its creation was ordered by the devil. Now, I don't think anybody here doubts that the Word of God was ordered by the Holy Spirit through man. Well, certain writings and certain pieces of jewelry were ordered by the devil through occult people. And these pieces of jewelry mean things you don't know. Now, about three years ago, the occult changed all the names to these pieces of jewelry. What they've been called for thousands of years, they changed their names and called them something else. Some of the names don't even make sense. And then they started selling them through several major companies that they owned, federal department stores, which meant that they sold them through Sears and Pennies. Then they sold and uh, Kmart and Gold Circle and so on. Then they sold them through Standard Oil store Montgomery Ward. And then they wanted to get them into everybody's homes that maybe didn't buy them in the store, so they sold them through Avon. And Avon's catalog this year is unreal. It's got more jewelry in it from the occult than I've ever seen anywhere else. By the way, if you buy from Avon, we have a cassette tape, we don't have it with us, of a woman that's with Word of Life Ministries that was one of their biggest executives in Maryland. And she had to be delivered from demons because of the jewelry she was selling. And her testimony is outstanding of how she tried to kill herself just because the jewelry was in her house and the demonic activity that it created. So you might consider it twice. Now these are the symbols. I know I'm drawing them upside down again, but you'll get the message, I think. Now we're drawing them over there. Let me go over here. I'm not a good artist, but it'll give you some five-pointed star called the pentagram, or the pinnacle. The six-pointed star was originally called the hexagram or the crest of Solomon. It's always been used for demon worship. Just recently has anybody called it the Star of David. In fact, I'll tell you a little story about this. Two close, con well, one isn't a close friend, but the girl she lives with in marriage is. And there's this television star, and we're going to be talking about television in a minute, that a lot of you Christians probably think is a good, clean Christian show. And, or, I can't say a Christian show, a good, clean show that maybe you can slip by and your preacher won't skin you for it. And this woman is a homosexual that stars in the show. That's Cindy Williams from Laverne and Shirley. And she lives with a rock star named Carol King. Carol's an old friend of mine. And Cindy thought it was not fair that homosexuals weren't allowed to be ministers in witchcraft, that they could only be church members. So they started their own brotherhood, and they adopted the hexagram inside the circle. This means demonic possession in the occult. Boy, she hit it right on the button. They hit probably the two worst things, homosexuals and witches. The next one, and you'll see on many television stars, is the moon and the five-pointed star. It means you are an ordained priest or priestess of witchcraft. And I've seen many television stars lately wearing this on TV. That's because you're not supposed to know what it means. Now, last one, as I said, I'm not a good artist, is the Ankh. And now calling it the Cross of Life. They like to change the names of things. Now this is what it means. Don't come up and tell me it means a Christian symbol. I came out of the occult. They created that thing. I know what it means. It's not a Christian cross. In fact, it came from Egypt thousands of years before Christ ever walked the earth in a form of a human body. It means that you despise virginity, that you practice orgies, that you worship the sun god Ra, which is the Egyptian name for Lucifer, and that you believe in reincarnation, which means you don't believe in hell and you don't believe in, he in heaven. So if you don't believe any of these things, don't wear it. Now there's another one. I'm not too good of an artist. I can't draw. I can't draw these, come to think of it. And 
It's called now the Italian horn. I don't know why they call it that since it was invented in Ireland. But it's been called, the real names is the leprechaun staff, the fairy's wand, and the unicorn's horn. And it comes two ways. Sometimes it's a twisted horn like this, a spiral horn, and sometimes it's a curved horn. It means, literally, you trust the devil for your finance. Now, if you don't, you don't wear it. I'm so tired of seeing Christian ladies wearing this around their neck. I don't even talk to them. I tell them to take it off before I talk to them. I came out of that thing. Now, they got these in your hands for a reason. And the reason is this. These things attract demons. Believe me, they really do, especially with the six-pointed star. And if, in fact, we never conjured a demon that we didn't draw this on the floor for the demon to appear in the six-pointed one. In fact, the word to cast a bad spell, to hex somebody, comes from this star. That gives you kind of an idea of its evil. So I'm not, you know, I'm not against jewelry, or I would preach against all jewelry. I'm just against jewelry that the devil told people to create for his worship service and for his priesthood. And it doesn't have any place in a Christian's life. Now, I'll give you a little political thing. And before everybody rushes out of here tonight and sends telegrams off to Washington, D.C., I got saved out of the Illuminati. You can save the money of sending your telegrams. If they want to vote something through, they're going to vote it through, and you're never going to know about it. I'll give you a little tip of when the Illuminati is up to something in the United States. When you turn on your television set and you hear the senators are arguing over a certain bill in Washington, you've got to say, what are they really passing that we're not seeing while we're seeing this? Now, the whole reason for the Panama Canal and they plan on having the world before the Panama Canal ever falls in the hands of Panama, so they're not doing anything anyway. It's a smoke screen. In the time everybody's been concerned over the Panama Canal, four bills have been, five bills have been before Congress, and two of them have passed that you never heard about. And one, I understood, I believe, passed last week, or the week before, so I guess it's been three. The one that just passed is called House Bill 41. Beautiful little thing. It states in House Bill 41 that if your church is not a member of a denomination of the World Council of Church or the National Council of Churches, that you could lose your tax status. You must go through an investigation and a court hearing. Unless, and this little side thing, unless you have a membership of 500 of joining members of your church. So I think you're safe here, but a lot of churches aren't. Next, anybody that gives to a Christian organization separate from a member of a denomination of the National Council of Churches, there exists in this whole bill, the name of the people who give to them that claim tax deduction, name, address, phone number, and work address is to be printed in every post office in the United States for everybody to look at. Now, you may not think that's important. But I came out of a radical organization that's dying to find out who's spending money in the enemy camp and would love to pay you a very unfriendly visit with something come flying through your window some night. That goes boom, you know. So this bill is very important and it just got passed. Of course, you never heard about it. It's the bills you don't hear about that you have to worry about. There's one up for vote now that just came out of committee. It was voted down eight years ago and therefore some of you may know about it. But the president that we have now has considered it a necessary bill, so he's been pushing it. It's called the Genocide Act. Anybody ever heard of the Genocide Act? A few of you. Do you know that if you win somebody, even if they're over 21, and you win them from the faith that their parents bore, you know, bore them into, like Catholic, Jews, witchcraft, maybe a Methodist becomes born again, you know, something like this, they can have you arrested and tried for genocide and you can serve time in federal penitentiary for it if this law is passed. And it's going to get passed. Now, we read over where, at the other church where I'm at a document from a Senator Colon of Arizona who is a senator who sits on the Committee of International Banking for the United States and the Federal Reserve Commission and so on. And this letter was written in April 1777. Uh, in April of 1976, it said that at that moment, the Federal Reserve Act was ready to number 
everybody in the United States for the purpose of buying and selling and was going to by 1980. Now, how many heard or have saw or heard on the news the proposed United States security card? Anybody here? If you have, lift your hand so a few people know I'm not crazy. A couple. Okay. Now, we've got to look at this. And we thought it most interesting that our president bragged that he drew the card and designed it himself and everything on it. Considering that it's kind of an ivory pearl collar with a gray diagram with black typing over it. And the gray diagram consists of this. Can you see it? Somebody tell me what it is. 666. They call it the inverted 9. It's exactly what's on it. And if you go to the World Common... Excuse me, i got to give them credit, yeah. National or European Common Market Countries, you will find this on much of the clothing. Some years back when the currency was printed in 1973 in Brussels and we bought $10 billion of it, and we have letters to confirm it by senators that we did do this, uh, this world currency, this was on it. But then the president we have today said that his security card makes it so that nobody ever has to carry money anymore and that will stop robberies. He just carried the card. Now, if you don't think it's close, have you been noticing all the department stores placing computer cash registers in there lately? They're all hooked into a computer system. We'll go ahead and turn this thing off. Pastor, how do I turn it off? Make it hot over here. There is a computer system that many people have heard about in Brussels. Some of them have even heard there's a sister computer in Dallas. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. In Amsterdam. Thank you. In Amsterdam, that they call the beast. They're talking computers. Actually, the computer is larger than this sanctuary here. Just the computer, not the building. There is one just like it in Dallas, Texas, four stories below the IBM building. It's called the National Securities Computer. And as of the first of last year, the California National Guard switched their patch over to these three overlapping sixes. We have confirmed it. We haven't in, in uh, Georgia yet because we haven't had a chance to talk to anybody that's in the National Guard. But in Florida and Massachusetts and other states, we have confirmed that by the end of this coming year, all the National Guard was to switch their patch over to that 666. And they all have been hooked as the first of this year into the computer in Dallas. Now this is the computer center that all of the cash registers and all of the stores that are switching the computer cash registers are hooked into. And they in turn are hooked into Brussels and Amsterdam. Now that's a fact, that's not guesswork. Another fact is that all the stores within the next year and a half are to switch to some type of computer verification system. Even if it's just the thing that hooks into your phone for those two extra buttons on your phone that you can zip the card through and it gives a reading over the phone. That's because our president has said, and if you're wondering why that, I, just, I guess I don't like peanut pickers. I don't know. You'll have to excuse me. I know he's a fellow Georgian. I mean, if you want to claim him, you're welcome to him. Um, he has said that we need proof that everybody in the United States is a law-abiding citizen. I'm getting tired of hearing that term. He's wore it out a little. And that in order to check up on that, what better place than when somebody goes in to buy the groceries or the gasoline to check up on it. So everybody's to have a computer card. And of course, if you don't take the card, you can't buy anything and you're a bad citizen. Somewhere along the line, I think they thought you were going to get hunted down if you were a Christian. Believe me, the organized Christian church isn't going to say anything about it. Now, there's two doctrines. Both of them are pre-trib. One, you'll be here to see the mark, and some of you won't be here to see the mark passed out. Whether you believe it or not, it's, the mark is still coming. I'm just verifying it, so whichever way you want to believe. But the point is, they plan on passing this thing out in about a year and a half. They really do. They have everything being hooked up for it now. So the times are growing close, and this was all was planned out. 
Now, I'm going to give you a reading list before I go to questions and answers because I'm running short on time here and I want to donate some time to it. And the first book on the list is one of their books. Now, I tell Christians not to buy any occult books because of the demons that come with it. But this book isn't one of those. It's a political book written by them. And I want to give you a warning. You may not want to buy it after I say all about the book before I give its title. Some years back, 12 years ago, which makes the book so fantastic considering that when you get halfway into the book you find out we don't have any oil and all the coal mines are on strike and then they blow them up when they try to go back to work. Sound familiar? Written 12 years ago. Farmers are on strike too in the book. People are starving to death. Interesting. Anyway, this book was written at the order of Philip Rothschild and he chose one of his mistresses to write it who was already an author of many communist books and books in the world and she was very well known as a novice writer, as a novel writer. And so she wrote this cold book in the form of a novel, 1,100 pages long. Now, the only problem with it is since it was written a novel, it's like a lot of garbage that women read today from the book clubs and so on. You have some passages in that you ought to burn along with Mary Flint's magazine. But you, got, you could skip over them. I don't recommend it for anything but a serious student of the conspiracy. But it does give, after you get past the first 200 pages, they write the book very interesting. They write the book like you looking at the conspiracy and not knowing about it. And things happen in the newspaper and television. And you go, oh, well, that's just the times. And then they get in the three people planning the whole thing. They plan derailment of trains. And, in fact, I would say most of the book is about the derailment of trains and the coal strike and the lack of fuel. And then it goes into other things. But the book is called Atlas Shrugged, and like you shrug your shoulders. And I found it in almost every bookstore that I've been in, in Atlanta. So you shouldn't have any time problem finding it. Now for the good ones. There's one called None Dare Call... Now, before I give you Gary Allen's books, I want to tell you he's anti-Christian, but not in his books. He's just anti-Illuminatist. He's a member of the John Birch Society, and he kind of looks at the Illuminati one-sided, but it does give you some historical facts. None Dare Call Conspiracy, the Rockefeller Files. There's one more that he didn't write, but his name is on it because the man who wrote it wasn't well-known, and he came out of the Illuminati and he wanted to release the facts of a very strong, important person to the Rothschilds. And he wrote the book and Gary Allen had it printed with his name on it. And two weeks later, the real author of the book was killed. It's called Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter. There's more to your peanut picker than meets the eye than Billy Beer and Ruth Carter Stapleton. Now, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, one other one is a good Christian book called The Day the Dollar Dies. And you can, it's strange. I've been to probably 10 Christian bookstores in this city, and not one of them carry that book. And this is the first city I've been to that that book's not carried. And they don't know why it's not carried, except the owners of the bookstores have told them not to carry it. It's the only book they're not supposed to carry. So you might go in and say, I want it. <laughs> Maybe they'll, they'll get it for you. It's called The Day the Dollar Dies. Now, I'm going to open for questions. And uh, do me a favor. Before we get this, see, I, I, I handle questions across the United States, and by now I can probably ask them better than you can. Don't give me any personal incidences about spells and, and demons and stuff in your life. Maybe a personal interest, in, maybe if your path has crossed the Illuminati in some way, talk about that if you want to give a personal experience. But otherwise, let's stay to questions on things that have been said tonight and that are either confusing you or something you think somebody else ought to know or so on. So we'll just go with that. I'm sure the teenagers that were here the other night are at chapel. I had to cut them off because of time. Maybe they want to start it out tonight with a few. Okay, right here. Uh, 
those symbols, just the ones I've given. There's one other one I didn't draw in there, and that's the scarab, the beetle. Okay? Yes? How do you spell it? Just a minute, I'll spell it for you. Well, the reason that I'm not saying the Illuminati, to even say the Illuminati in the occult, even for the Council of Thirteen, meant that they're going to take you out somewhere and kill you. It's an unspeakable word. In fact, the leader of the Council of Thirteen and his enforcer, Isaac Bonowitz, both members of it, Gavin Frost and Bonowitz, came to me and said, we know the Christians don't believe half of what you say. We don't mind you talking about witchcraft because they still think we fly on broomsticks. That's what they think of you. When actually, they're right about most Christians in that form. But would you please stop using the word Illuminati before we have to kill you? Okay? They say Mariah. That's what they say, the conquering wind. Illuminati is the following. I-L-L-U-M-I-N-A-T-I. It means the light bearers. It's Latin for the light bearers. Okay? In the back. Uh, I don't know him, I know of him yet. The ministry and the testimony of John Todd. It's a little fuller than it was this morning, so some of you I know heard what I had to say this morning, so bear with me as we go over some of the same things. I'm sure most of it will be new, though. If you'll turn with me to the 16th chapter of Acts, verse 16. I'm going to read you a scripture that y'all ought to type up and send off to Duke University. Now, that's the college that started this whole ASP thing that all the psychic powers are extrasensory perception and you're born with them and, and you're something special and so on. Well, witches has been trying to tell people that for thousands of years. It's nothing new. Well, back in Paul's time, there were a few people with ESP. They just called it something else back then. They called it soothsaying. And strangely enough, we ought to send the 19th verse of this chapter to Duke University we're going to read it, and something very strange happened to this particular witch that told fortunes. She had the demons cast out of her, and lo and behold, her ESP went away. Now, wouldn't that be something for it, for Duke University to test with their cards then? Give them a bunch of people that got delivered from demons and let them test them and see if they had the same power. Read with me. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination, that means fortune-telling, met us, which brought our masters much gain by soothsaying. It's interesting that Jean Dixon says that she's a soothsayer given that power by God. And the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the, into the marketplace and to the rulers. I praise the Lord that the minister who came to witness to me before my salvation, who decided that he was going to pray and fast for me till I got saved, read this scripture first. I'll tell you about it in a few minutes of what took place, but so many people prior to that had witnessed to me, and they had come with no power, no authority. I think that half of them doubted that, that as a Christian, they could stand up to a witch. The reason that I think seriously that I stayed in witchcraft as long as I did, that whenever I mentioned witchcraft to a Christian, I got two reactions. One of absolute total fear, wanting to go home and pretend that it would go away or that it didn't exist so they'd be safe. Or the other earnestly couldn't believe that in 1970 or whatever that witchcraft existed. I guess somehow they believed that Jesus Christ was the same yesterday and today and forever, but somehow the devil changed. Or at least we treat him that way. Well, the devil's still the same character he was when he fell from par with the Lord. I don't think that he's changed one iota. The same thing that wins all the people into witchcraft 
is the same line that he gave Eve in the garden. I'll make you a god. He hasn't even got a new line. He's still got the same line. And the same pattern of winning souls today, he tries to make witches feel there's something special above everybody else. I think that's why the charismatics feel they're by everybody else. And when somebody comes on the scene and says, well, I'm more special than you are, I don't even say that to the lost. I say I'm just like you, except that Jesus Christ came into my life and changed me a little bit. But I'm still the same as you. Without him, I'd fall flat on my face and be just as much in sin as you are. But through him, I'm a child of the king. When somebody comes on the scene and tells me I'm more special than you are, I say, oh, well, I used to say that, but then I got saved. But I was born into a family, as I said earlier this morning, of witchcraft that has always been in witchcraft for thousands of years. And as I said this morning, it may seem strange for you to accept some of the things that I say this morning and this evening because it's a total different world. Many people ask the question, well, what about the family I left behind? Well, they're still there. I've got a brother who's decided his greatest treasure in life and he's going to set his fortune up by killing me and collecting the money on me. I've got a sister that's still in it. I've got a foster mother that sits on the Grand Jewel Council of 13 that I left. In fact, $50,000 of her money is part of the 200000 on my head. So they're still there. But then it's not unusual for them to act this way. I grew up in a thing that I never knew love. Mothers didn't care for their children. Children didn't care for their parents. I think that sounds something like the Christian church today. But I grew up that way. There was no love and emotion in my life whatsoever except hate and revenge were the only two feelings that I ever felt until the night that I met Jesus. And it must be strange for me to say this to many of you, maybe not to some of you, but it shocked me to no end to find out that I could care for somebody as much as I cared for myself. I ran around the church that, that I was going to in the beginning surprised constantly at the new emotions that I was feeling of love and compassion and even of gentleness that I had never felt in my life and were taught did not exist but were lies created by people who called themselves Christians and that they just didn't exist. Brotherhood existed and that was the close we could get to love but it was a brotherhood of if you betray me as your brother I'm going to kill you type brotherhood and if you break your vow of secrecy and say that I'm in here then I'm going to destroy you this type of world that was their brotherhood the Christian brotherhood is, I'm your brother because Christ has made you new as he has made me new, and we're equal heirs. But I was raised in this, and when I imagine many of your kids were five years old and just learning their ABCs, I was learning that the moon was Diana, and that the sun was either Kuranos, Pan, or Lucifer, depending on which country you came from. And while your kids were watching the Mickey Mouse Club, I was learning that the color of green meant money and the color of red meant sex and so on and how to cast spells. And when I was, you know, running track and playing football in high school like other normal teenagers, at the same time I was attending Coven meetings and was an ordained minister of the Wicked Church or Witchcraft Church of America. When I was 13, I went to college. Within the occult, I went to their Bible college. I learned how to be a priest. And when I was 14, I was taken to a camp, the Ohio State University campus where I grew up, to a professor's home there, and in this large apartment over in this kind of studio room with glass in the ceiling and so on, I was taken back and robed and blindfolded. My wrists were tied and a loose cord was tied around my ankle, and I was led in by the person that was sponsoring me to the circle, and a knife was placed at my throat. And I was challenged, and I answered these words back that let me into the circle, and I was unbound, and I'm blindfolded and proclaimed free. And my wrist was cut, and I signed a pact with my blood signature. And I was told, should I ever betray my vow of secrecy that I repeated then, that this signature would change color supernaturally, and they would come and get me. And I said, well, who would ever want to do that? You know, I was so privileged here. I was 14, and I was a minister. And don't think that age is very important. My sister was a witch queen when she was 13, and she'd been in it even longer. 
she was given orders to politicians within the state that she was a member of because she was their minister. Age means nothing in the occult world. But when I was 18, I was made a high priest. That placed me something as the pastor here. I was given 13 staff members. Actually, the female ran it, and I was her next in command. The females, ERA loves witchcraft. The women run the churches. And the women's live, I'm sure all the women's livers now are going to run out and try and join witchcraft so they can be the boss. But I grew up in this, as I said, and I was draft exempt. I didn't have to serve in the service. I was given what is called a 4D status because our church was a recognized church within the United States, tax deductible, and new ministers can marry and do all these things. But some of us younger ministers decided that the army needed us not to go and save our country or anything, but the army needed us as chaplains and that the army needed our doctrine of witchcraft and Satanism or whatever particular branch we were of. So we would go and enlist, the males and the females. And all those that the army didn't consider us ministers and didn't consider us fitting their standards of chaplainism, we still went in. And I always thought it was funny that many of the chaplains became our high priest and head of our churches and covens there on the basis. Because they never knew Jesus. They had to know something. That's not saying all chaplains. That's just saying that a lot of our high priests were chaplains. We'll let you figure it out. But uh, I went through the service and served my time, re-enlisted and went to Germany. And until I went to Germany, my life was one thing. I believed I was a member of witchcraft. I worshipped gods and goddesses. I believed in ESP and psychic power. I didn't believe in the devil. I didn't believe in demons. And I didn't believe in hell. Well, a lot of that was going to change very quickly. And most of all, I never heard of an organization called the Illuminati. I was a member of the Wicked Church of America, and there were other denominations within witchcraft, and that was it. But one night, after serving 30 days of a six-year sentence or re-enlistment or whatever you want to say in the Army, I shot and killed an officer one night in Stuttgart. Well, the Army kind of frowns upon sergeants killing officers, and they sent me off to the stockade to await court-martial. And while the court-martial proceedings were going on, I sent word out to my foster mother in Los Angeles that I was in trouble and would she please cast a spell and persuade the judges that I was a nice person and they'd let me off. And before you say, oh, that couldn't happen, it happens all the time in the country. That's why a lot of people do get off. That's why a lot of laws are passed. But about three days later, something I was not suspecting happened. My cell door opened, a congressman, and a senator from our U.S. Senate and Congress stood there, a couple generals, and an honorable discharge in their hands, saying that they were going to honorably discharge me. My discharge papers say honorably discharge, no reason for it. Got six years left to serve, only served 30 days, and here I am being honorably discharged from the service. I was told that my court-martial records had been shredded, that they didn't exist, that I had never stood court-martial as far as the Army was concerned, that everything had been destroyed, and that my military records had been sent off to St. Louis as standard, and later they would be destroyed. I've been told since then they were destroyed. So more or less, I've got the only set of paperwork on John Todd from the service, my own discharge records. As far as the Army is concerned, I never existed. And this was, if it's confusing you, you should have been where I was at. All of a sudden, I'm a civilian. I was ready to go to Leavenworth. Now I'm going back to the States. Uh, so I appear at my real mother's home in Columbus, Ohio, and I say, look, you've been in this thing a long time. Could you tell me what's going on? I'd like to know what type of spell was so powerful to run a senator over to help me. And she says, oh, it wasn't a spell, but we've been expecting you here, and here's an envelope, $2,000 and a one-way ticket to New York. Now, you get on the plane, the next one out, I'll call them and tell them you're coming, and they'll meet you at the airport. And I said, well, who are they? And she said, well, you'll know that when you get there. There won't be any more confusion. Just go ahead and go on. Now, for many of you, that might have been reason to stay home, not knowing what was on the other end. But you see, in witchcraft, there's this spirit that makes you curious all the time. And we could go in and do the, the weirdest ceremonies and the most spookiest things happen to us, and we couldn't wait to get back. Be scared to death. Our hair ready to turn white, but couldn't wait till the next meeting. Always wanting to find out what was around the corner. 
So I got on the plane and went. Evidently, she must have called somebody because a man named Dr. Raymond Buckland met me at the airport, whose picture I had seen and books that I had studied since I was a kid. In fact, he's the creator of what we call Christian witchcraft. He wrote a book for Christians who wanted to practice witchcraft. I think it's a little impossible, but he thought it was. Anyway, I learned under him for a few months, and I learned that everything that I learned in witchcraft till then was a lie. It's all a lie, but he just told me everything prior to that was a lie, and that there was only one God, and that God's name was Lucifer. And he told me a whole lot of theories that I've been sharing with the ministers here. And then I went to Los Angeles, and I learned of a political organization that had rescued me. It was called the Illuminati. I learned everything from its foundation of May 1st, 1776, till that day in 1970. Well, it was actually 71 by then. And I went down to San Antonio after taking initiation to become a member of its 13th level council, or 6th level council 13, and I moved to San Antonio, moved into a building called the Casino Building that's well known down there that the occult owns, where its temple's at, and many of its nightclubs and stores. And to cover the salary that they were paying me, they made me the manager and president of the largest re uh, concert for rock concert booking agency in the United States called Zodiac Productions. And I sat there and I managed it, plus many other nightclubs in San Antonio. And all the time, was trying to work within the occult, within the government. Eight times a year, my only duty would be on the Sabbath, the witches' Sabbath, Black Sabbath, whatever you want to call them, to be somewhere in the country where it was proclaimed to me and meet in meetings of the 13 and take orders from the Rothschilds and pass, pass the orders and the money on down to other people. We'll be talking about this tonight. Well, somewhere along the line, something took place through some letters that I read that Philip Rothschild had written to 13 people. What life over. I'd stay here. Maybe this one world government they were going to have wasn't so bad after all. But just the same, I wanted out. And along came a man one day, two days before Labor Day, on a Saturday. There was a Baptist pastor in town at a little Southern Baptist church. And he had found out that his daughter was practicing witchcraft. And he tried to witness to her and he didn't get anywhere. And then he went to his church and he asked his church, would they pray and fast with him? They said, what for? You don't, can't possibly believe in witchcraft in this day and age. So he called up another church called Castle Hills and he said, help. I'd like to have some prayer and fasting. Witchcraft has sweeped our city. Could we start praying that God would start saving people out of it here? And the church said, sure. About 500 of the congregation there, large congregation, started praying and fasting that God would do something. The man came in one day, he prayed, let, let me cross Lance Collins' path. That was my witch name. And he came on the scene into one of the occult stores that day and praying that he would cross my path. And something had happened within the store that acquired, acquired my attention. And I went there. And I just got into the store and had taken care of it, was ready to leave as he come through the door. He said, I'm looking for Lance Collins. And I said, well, I'm Lance Collins. Can I help you? And then he kind of brought his hands out from behind him, and lo and behold, was this big black Bible. It must have been a Thompson chain reference. And I said, uh-oh. I said, look, I don't want to hear your Christian stuff. Just stay away from me. I don't want to discuss it with you all nuts anyway. And he says, oh. And he started witnessing to me, and I started cussing him out. And he said, well, I figured this would happen. I read the 16th chapter of Acts, and I know what's inside you. And he started praying against what was inside me. And he started ordering the demons in my life to be silent, that there was a message that I had to receive, and they couldn't stop it, that they didn't have the authority to stop it. And he pleaded the blood of Jesus Christ. I kind of convinced myself that I just wanted to hear these strange words that he was saying because I shut up. But I listened as he prayed, and finally said, Young man, nothing the devil can do is going to stop you from becoming a Christian. I believe in my heart that you won out of this because you have seen all of it. And I, I said, Wait a minute, there's no such thing as the devil. And he says, Well, you'll say different someday. He says, I ordered the devil to stop giving you the benefits of money and of drugs and various things he listed off that he is giving you to intrigue you. 
I order them in the name of Jesus Christ to stop. Many of your parents may take a lesson from this. You have wrestled with your children to give up drugs and stuff. Have you ever tried telling the devil to stop giving them to them? That's where they're coming from. And that night I was expecting, expecting close to a million dollars in drugs to come across the Mexican border that belonged to the organization that was supposed to be distributed even up through here. And something very strange happened. We had the guards paid off on the border. The border patrol was paid off. Everybody was paid off. Everything was ready. And everything that could have went wrong went wrong. And they were busted or confiscated by accident. And there they were. He had told the devil that he couldn't give me any more drugs. I was doing $150 a day worth of speed. I weighed about 149 pounds. Some of the times I didn't even know my own name. And here I was, the occult was starting to become paranoid and afraid of me because I was starting to ask foolish questions like, aren't these plans of world takeover in the Christian Bible? You don't ask something like that in where I was at. And they were starting to become very afraid of me because of the drugs, and I was becoming very, very paranoid because of the drugs and things that were happening. And I started going through withdrawal that night because I had used up the last of my drugs shortly after I, that minister had witnessed to me. And I made a few phone calls and said, help, I need some drugs, would you please send me some drugs? And I had a lot of power within the Illuminati, and my word was a command. And finally, Ohio said, yes, we can have some drugs to you by Tuesday morning. Well, that was 48 hours. You don't tell somebody as addicted as I am to wait 48 hours. Well, by Monday night, Labor Day night, I was really going through it. I was withdrawing, and I was just literally going out of my mind. I remember taking a gun that was up in my room and putting it on the seat of the car that I was using. And I was going to go around to the different covens, and if anybody had drugs, I was going to take them by force if I had to, if I had to shoot the person. And I really didn't even know where I was at. I was shaking so bad that when I started the car and put it in gear to drive it off, I hit two other cars and almost drove it into the river there in downtown San Antonio. And I just got out of the car and walked off and started walking, trying to calm down. And I came upon a movie theater, the Aztec movie theater. And, excuse me, this uh, moisture in the Georgia air is beginning to get to me. But uh, I came upon the theater and I wasn't paying attention to what was playing. I just paid my money. I decided, great, a movie. You know, like a lot of Christians do today. Oh, great, a movie. Kill the boredom. And I walked in, and I guess it could have been Star Wars or anything else, but instead it was a movie called The Cross and the Switchblade. And I sat there and I watched the movie. It wasn't too much par in the movie except that I started rooting for Nikki Cruz. And I kept yelling at this Pat Boone character playing Dave Wilkerson to stay away from him. Leave him alone. He's a good guy. Leave him alone. You know, that's the mind frame that I was in at the time. And I'm sure the people in the audience were getting very irritated with me. And finally, the guy playing Nikki, according to Nikki's testimony, became saved and born again. Now, that was all right. We knew Christians believed in something foolish like that, except that he changed. And that was impossible. There was no place within the occult doctrine for a supernatural change in a person's life. It, everything within witchcraft, every teaching is based upon astrology. And astrology says you are born a set sign, and that's it. You will never change. You are destined that way. Your personality is set, and that's the way it's going to be, and there's nothing you can do about it. And your life is destined. And here this man turned his life completely around. That's just not accepted. And all my life, that had just never been allowed in as a teaching. And I got up from that seat and walked out of that theater in utter confusion. Just the beliefs that I had believed all my life just kind of shattered by this. It was impossible. And as I walked out of the theater, a man walked up and he handed me a track, which we've been passing out around here, called, the, called Bewitched, a little track from Chick Publications. He said, here, this is for you. I'll be praying for you. I haven't seen the guy in my life turned around and walked off and I started reading the track and it was telling about how the devil was behind the Ouija board and LSD and, and witchcraft and, and how he was using television to spread witchcraft and I thought it was interesting because my foster mother was the technical advisor on Bewitched and yes it was used to spread witchcraft and here it was in this track and I thought all this time the Christians were dumb about things like that 
And everything was truthful in the track to me, except the fact that the devil existed and that he was behind it, because we didn't believe it. And I said, boy, they're so right about so many things, and here they are, dumb, that there's a real devil. Of course, I know a lot of Christians that would agree with me that there's no such thing as Satan. They don't want to admit it. But I tore it up, and I threw the track away and walked on back, and as I started to go to my apartment, I decided to go into one of our nightclubs called the Club Aquarius. I mean, what else would you call a witchcraft club, you know? And I walked into it, went back to the office, and locked the door, and I sat there, and I thought for a long time. I needed to talk to somebody in the Christian church to, to find out if this was all really happening, if this was all real. And I thought for a while, now, who do I contact? If I'm not careful and I get one of the ministers that we might have under our control or are paid off, that could get me killed. I've got to be very careful. So I decided that I would go over to this Christian coffee house that I had been told about the night before, and I went over there, and it's called the Green Gate Club. It had been a burlesque bar, a show bar. One night, a Baptist minister walked in there and pushed the strippers off the bar and jumped up there and opened his Bible and started preaching a revival. By the time that it was done, about 15 minutes later, he had about 30 people saved. Strippers had pulled the curtains down off the wall and wrapped them around them to give their heart to the Lord. The customers were throwing their drinks away and getting saved. The band was getting saved. The bartender was getting saved. In fact, the bartender told me later the greatest enjoyment of his life was to take that booze and dump every drop of it out. I said, boy, that must have been fun. It's almost like burning rock records. And then the owners got saved, and they just gave the deed to Castle Hills First Baptist Church that was praying for me, and they started working it as a Christian coffee house. And I went in there about 2 in the morning. The place was supposed to close at midnight, except that the Coke fountain broke, and the man that run it named Claude Elmer decided to stay and fix the Coke fountain. I guess God does have to break Coke fountains once in a while to keep Christians in one place long enough to do a work for him. But he, I came in and he started talking to me. He could see I was going through withdrawal and he was wise about drugs. And he started talking to me about them. Pretty soon, we got to witchcraft. Well, after he changed about three different collars, he quickly called his pastor. Now, we know nobody calls their pastor at three in the morning, do, don't we? And he called his pastor and said, pray, brother, pray. You know, he says, well, why? You're a Christian. He says, but he's a witch. He said, so? Wasn't the devil defeated 2,000 years ago? So he goes back and he starts witnessing to me. Really pours it on. And I guess it, it finally got down to, could I be saved since I had been in witchcraft and done all these things? Could I be saved? And he reminded me of Paul and the things that Paul had done, persecuting the church and so on, and carried many people off in chains, held the robes of the people who stoned Stephen to death. He said he could be saved. He turned out to be one of the greatest apostles there was. He could save you. So as I knelt there and I prayed with him and I gave my heart to the Lord, something very strange happened to me. I had been born with all the demons of my parents. I'd been born with their sins upon me. I was an hereditary witch, meaning that I collected everything that they had. I'd never known freedom, never known peace. I was afraid day and night since I was five years old. I'd be afraid to go to bed at night and go to sleep because of the nightmares that I would have and the torment that I'd have and not knowing why. And when I got up from there, I felt a feeling that I'd never felt in my life. I felt free. I felt peaceful. I asked God that when I became saved, would you take the fear away? I never want to be afraid again. And even when people were shooting at me, I've never been afraid again. The fear went. That fear belongs to the devil. And when the devil went, my fear went. And I walked out of there. In fact, it almost got me killed. I walked out of there and forgot that somebody might want to kill me for doing this. But I was back the next night explaining to them that I was in danger and they took me to a place of safety and I praise the Lord that the church they took me to was a Bible-believing fundamental church that raised me. I could have went to a lot of churches and I could have been discouraged, I could have been taught false doctrine, but I went to a church that taught me the Word of God first and I did second. And I praise the Lord for that. That's my testimony and I want to close and add this. We have been working with witchcraft quite a while and the biggest problem we've run into and I want to say this in case there are those present in witchcraft that know what I'm talking about is the bounties they place upon people's heads leaving the occult and if you're here and if you have a bounty on your head or if you're afraid that they may try and kill you we have a place for you we can take you 
All you have to do is call this church later this afternoon and tell them the problem and get with them and they'll get you with me before I leave here Monday morning. And we'll arrange it. We'll get you to a place of safety. We'll be talking about this tonight. We're building a retreat that will keep these people alive so they can stand on their own feet. Before you say, well, why would that be necessary? We live in America. Well, you tell that to 50-some people that have been killed coming out of the occult in the last five years accepting Jesus as their Savior, that we live in America and it couldn't happen to them. It has happened to them. And there are professional killers trying to make sure that nobody leaves. And the fear is really tightened up in witchcraft lately because so many people have recently been coming out because of tracks like the Broken Cross and the one that will be coming out, uh, the Angel of Light. And we just ask that you pray that people will continue coming out of this and that the fear of the devil will not keep the peace of Jesus Christ from the people who need it. And if you're here tonight and you need to come out, you're in the occult, there's a place for you to go. Before I turn over to the pastor, this sermon isn't just for witches, it's for everyone. Um, special guest, Mr. John Todd. Four or five years ago, Mr. Todd came to know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. I will let you, him tell you his life story, lest I uh, kill the punchline. But it's tremendous what God has done for him in his life. Now, let me just say this. I have determined that there's a whole lot I don't know anything about. And you have your Bibles, and you compare what is said with the Word of God, and you listen to what Mr. Todd has to say. Because it was surprising you the power of Satan. Mr. Todd was in witchcraft. He was a high priest on the council, the limited council 13 in this country. And you listen as he speaks. And then we're going to have this morning just a short time of his speaking. And then a time for you to ask questions. Now, uh, we have just our teens and our adults, and we trust that everyone is open-minded enough to feel free to ask any question that is a modest question. And listen now as Mr. John Todd comes and speaks to us. And I think, Brother Todd, if it's all right with you, I'm going to step down and welcome some special guests I've got coming. And uh, I think I'm glad to be here. I really believe that before the evening arises, we will have this church packed out. I'm expecting quite a few from the occult here. As you go home today, I ask that you pray that when they come and they hear the message that will be given this evening, that they'll come to know Jesus Christ as the risen Savior, their Savior. What we're going to do is a little unusual today. I'm going to give a short summary of the testimony I'll be giving later this morning. And then I'm going to open it for questions. Quite a few of the young people have been listening to me all week. If some of the parents are here, I understood not everything the young people took back was exactly the way I said it, but we had a good time anyway. Uh, Friday, I really enjoyed myself. I think my greatest enjoyment since I've become a Christian is destroying the things of the kingdom that I left behind. And uh, we had a little burning out back, destroyed some. And then to my mass enjoyment, I left for Alabama to take care of some business and spent six hours burning some of the strongest books ever written in witchcraft. So uh, I guess I'm kind of full of stepping on the devil's toes, full of the joy of the Lord. But I was born in a family that has always been in witchcraft. Before I got out, we traced our family tree and we lost it somewhere back in the Druidism of Stonehenge in England. It went some 7,000 years back, and then we lost it when records gave up. But I come from a family that was originally called the Colleens. They were what we called the Blue Picks or the Druids. And they changed their name. They fled from Scotland, and they changed their name to, Scot uh, to Collins in England and brought witchcraft to the United States under their leader, Francis Collins. In fact, the area that they landed at was called Collins Bay. Some of the people here may remember the show Dark Shadows. It was about the family that I was born into. And somewhere prior to the Civil War, a large branch of 
that particular family decided they were too well exposed under that name, so they changed their name again to Todd. And they moved from the Massachusetts area and sold the famous mansion that they had for so long. Uh, Catholic School for Nuns bought it up. I don't think it changed much. But uh, the agreement that they made when they signed the contract to buy it was that no outsider should ever see the inside of that mansion. There was too much that went on inside that mansion in the Collins history that they want, just completely covered up and buried. But this was the family that I was born into. Many of you were raised Baptist. Many of you were raised other Christian faiths, religions, doctrines, whatever. So it's kind of an unusual to have somebody stand up here and say, well, I came out of witchcraft. You know the thing, you were raised as a child to believe that witches flew on broomsticks, had warts on their nose, and in the 60s, twisted their nose and made things appear. But none of that went on, but witchcraft is extremely real. Many people ask me what witchcraft is. Witchcraft is simply the priesthood, witches are the priesthood of the old pagan temples that existed in Babylon, Rome, and Greece. And many of them worship the same gods that Paul confronted. It's funny, when he went up and preached about the unknown god in Greece, because they had so many gods, that's about witchcraft. They have so many gods, they can't keep track to them on the lower levels. And then when they progress up, if they ever do, to the very higher levels that consist within the Illuminati, then they learn that there is one god and his name is Lucifer and that uh, the lesser gods are in human bodies, and they try to make everybody a god, and so on. When I was born into witchcraft, witchcraft was limited to just those born of a certain family. And unless you were an hereditary witch, you couldn't get in. Then, and they were very boastful about how they weren't like the Christians. They never lifted offerings. Of course, they don't need to. They've got billions of dollars. They never need to lift an offering. My salary was $100,000 a month. I don't think I needed to lift an offering at that time. But uh, they also boasted of many other things, that, and they tried to put the, place the Christian faith down. But there's one thing that they couldn't boast of, that their gods had paid the supreme price of their life and risen again. I guess I really enjoy this day, although this day was also once a pagan holiday. I extremely enjoy this day because... It means that there's an empty grave somewhere in Jerusalem, and my Savior sits on the throne. I met him five and a half years ago on Labor Day. Uh, I, I think the Lord must have had it planned, so I'd always know my birthday. Many Christians don't know the day they got saved, but I really enjoy celebrating my spiritual birthday. I try to forget that I'm close to 30, and I quit celebrating those birthdays. I think when I get to be 30, I'm going to stay right there. But uh, I celebrate very heartily my Christian birthday, and it happened in Labor Day 1972 in San Antonio through three different independent things that God had all planned out. I watched a movie called The Cross and the Switchblade. I was given a track when I left the movie theater on witchcraft, and following about two hours later, I went down to a coffee house called the Green Gate Club that just a few months earlier had been a burlesque parlor. But see... Christians in San Antonio decided the devil had enough of that city and they went in and preached an uninvited revival one night and got everybody in the nightclub, including the owners, saved. So they just signed the deed and gave it to the church and said, win souls with it. It won ours here. And it, uh, the Lord used it to reach mine. I went in there one night at 2 in the morning. And about 4 in the morning, I wasn't a witch any longer. I was a born son of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And I'd never go back now. It's very interesting how Christians, you know, many of them, they sway back and forth. A person coming out of witchcraft doesn't have a chance to be weak one moment and strong the next. Their life is at stake. They start at $10,000 upon anybody's head leaving the occult. And they send not amateur people who want to pick up a few dollars, but they send professional people. In fact, one of the jobs I had before I became a very important witch was that when I was in the service at Fort Bragg, I would recruit people leaving the Special Forces and the 82nd Airborne Rangers and so on as professional killers for the organization. These people who like to go around doing a lot of killing, this way they got paid a very handsome sum for it. And when you'll hear much today that is unusual. You won't realize that such a world does exist. But consider this. There have been 
Not very many went from the cult in the last five years, about 500. That's not very many at all. That's because of the fear on many people's hearts that leave it. But out of that 50, I mean, out of that 500, 50 have died from bullet wounds and bombs and stabbings. So see, it is an area that they leave. When they come to the altar, or when they call up the minister and pray with him on the phone, as most of them do, or they read a track and give their heart to the Lord, it's not an easy matter. They're not just considering making Jesus their Lord, as many of you have considered. They're considering placing their life on the line. I think that's why they all love the old prophets in Israel. I think Jeremiah is my favorite. These prophets got out, and they weren't loved like we love them today. And they were very well hated. And they also liked Paul. Here was Paul that was once held. I remember the, the night that I was saved. I said, I don't think I can be saved. I've done so much. I've taken human lives. I've worshipped the devil. I've proclaimed him as Lord. I don't think I can be saved. And he said, well, here's a man who held the coats of the men who put one of the followers of Christ to death. And he became one of the greatest soul winners in the Bible. If he can save him, he can save you. And that changed my heart. I, a man was asking me last night, did I ever have any doubts that I was ever a Christian? Oh, have you ever had a doubt that Jesus ever saved you? I think that every Christian somewhere along the line that's been generally saved has had a doubt. Has he really forgiven me, at least in the beginning? But praise the Lord for some strong Bible teachers that demonstrated love as well as the Word of God. And while Christians would come up and say, Oh, I don't want to shake your hand. You may still be there. There were those who come up and said, Praise the Lord, you're my brother in Christ. I'd rather have you my brother than my enemy. You know, in this type of atmosphere. But there were those that really gave me love, that prayed with me when I was having doubts and discouragements, and they brought me through. And I'm saying this in case those are one from the occult today, and you know they're one from it. Show them love. Show them that Jesus saved you and has saved them, and they're not a witch any longer, but a brother and sister in Christ. All right, that's all I really want to say. I know there's a couple people been asking me questions all week, so don't be hiding your hands just because your parents are here, and if any of the adults want to ask questions, please feel free to. I believe Russ had one question. I first heard about Johnny Todd in March of 1974, though I was not given his name at the time. I was talking to Jack Chick, the author of the comic book publications like Broken Cross, the Crusader series, and some of the little pamphlets like Big Daddy and G.I. Joe and This Was Your Life, and The Thing, uh, a number of very effective comic uh, book type gospel tracts, uh, which have reached a circulation, I believe, of more than 3 million copies. And uh, God has wonderful about Jack Chick's ministry. Jack Chick called me in March of 1974 about a certain subject and mentioned the fact that he had just met a converted Druid priest who was saved out of Druidism, which is a very high level of witchcraft. And he told me that this particular converted priest knew personally of more than 50 to 60 cases of human sacrifice perpetrated in this country. Now, at that time, Johnny Todd's name was not given to me. Then about the last of May, or first of June of this year, uh, just about uh, five or six months ago, about five months ago, Jack Chick called me again, not remembering who I was because we had not met personally, and began to tell me about this man named Johnny Todd who was converted out of witchcraft. And then I reminded him of the conversation we had uh, about uh, three and a half years before, in March of 1974, and I asked if Johnny Todd were the same man he referred to as a converted Druid priest in 1974. He said, yes, Johnny Todd is the man. Well, I've had <clears throat> several occasions to talk with Johnny Todd, and I know that Johnny Todd knows what he's talking about when he talks about witchcraft and uh, other occult organizations. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ saved Johnny Todd out of witchcraft five years ago, and uh, I have personally talked with Johnny Todd on the base of Jack Chick's recommendation. Uh, having known Johnny Todd now for more than four years, and my having known him for some six months, I believe that Johnny Todd is a genuinely converted man, saved by the grace of God out of the depths of Satanism. And uh, without taking any more of his time, Johnny, you have until five minutes till ten. And uh, is your wife one of those good ones? Keep five. I have, I have fifteen after now. Okay, God bless you, John, Johnny Todd. Thank you. Before I start today, I'd like to leave a text with everybody. I try to leave it across the country. 
when I was saved, I knew absolutely nothing about the Bible except some basic teaching that I had picked up by accident when I was about 10 years old in a Nazarene church when the people that I was being raised by that were in witchcraft found out that I had went to this church, they, as they say, blew their stack. And that was that for going and hearing anything about the Word of God. So everything I know about the Bible I've learned in the last five years. I had some very, very good teachers in San Antonio, a man named Jack Taylor, a Southern Baptist pastor. And when I told him, it was like two days after I was saved, uh, the things that I had come out of and was afraid of and so on, he gave me this scripture as kind of my battle cry text, whatever, throughout the walk in the ministry that I would have later. And I've left it with Christians because in a day and age when we see so much happening around us, we lose sight of who's behind what is happening around us. We lose sight that if it is good and positive, it's the Lord, and if it's evil and rebellious, it's the devil. And a lot of times we look at our teenage children and we think that they're the devil, and the teenage children look at the parents and think they're the devil. And we lose sight of really who our enemy is in this warfare that we're in. So I'd like to leave this with you. I'm sure many of you know it. And if you don't, I recommend that you mark it in your Bible and learn it by heart. Ephesians 6.12 For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I didn't bring my Amplified with me today. I was a little rushed as I was late. But uh, the Amplified gives a much clearer description of it. So many times we see political corruption and things going on, and these are a few things that I'm going to discuss today, but we lose sight of who's behind that political corruption. We looked at Nixon's era, we look at some of the things that Jimmy Carter's doing today, and we know they're not Christian deeds, we know that they have nothing to do with the Lord, but we kind of scratch them off to the man. We should scratch them off to the enemy, and the man is not the enemy. I came out of a family that um, was, you know, many of you, how many of you were raised Baptist? We'll start that way. All your life, that's what you were raised from the time you were a little child of Baptist. How many of you were raised in a Christian home? Okay. Okay. Now, so in the Pentecostal churches, uh, which I <laughs> try to avoid as much as possible, uh, they have a term called homegrown Pentecostal. I guess homegrown Baptist would be just as fashionable. Well, I was a homegrown witch. From the time that I was five years old, I knew nothing but witchcraft. I would have known it sooner, but they didn't discuss it with me. They take you very, very young. And from the even before they start talking about the so-called positive aspects of witchcraft, they talk about the negative aspects of Christianity. So that I'm a, being a Christian is a miracle, not because I wanted out of witchcraft, but that I would consider Christianity to be the only way out because they brainwash you from very early childhood that the Christian is the most evil being or creature in the universe. That he wants nothing more than to take the everyday witch out and shoot them, burn them, hang them, whatever he can do. And that they are the most hateful beings that ever existed on the same level as maybe Adolf Hitler. So this is what I was raised up to believe. And uh, my last name is Todd, but that was just changed about... 60 years ago, until then, our name was Collins. And the Collins family, my direct tree, was responsible, according to witchcraft history and a few history books that I can find also, was bringing witchcraft to the United States. So uh, when I was 14, and some of you might consider that a very early age, but it wasn't. It was kind of a late age for this. I was initiated into organized witchcraft. In other words, I was made what Brother Rasmussen is. I was made a pastor. A minister. I was ordained. In fact, a few years later when I went to enlist in the service, I didn't have to go because I was drafted exempt because I was the ordained minister of a legal recognized church. So, uh, 4D status for a few people who know what that is. I'm sure Brother Addison is and uh, ordained ministers are exempt. And uh, I enlisted and went through the service until uh, I got into a little shooting incident and in, uh, uh, Germany, after I'd come back from Vietnam, I'd re-enlisted and went to Germany. And uh, I was getting ready to be court-martialed. In fact, I had everything down pat. I was as good as gone. Uh, we had entered a plea of guilty yeah, for a uh, 
deal of 35 years and then parole and they wouldn't even consider it. An officer had been killed in the situation and I was more or less just waiting to be transferred to Leavenworth to serve the time when uh, you know, Witchcraft Church, which I thought was just a little group of people that I belonged to, sent a political member of that church, a state senator, two of them, state senator, a uh, U.S. senator, and a representative over to Germany, and they took hold of the situation, and 24 hours later I was a civilian in the United States with all my time, rank, and an honorable discharge, and my court-martial records didn't exist anymore. And all of a sudden I realized I wasn't in something that just lit candles and incense and said magic words once in a while and stuck pins and dolls. There was a little more to it than just a religion. And uh, I left New Jersey and went home to Columbus and I asked my real mother, I have two mothers, I have a foster mother and a real mother, I asked my real mother what I was to do and she said, here's an envelope of $2,000 and a one-way ticket to New York City. You get there on the next plane and I'll tell them you're coming. She didn't tell me who she was going to tell it was coming or anything. But I flew to New York City and I spent six months learning all new witchcraft. Till then, I had been taught what most of the teenagers learn, and I want to tell the teenagers something here real quick. I'm sure most of you probably go to the school here, but if you were in a regular school, you would meet witches running all over the place. We hear this across the country. Almost every high school has it, especially in California. And they tell the young people lies. They tell them it's DSP, they tell them it's psychic power, they tell them it's spirits of the dead, they tell them everything but what it is. And I was supposed to be a high priest leading a church of, uh, that had 13 ministers to it, plus a couple hundred people in this congregation. And I believe this. And then all of a sudden, for six months, this man, Dr. Buckland, unraveled everything and told me there was a one God, where before we believed there was four. There was one, and his name was Lucifer. And he was very quickly to tell me that wasn't Satan. He didn't want me to get in the ideas that Christians could be telling me the truth. I should have thought then that if he had lied, they had lied to me for almost uh, 18 years, they were probably lying to me now. And But I went ahead and believed it, and for six months I took lessons in witchcraft that I didn't even know that things could happen that had happened. And then I was transferred to Los Angeles, good old L.A., can't seem to get away from it. And for six months my foster mother taught me something that your pastor is very familiar with the political situation of the occult. And all of a sudden I realized that witchcraft wasn't just spell casting, it had a purpose in mind. And that's when I started getting a little afraid because when I was 10, as I said, I learned a little about the Bible. It just happened to be all revelations that I learned. And all of a sudden we were discussing a world ruler that would be personally guided by Lucifer that could gain control of the world supernaturally and take control of people's minds. Of course, they didn't say there was a defense against this. The way they spoke, everybody was affected. They didn't say anything about the blood of Jesus. But uh, we sat there, and for six months I learned the political structure and the history of witchcraft. And then I was taken to Colorado, and I was placed through an initiation into the sixth realm. And this initiation consisted of a blood sacrifice. And from then on, I was given a territory of 13 states. This didn't happen to be one of them. This belonged to my foster mother. But I was in charge of all the occult, political, and drug activity in 13 states. And this is where I was in 1972 when I met the Lord. Well, I, at first, for many years, said by accident, but I've come to realize there's no such thing as an accident when it comes to Jesus. He had everything perfectly planned out. But it was a combination of a personal witness to a coffee house, a Jack Chick Publications track, and the movie The Cross and the Switchblade. And a lot of things that, uh, for instance, one Baptist church praying and fasting that I would get saved. They figured if I got saved, maybe the rest of the witches would follow in suit. It didn't exactly happen that way, but uh, it did put a dent in the situation. So that's uh, quickly, very quickly, my testimony. What I want to do today is, for the young people and the adults here, I'd like to throw this thing open to question and answer because some of you may have run across situations, some of you may have questions on how to deal with people that are in this. I want to leave one word with you. The only answer to witchcraft, the only way that anybody has ever succeeded in getting out has been through the blood of Christ. 
everybody else who's ever tried to get out of witchcraft, and I want to leave this with you, witchcraft is real and supernatural. I remember the minister who witnessed to me said that until he found his daughter in it, he was always, and he was a Baptist pastor, was always raised to believe that witches were fables that flew around on broomsticks on Halloween night. And all of a sudden he woke up and found it was very real. And if you want to find out the power behind it and how it can be defeated, I suggest the 16th chapter of Acts. Paul handled it very nicely. And it's one thing that I can testify to all the teenagers considering the lies that you're born with witchcraft, which is the lie that they give you. When I was saved, and the pastors there at the Baptist church called the demons that were inside me out, I lost all that power of witchcraft. I've never regretted it. If the power came from demons, I don't need the demons. So before you teenagers start fooling around with the astrology charts and the Ouija board, check out the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy and find out you'll pick up a demon from doing it. And you pick up one, you keep on going. My foster mother wrote a book, and she said, doing one spell or practicing one seance in witchcraft is like jumping off of a tall milk, uh, mountain or a skyscraper. There's no turning back. It is the strongest addiction that I know. Dave Wilkerson said that he had seen people go through withdrawal from drugs many times, but seeing one witch go through withdrawal from the occult shattered his mind. And I've helped thousands of people through withdrawal from witchcraft and withdrawal from drugs. And once you've seen the withdrawal that a person goes through from being in witchcraft, you'll think that drugs is something you practice in kindergarten. It's that violent and that destructive without Christ especially. And what I started to say was, nobody has ever succeeded in getting away because they simply will kill you with a spell. Now, Brother Rasmussen knows from testimony from other people who have been around. They haven't been able to do this to me or anybody else that has ever gotten out. A few people have been killed physically that have gotten out that were Christians that got out of witchcraft. But, and they've tried this with me and my wife and so on, but they've never succeeded and we're still very, very much alive. But uh, we have to depend totally upon Jesus to stay in that situation. Now, before any of the young people decide that witchcraft is a groovy thing, they will tell you you can get out any time you want. But once you're in, there's a bounty on your head should you ever leave. And I don't care if you're 13 or 14 years old, the bounty starts at $10,000 and they send a professional. They don't send an everyday person. And if you're wondering why I'm still alive, it isn't easy. I've got the bullet holes in the buildings and the bombed out buildings and everything else to the record and I stand that Jesus kept us alive in every situation. You don't walk into a building as it blows up in your face and walk back out without a scratch on you unless the Lord is there to protect you. And this occult is very dangerous. Chick Publications did the Broken Cross which will be on sale back here today. The only track that I know of that has saved people out of witchcraft. And they did this book. And because of it, they moved to another building with bulletproof glass and bombproof walls. That's the situation. The artist draws his stories at home now in a dwelling that they don't know where he is rather than try and drive to work and be in danger. And uh, Jack, uh, his staff is always on him to be more careful because they're trying to drive him off the road and stuff. We try to get him to drive a Cadillac that might stand up a little, but he says the Lord can protect him in his Toyota as well as a Cadillac, so he keeps on driving the Toyota. But that's the situation. It is no joke. It is a serious situation. The occult gives up less people to conversion than any other thing. And it's not because they don't want out. They desperately want out. We went to Minneapolis to where they had a convention. We took 10,000 of the Broken Cross there to distribute free, and they were so afraid of this book coming, they canceled the convention. Rather than let it fall in the hands of the people who would be coming from across Europe and across the United States to attend. But people came into our meetings there that came anyway, and they listened. And when they were done, they asked my wife and myself and other ministers, if you can put us in a safe place of protection, we'll come out. They want out. They know that Christianity is the only way, but they're physically afraid to come out. You think the mafia has fear for those that have been watching The Godfather or something? It has no fear compared to the occult people coming after you. But... Uh, we are believing that we will have this situation. Brother Rasmussen will be one of the few people in the United States who will know how to get converts to the refuge that we're preparing. So they're, we're preparing a place not for them to go permanently and hide, but for them to grow in the word and in physical strength so they can go out on their own a live. And Jack Chick will be putting uh, 
in the back of all its publications on the occult, the phone numbers of the different things, and you'll be one of the phone numbers that people can reach and say, we have a convert that's been one out of the occult. How do we get him to this refuge place? And he will be one of the few people in the United States that will know where this place is in the mountains. It'll be that well guarded. So uh, we just ask your prayers and your questions now if you've got some. Yeah. Well, 12 years old girls are big, more or less. Uh, they've been known to get down to 10, but they usually start at 12 or 13 and go to 25. And they, for the people who like to hitchhike, this is how they pick them all up. And of course, the police will just tell the parents the kids run away from school. They use them for sexual and for sacrifice, human sacrifice purposes. For those that are wondering if that is an accident, you're in LA County here, right? The LA County Sheriff's Department has a very secret undercover thing. I don't even know if you can find out if it exists, but I talked to them. It's called the Occult Squad. They told me in 73 that they found 35 bodies of girls in Los Angeles County that year, and I talked to them in December, that they knew to be human sacrifice, which they listed as rape cases to keep it from the public. The statistics that came in so far this year are close to 125, and the year's not even over. Now that girls that have been used for human sacrifice. And if you all notice, there's quite a few rape cases that happened around Halloween that are in the news right now. And from what we can find out, the circumstances that each death fits human sacrifice. But you'll never hear it, that that's the reason. We turned in four different people that were responsible in the area that I knew about to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and they arrested all four. They got convictions, and in every conviction, they listed it as rape killing and they knew better. Yes. Yes, it is. It's listed in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy as con uh, converting with necromancy or familiar spirits. It, uh, clairvoyancy, anything that is psychic is a counterfeit of God's power by the devil. And it was, okay, the woman who was giving fortunes in the 16th chapter of Acts, that was clairvoyancy. When Paul cast the demon out, she couldn't tell fortunes anymore. That settles it right there. Yeah. Superstition is a Christian form of witchcraft. Okay. Okay, she asked me if superstition was a form of witchcraft. It's a Christian form of witchcraft. Uh, one thing I want to throw at the young people real quick. In the occult stores, they don't sell Ouija boards in most of them, in the serious ones. They call it a Christian instrument. They say Christians are the only ones stupid enough to use it. Witches know that the devil runs it. They know more than some of the Christians. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want an answer on that? <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you asked me about that. Yes, I do. Physical evidence. One, so take the exorcism first. The rite that the Catholic Church uses for exorcism, they have changed a few words, just, I think, about six words, is the witchcraft rite of exorcism. It is 8,000 years old. The Catholic Church is not that old. Okay? Next... On the apparitions, it's the same thing as the Spiritualist Church of America or any of the witchcraft organizations. It's called Auras. And if you'll notice, none of them are pure white. Now, coming out of the occult, I know the system of collars. And the principality, uh, there's seven of them. And all the demons under them go by the collar of their leader, their general. And the occult demon, Rija, appears as a blue snake or a blue myth. I've heard thousands of reports, including Jean Dixon, that her report, that her guides, her spirit guides, familiar spirits, are blue in nature when they communicate with her. And of course, the red is lust and so on. It's a long list. But the saints or aspirations, I want to get into this thing real quick. The Catholic Church's altar, except for the Atame or the Knight, is the exact altar of witchcraft. And according to the reports I can get on the Nicene Council, most of the ministers at the Nicene Council that set that heresy up were from the Temple of Diana, which is witchcraft. So everything, the bell, the incense, the whole ritual, they're 
holy water is a salt water mixture. This comes from witchcraft, which they do exorcism with. Everything that they do comes out of witchcraft, and they can't get around it. Yes. Okay. Did everybody hear that question? Okay. He wants me to explain the Council of Thirteen. I'll explain what that is. You're probably wondering. And uh, what their purpose or thrust is. Okay. All right. If you'll all just give you a second. Reach in your billfold. You can put it in the offering plate later. Reach in your billfold and take out a $1 bill real quick. We'll settle the whole thing. I'll ask, let you ask your federal government later how this got on the $1 bill. Okay. On the back of the $1 bill, you'll see the crest with the pyramid in it. Now, Dr. Rasmussen has upstairs the whole crest. You only have the words left out of it on the block. But there are sections. His is a little behind time. There's a few new organizations. His dates back to the 1800s. But that pyramid in the Illuminati consists of three pyramids and a sphinx. But their crest is this crest. The Illuminati is the occult organization that we belong to. It means the light bearers. The witch is called Mariah, the conquering wind. But it's the capstone above. The eye is Lucifer. The triangle of the capstone is the tribunal of the Rothschild family, which is called the Holy Family. They lead the Illuminati. They are... would be Paul, Peter, for the Catholics, all the saints, and Mary and everybody rolled into one, and the Pope. They are the voice. The doctrine of the occult teaches that Lucifer comes and sits at their dining room table. When they see the table, they leave 13 chairs out, and the 13th one is for Lucifer to set in himself. They set him a plate and everything. Now, I've been there in the mansion, and I've seen this go on. And they, in turn, direct to the top block of that pyramid, and that top block is the Council of 13 of the Grand Druid Council, which I was a member of. Now, the Druid system of government is not that the politicians run everything. It is the same system that Rome had. The priests let whoever wants to rule the government, but the priest must rule the ruler. Now, I'll let that sink on you for a while. And I want to throw this in. We'll cause a lot of controversy, I'm sure, but it's a fact. Since the time of World War Wilson, including him, there has never been a president of the United States that was not an Illuminati, that did not belong. Now, that'll shatter a few people's ideas about a Christian president right now, but it's a fact anyway. And the Grand Druids, although they're just every, supposedly everyday people like me, you look at me now, I'm, I'm this way, I was a different way when I was in witchcraft. And part of my authority was whatever governors, senators, or political people were in my area took direct political orders from me, which I in turn did not think of, but simply translated to them from the orders that we got from London, from the Rothschild family. Now that's the Council of 13. The thrust is that when I left in 72, they had a chart that said in eight years, eight years, they would have the whole world. And from remembering that chart, I haven't seen one thing through the news media not happen on schedule according to that chart. I would say that that's about right. I would say the word today would be Maranatha, that he's coming real quick, because theirs is coming real quick. They have it. It's not that far away. Okay. Yeah. It'd be easy to give you the names who aren't about 99 percent okay the man who pulled me out of jail became an attorney general under ford was william saxby well that gives you two names to start with the best way is to find out who belongs to the cfr or who belongs to the cfr yeah not the way it's been written uh, it's a little ridiculous. I know I'm going to step on a few people's toes who have read about the Illuminati, but uh, he asked me what part Zionism played in the Illuminati. Rothschild and a few people in the Illuminati were born Jews. 
but they're not Jews. You can get in the Word of God and find them. I'm going to that a little bit. The system is this. With the same books that proclaim that the Illuminati is a Jewish organization also proclaim that the Illuminati is a Luciferian organization. You can't have both. A true Jew believes in Yahweh. A Illuminati person, and I'm not a Jew, and I was a leader of the Illuminati, believes in Lucifer, the God of light, peace, love, blah, 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 and so on. It has nothing to do with the same, because there might be a few Jews born, and they might have some ties with Zionism, bloodline, but the organization itself has nothing to do with Jewism at all. It is totally 100% Druid occult, and that's its purpose. In fact, the reason that the Rothschilds even still reside in London is because England is considered to the witches the same as Palestine is considered to us. It is the Holy Land. You take pilgrimages there. You stop off and kiss the stones on the Rothschild mansion for luck and so on and so forth. If by some chance you happen to meet a Rothschild and he gives you a blessed sign or a blessed bee, then your whole life is set. It's that type of nature but it has nothing to do. There is an interesting thing, though, I'd like to throw in. A lot of witches do wear the thing called the Star of David. David was long dead before that star was ever drawn. His son drew it, and it's called the hexagram, and the word to curse or the hex comes from the hexagram. And when witches practice magic, they draw a five-pointed star to stand in, and they call demons up in the evil sign, what we call the Star of David. So before Christians start tying it around their neck, that's called the demon star, or the death star. And that's why it was drawn. For a few people that might be confused about the Solomon aspect, when he backslid, he became the most holiest person in the occult. Everything that we practice are based upon books that he wrote and pictures that he drew when he backslid. Well, including that exorcism right you asked about, he wrote it. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll give you an Okay, she asked if they're behind witchcraft programs that are coming on. I'm going to give you two quick examples. For one, I'm telling you this across the country, the most disastrous film that has ever come out, pro-witchcraft, thousands of people that are Christians are going to go watch and are watching. I was told by a bunch of Christian people across the United States and every city I went to, you got to go see this movie. There's no sex. There's no violence. There's, you know, it's... it's just an old kind of, um, how would you put it, um, I can't think of the guy in the 30s that was a sequence in outer space movies, Flash Gordon type picture. So I went and watched it. It used words and beliefs that are the innermost beliefs in witchcraft. They're not even the ones spoken of in the open. And witches don't call it witchcraft. They call it the force. It's called Star Wars. And the whole thing is centered around two-thirds of the movie is based on the force. That you're stronger when you die, you're reincarnated, you receive guides from people who are dead. It's ESP. That you, that it's, see, the biggest line about witchcraft is that it's not bad. It's neither good nor bad. It's the person that's good or bad. And this movie emphasized that a lot. That witchcraft was okay as long as you were a good person. So, adults, before you let them go. And the other one I want to hit real quick is how many remember Bewitched? It's probably one of the main reasons that witchcraft grew, it in Dark Shadows. They were, Bewitched was written by a witch. The belief of witchcraft is you're born a witch and that the mortals or everyday people who don't practice are dummy. You remember that in the thing? Well, they never got into, it was more of a comedy, they never got into witches' ceremonies or Sabbaths or anything like that. Last night, a person asked me to watch who had gotten to read the script of the new one, Tabitha. So I watched it. It had witchcraft all through it, real witchcraft. Ceremonies, Halloween, everything. They're coming out stronger now. You better watch what your kids turn on the TV set. There hasn't been a witchcraft movie that had anything to do with Satan in the last five years that Satan didn't win openly in the picture. Tabitha, bewitched.
है ना I know. I've got reports on that. I was in witchcraft back then. I know what was going on. Yeah. Uh, wasn't there a woman had a lot to do with the show by the name of Louise Hubner? That's my foster mother. Yeah. What now? Usually through the... See, the Illuminati name's not used much anymore, except by everyday people who find out about it. Witches don't use it. The organization doesn't use it. And each country has its... Uh, the Mariah is the occult part, and the political part has a name in each country. And the United States is called the Council of Foreign Relations. That's mainly how they got into it. They mainly got into it because you can't become a president. You may think you elect a president, but I'm here to tell you, you elect whoever they put up. And when I was saved in 72, I got on a television broadcast that went throughout southern Texas, New Mexico, and so on, and it, they still got the tape down. It was on a talk show called The Seven Club in the morning, and I had a minister from the church there with me, Ed Human, and they asked me the political aspect that would be happening. Now, this was the election of Nixon and McGovern at the time, and I said a few things I don't want to really get into right now because we don't have the time, but one of the things I said was that the last election that would happen, the president, the next one that was coming up, the one that just happened, the president that would be elected would be the last president elected in the United States. That doesn't mean it will be the last election, it just means he'll be the last president. And that when he was elected, he was so important to be elected that the person who would run against him would also be Illuminati. That they wouldn't allow anybody else to get the nomination from the other party. And that he would purposely do everything during his campaign, the other party, in this case Ford, to throw that election. And if you'll look back on it, I think you'll see things that he did that proved that lost many, many votes. And then he almost won anyway. I think it would have been disastrous if he had won to them, not to us. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, yeah. We have talked with Reagan's son and other people, and they have told us of violent threats, bribes, death threats, assassination attempts, and everything that never reached the news media that went on during the uh, nomination thing for the Republican Party. Yes. It ain't easy. I've got a first grader that uh, went to school and every day she came home she said daddy here it is throw it in the trash can during the Halloween season the goblins the ghosts the witches the stuff they cut out she understood she says oh well Thanksgiving and Christmas is coming up she understood Halloween had absolutely nothing to do with Christianity Christians shouldn't even touch it with a 10 foot pole it comes from the word shaman uh, which means the day the dead come back and talk it was invented by witches capitalized on by the Catholics, but nothing in it has to do with Christians. Nothing. Who wants to celebrate a day that witches sacrificed thousands of people throughout the world on? Yes. White magic and black magic is a Catholic term. When they were burning people at the stake for being witches, they wanted to protect themselves that practiced it. So they invented the term white witchcraft or white magic and black magic. Witches, in their books, will tell you that it doesn't exist, as it was mentioned in Star Wars. And yet, when they're trying to convert a Christian, they will say they're white witch and not a black witch. And yet they'll tell you, in their books, it doesn't exist. Which means they'll say anything to convert you. But uh, there is no such thing. The devil is evil, and you can't whitewash him or anything he does. You can call it ESP, but it's still witchcraft. Yeah. Hypnosis is of the devil. Plain and simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Charismatic realm. Theirs is feeling and not word. I go into charismatic churches and speak, I know. And I want to tell you something. They can't understand why they have no young people. 
They can't understand why the young people are practicing witchcraft. It's because they've never been taught the word. They've been trying to give a form of discipline without love, strong discipline, no love to go with it, and no word, just emotion. And then they wonder why somebody is saved three months and then in the world three months later. A good example of this is Melody Land. It's got to probably be one of the worst churches in Calvary Chapel in the United States. Because it gives absolutely, they have a whole Bible college. They teach nothing but emotion and theory. They don't teach the word. Well, as long as you, well, one thing real quick here. Satanists believe in Satan. Witches do not. And there is a difference. Witches are taught that Satan and hell is a lie. I was saved for hours before I ever knew there was a devil. I concentrate on the scripture. I concentrate on the 16th chapter of Acts and Rome, I mean the Ephesians 6:12, the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy. Please don't quote, oh, uh, we suffer a witch to die. Please don't quote that to them. They scare them to death. But uh, work on the love and work on the scripture, but leave the devil and hell out of it if they're a witch. How much? Uh, certain groups use it. Other groups don't touch it. Okay? In fact, it's capital punishment to touch it. The death sentence. But uh, some use it, but they twist it. They Johnny, take it out of context. Huh? Little, time. Stay here just a moment, Johnny. Uh, <clears throat> during the preaching service, which will start in about five minutes, I'm going to be preaching a message on the real cure for witchcraft and all bondage. And uh, we invite you to stay for that. Then at 11.15, uh, Johnny Todd will speak again in this building and we'll have him continue from where he has uh, left off so that he will not be repeating himself. If you can ask more questions, so if you'll just stay through the preaching service at uh, 11.15, the second uh, Sunday school session will start and uh, Johnny Todd will continue from uh, the point of having left off. But first, I'd like to ask just a couple of questions, Johnny. Uh, a few years ago, I became interested in the subject of Freemasonry, and I'm wondering, is the witchcraft initiation anything like the uh, Masonic initiation? First level witchcraft and first level masonry initiation is identical. The only difference is that my wrist was cut and I signed a blood pack, and that I was nude, and they are clothed. That's the only difference. The words, the acts, the tying, the blindfold, the charge, everything, even the pledge of secrecy is exactly the same. There's no difference. And the sixth level initiation of witchcraft blood sacrifice is the same initiation to the highest level of masonry, the 35th. It's called the right of the warrior on the block. 35th degree. The 31st degree, which most of our politicians are 35th degree masons. Yeah. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's no such thing as a warlock. If you're witnessing to a witch, please... Unless it's a Satanist, please call him a wizard or a witch if you've got to call him anything except idiot. Uh, well, that's true. I was an idiot. I mean, anybody that's in it is. But uh, go ahead. Finish your question. They don't believe in hell. They believe they, when they die, they will come back in another life. Okay? In other words, it's deception. All right. Remember again, Johnny Todd will speak here again at 11.15. So... After a year's worth of training, initiated to the sixth level or grand druid position of witchcraft, I sat on a council of 13 people that take orders only from the Rothschild Tribunal in London, which they claim they take their orders directly from Lucifer. And that's why they reside. Somebody's asking me if there are some of the Rothschilds lived in California. Not those directly related to the tribunal. They won't leave England. Some live in France, but they always come over to England because they believe that England is the place that Lucifer is most fluent and can speak to them more in person than he could anywhere else. And from talking to Christians in England, they estimate there's only 2% of the population are Christians in the uh, Great Britain country. So uh, they have quite a fluent time over there. In fact, some friends of mine just brought pictures back of where they're building home with broomstick poles coming out of the chimney for the witch spirits to land on to bless their homes. These aren't ignorant people. These are the new million dollar mansions that are going up. It's not just a superstition. The country has really gone back to witchcraft. It was originally total witchcraft. So uh, this is the atmosphere I came out of. I was saved in Labor Day of 72 in San Antonio. 
to a movie, the Cross and the Switch played, a uh, coffee house ministry that belonged to a Baptist church there, and then later deliverance through that Baptist church. I've been ministering with people in the occult, and uh, in the last year, my main ministry has been to Christians playing with the occult. And uh, we're going to demonstrate that in a minute here. But uh, this is what our ministry outlook has been. We just, in uh, September, went to Minneapolis St. Paul area, which is where the occult owns one of their Bible colleges, their printing company, well After a year's worth of training, initiated to the sixth level or grand druid position of witchcraft, I sat on a council of 13 people that take orders only from the Rothschild Tribunal in London which they claim they take their orders directly from Lucifer. And that's why they reside. Somebody's asking me if some of the Rothschilds live in California. Not those directly related to the tribunal. They won't leave England. Some live in France, but they always come over to England because they believe that England is the place that Lucifer is most fluent and can speak to them more in person than he could anywhere else. And from talking to Christians in England, they estimate there's only 2% of the population are Christians in the uh, Great Britain country. So uh, they have quite a fluent time over there. In fact, some friends of mine just brought pictures back of where they're building homes with broomstick poles coming out of the chimney for the witch spirits to land on to bless their homes. These aren't ignorant people. These are the new million dollar mansions that are going up. It's not just a superstition. The country has really gone back to witchcraft. It was originally total witchcraft. So uh, this is the atmosphere I came out of. I was saved in Labor Day of 72 in San Antonio to a movie, the Cross and the Switch played, a uh, coffee house ministry that belonged to a Baptist church there, and then later deliverance through that Baptist church. I've been ministering with people in the occult, and uh, in the last year, my main ministry has been to Christians playing with the occult. And uh, we're going to demonstrate that in a minute here, but uh, this is what our ministry outlook has been. We just in uh, September, went to Minneapolis St. Paul area, which is where the occult owns one of their Bible colleges, their printing company, we will them. And, uh, through Christians giving, we bought 10,000 of the broken cross to distribute free there. We went there and we worked for two weeks there through the state fair and other things that was going on and had a hotline set up for them to call in. And they knew we were coming and they canceled their convention and it was booked close to a half a million people were scheduled to appear at their convention and they can't cost them thousands and thousands of dollars. And the story that the best we could get was they were too afraid that this broken cross would get in their hands since it has been the leading instrument for stopping people in joining and getting those that were in. And uh, they called the convention the Aquarian Arts Festival completely off. First time it's been done so in years. And uh, we're going back there. In fact, Friday and Saturday, we're going back for five meetings in the prayer force. The people who put the um, second $100,000 on my head came out of Minneapolis because of the last time we were up there. So uh, be in prayer for my safety while we're up there. I would really appreciate your prayer. It was kind of hairy the last time we were up there. But this is my background, and uh, I want to say one thing before we start here for those that are newcomers. The organization that I came out of is a cult in religion, not in purpose. Its purpose is political and financial power, complete world rule through finance, which they believe would control the political atmosphere. It's been called by many people the Illuminati, which is called Mariah. In the United States, it's called the Council of Foreign Relations. It has many, many names wherever you go. I met Dr. Rasmussen because he had come across it through the Masons. I've met people who have come across it through political things, through financial and banking, and wherever people have seen it, they have thought that's exactly what it was. It was either in one of those realms. I came out of a realm where I knew better. I came off of a council that was in charge of dishing money out and political orders. In my area, I had 5,000 COVID. That meant I had 65,000 priests and priestesses. That wasn't the congregation. That was just the ministers. I saw a, a movie by Hal Lindsey on the occult where he said he believed there were 5,000 witches in the United States. There are 25,000 witches in Los Angeles City alone. So he was way under, way under short. From the statistics that we are seeing right now, it is the fastest growing religion in the United States and definitely in the world. And the reason it is doing this is because it has its financial power and it's because the Christians, most of them, do not know their word and therefore are afraid of it. 
and therefore do not witness to the people that are in it. And uh, we have not had much success in the last couple of years because they have stepped up the death threats within the occult for people leaving. It's like a Berlin Wall. And the people were afraid to come out when we were there. We were in a meeting one night where we had over 5,000 people in one meeting. In that meeting, 1,500 of them were initiated priests and priestesses of witchcraft that had attended the meeting. And hundreds came up and told ministers, myself and my wife later, they would come out if we could guarantee them a safe place to go until they were strong enough to be on their own. We didn't have such a place. We're trying to repair such a place now. And if you're interested in helping in such a place, get with Dr. Rasmussen and he comes back from this trip, communicate with him your desire on this, since he will be one of the few people who will know where this place is and be able to send people to it. It will be completely hidden and secret. We had one once before in Phoenix, and three people were killed there one night because some pastors interfered with the security of the place, and uh, the occult was watching, and they came in and machine gunned to death three girls and wounded the worker. The girls were ages 15 to 18. They do not play games. And this is why we tell the young people, don't go, because they'll tell you to come in. It's nice. It's loving. It's a brotherhood, and you get in, and once you're initiated, you find out, It'll cost them $10,000 if you try to leave, but they'll send it. That's the minimum bounty they put on anybody's head getting out, and they don't care how young they are. So it's not a game. It's a real world out there. So uh, that's some quick background, a few words to the young people, how this takes like we did this morning, the questions and answers. Many of you were here, and I know you have questions and answers from this morning's service. Okay, since you asked that question, I wanted to do something before I forgot. If you will take out some pencil and paper, a few of you, I'm going to give you some facts. Now, we hear a lot of, of things rolled out on things, but I want to give you facts so that when you come up to somebody, especially just young people fooling with rock music, you'll have some facts. Now, I want to say one thing before we get started. Young people have been running all over saying hi, been friendly to me. They're going to want to lynch me when this is over. But young pe people, you'll just have to understand that I came out of a world that I saw something you don't see when you turn on the radio. Parents, if you're letting to compromise with your young people, them having rock music in your home, which you as Christian parents own and are responsible to the Lord for, then you're wrong. And I recommend you go home right now and throw it in the trash can immediately. And this is the reason why. You see groups up on the television and on the you hear them on the radio and in concert and stuff. And, you know, you don't see the behind thing. Now, here's one fact. Zodiac Productions, the leading Texas publication. It's changed its name now, but it was Zodiac Productions when I was with it. I was supposedly the owner of it. The occult owned it. And it was the leading source of concerts in Texas. Its office was in San Antonio. Because I was supposedly the owner, I met most of the groups in existence then. There are a few that have come out since then, but it's still the same type of thing. Almost all of them believe openly in the occult in one way or the other. Most are into Satanism. Now, how many Christian young people remember from Billy Jack, One Tin Soldier, the song? A few of you? Okay. The group you heard on the radio called Original Cast. They always said it was done by the Original Cast. The name of the group that was the Original Cast is Coven. It was led by Tom Laughlin's daughter. Tom Laughlin played Billy Jack, his wife. His son, David, who produced it, and both his daughters are into Satanism. In fact, they produced the only eight-track out on a complete Satanist step-by-step -step ceremony done by COVID. And that's the group who did One Tin Soldier. And I've seen all of the movies except the new one that's coming out, and every one of the Billy Jack movies are anti-Christian, pro-occult. The trial of Billy Jack dealt with demons and had more... Ceremonies of witchcraft and Satanism in, in it than it had anything about a trial of Billy Jack. And it was constant step by step ceremonies. It was reincarnation. Familiar spirits entered his body in the first Billy Jack and spoke through him, if you remember. Over and over it came through. Now that's one group. Rolling Stone. Mick Jagger has told openly, over and over on television, I don't know where our Christian young people were when it was going on, that when he was in jail before the Stones was ever formed, he sold his soul to the devil. That's impossible, but he did it anyway. He sold his soul to the devil to become the leading rock group in the nation, plus get out of prison. He is the leading rock group in the nation, in the world. He has wrote songs praising the devil. 
And I know the devil gave it to him because the devil always thinks on himself. And in one song that Jagger wrote, he said, it's not that I fool you who I am. Everybody knows who the devil is. It's the nature of my game that's confusing you. And this is why it is with Satan. See, we've got a little set of rules that Satan's supposed to obey, but he don't obey us. It's like the Illuminati. They own countries. They don't pick sides in a war. They cause a war and put both countries against each other, even though both countries belong to them. They don't have sides. They have a purpose. Satan has every religion except that which is under the blood of Jesus. That's where the confusion of the game is. We try to rationalize things good or bad, and we can't do that. We rationalize things Jesus or the devil. That's where you draw the line. But stagger over and over, and that goes with rock music too. Don't try to rationalize it good or bad. It's bad. Now, I want to give you an incident that will kind of sum it up. I did meet most of them. Most of them were in the occult, but most of them were on drugs. Now, I want to say something real quick here. How many remember a group called Bloodstone, or Blood Rock, I think it was? D.O.A., the song D.O.A. They did this song while they were on acid. They got the words. I talked with a guy. He said a demon. Well, he didn't call it a demon. He called it the spirit of this girl that he knew that had died in a car accident. It was a demon impersonating the girl. Appeared to him and gave him during this acid trip the notes, the words, and everything. They filed it with a copyright lawyer. The day after the copyright lawyer filed it, another group came in that was well-known at that time and filed the same song, note for note, word for word. And when I was in the occult, I thought it was interesting enough to check it up because I wrote for an occult newspaper and I put the story in the paper. They got it the same way. On an acid trip, the same night, from a demon in a, imitating a spirit of somebody they had known that had died. Most rock musicians get their music while on drugs or from spirit guides, which are demons. That's what the, your young people are buying and paying for. Now, I'll give you something supernatural you can file away if you don't want to receive it or take it home and, and get in the Word and see if it's possible. When witches write a book, they cast a spell over the book so it'll sell. And they order a demon to go into every copy that comes off the press. So when you own a book on witchcraft, you have a demon residing in your home, free of charge. The musicians who do the music that are in witchcraft do the same things to the record album. The same thing. So when you see that friendly little album spinning on your thing, ask yourself, was the musician a witch? Did he cast a spell over the album that the devil would have a pact in my home because I owned the record? There's more to it than records and books. And this morning, you remember, I gave the text and I meant to get into this end because it fits the text. Your warfare is not physical, it's spiritual. And every Christian should memorize Ephesians 6.12 and stand on it. Look beyond what you see with these. And look and know that the devil has got, what, thousands and thousands of years of experience. And unless we think with the mind of Christ, he's going to walk all over us. And that's why you stay under the blood. A young man came up and asked me today, can a witch cast a spell on a Christian? You can cast it on any Christian that's not living the life. If you want to fence straddle, you're a wide open target for any witch in the world. If you want to stand the blood and you want to walk the line and, and be within the word and within the spirit of God and wear the full armor of God, then you're going to be fine. But well, I think all of us know what it means when we come to church and set in the service and then go out and live like the devil all week long and think we're immune to anything of the devil. If you're going to live in his territory, he's going to live in yours. And that includes the rock music. I go along on that question, but I cannot miss the rock music. The main reason that young people go into witchcraft today is through the music. As I've told people, rock music didn't come out with Elvis Presley. It's thousands of years old. If you take it away, witches can't do witchcraft. They can't function without the music. It's a third of their power. You think about it. Well, many modern churches know who their source of power is anyway. Yeah. You would. You would. <laughs> All right. The question was, the question was this morning that I mentioned the chart that I had seen this morning. Or I mentioned this morning, I had seen, and when I saw the chart, it was August the 1st, 1972, for those that want to write it down, and I was saved in Labor Day, just shortly before I was saved. It was one of the main reasons I got saved. I wanted out after I saw the chart. The chart was a complete timetable that gave the Illuminati complete world control minus China. I want to specify that. Minus China in eight years. The reason minus China, they plan on taking China completely out too unruly to try and rule. They plan on wiping it out. And so I'll let that settle with you for a minute. And it gave him complete world control and religious control in eight years. Now the question was, what did the energy crisis and what did Jimmy Carter have to do with it? 
okay? I want to ask a question before I answer that. How many here honestly believe, if you don't believe now, this counts if you believe during the election time, that Jimmy Carter is a Christian president or is a Christian, period? Huh? I mean, any time from during the time he was running as candidate till now, if any time during that time you thought he was a Christian, maybe voted for him because he was a Christian. Okay. See, we have some intelligent people here. <laughs> I didn't mean it the way it came out. But it's, it's simply the reason that I got saved was because of Jimmy Carter. You don't sit at a table remembering Bible that you were taught when you were a young person and have people come in with a letter from the Rothschild signed with their crest saying, we have a man and name him that will be the world ruler and stay a witch. And the name was Jimmy Carter. I want you to start looking at, of course, you got to accept and throw away half of what you see on the television news today. I recommended the Christians in the last year that they buy a shortwave receiver and receive news broadcasts throughout the world. You'll find out in 30 days you missed two-thirds of what really happened. But uh, you also find out the Lord's really close after listening to it for about a month. But uh, the energy crisis is going to be the reason for the war, for the Third World War. It is their main objective. They believe through the energy crisis they will gain control of the world. That's what they've been waiting on. And if you believe there's an energy crisis, then you're dumber than some of the witches that are still witches. Yeah. The Church of Scientology was formed by a witchcraft coven in California originally. That its leader came from England on express orders of the Rothschild. Uh, there are a few religions we can't prove physically belong to the organization, but we have seen funding go their way. Now, as I have done quite a few a bit of investigation since I was saved because of facts I heard when I was in witchcraft, don't just look at obscene religions like Scientology, Jehovah Witness, Mormonism. Look at even Christian churches within Bible-believing denominations. There was a couple, quote, Jesus people, garbage churches, that began a few years ago in L.A., Costa Mesa, and so on. They had a few hundred kids. All of a sudden, the pastors move in the half a million dollar home, and the churches are taking their offerings out in armored cars. Now, where did they get the funds to buy a $2 million building overnight? They were preaching gospel. Now they're preaching trash. One of them is responsible for the so-called Jesus rock that has ruined half of the good Christian young people today. Now, I never have to speak against anything unless I go check it out. And I went down to Costa Mesa, and I saw something that bordered witchcraft on their open concert night at Calvary Chapel on Saturday night. There were people shoving and beating on each other just to get a seat in that place. And they turned hundreds away. Nothing was mentioned about Jesus, and a homosexual was leading the service. And you had to have been blind not to see it. And it was a total acid rock type concert in the name of Jesus. Now, that's the same group that puts out all your love song albums and, and all this stuff that people listen to. So, I try to warn as I go along things that we have found out. It's up to Christians. It's like Paul said, if you think meat is not a sin, eat it. And if you think it is, don't eat it. And if you want to buy what I'm saying, I think your walk will get a little stronger if you want to... Keep on listening to stuff. I can look at Christians and tell how strong they are in the Lord and where they're walking with him by the type of music they're listening to. And then I, I'm this way. If I find something in my life that I don't want to give up, I'll usually give it up. Because, you know, it's, just, it's that simple. When you don't want to give something up, the devil's usually trying to get you to hang on to it. Do I subscribe to Oral Roberts being a member of witchcraft? Or Roberts, if you'll check into it, used to, and this is fact, it's fact you can find in books. Before he ever considered laying hands on the sick, that they would recover, a Cherokee medium told him that he could do it. And he used to attend her seances regularly. Okay? What he is now, I can't say. I only know the fact of what he was. I was once a witch, so, you know, he could be a Christian. I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I know that he's gotten out of more of the Pentecostal charismatic and become more scriptural based on the Bible than on feeling now than he used to be. And I've known many ministers that were once witchcraft ministers under the guise of Christians that had just changed mid-river and became Christian. But they, rather than ruin their ministry, they'd never told anybody. And there are a few that I know that used to be on the payroll of the Illuminati that are now Christians. So I don't know. Yeah. No. All right, question is, can a demon possess a Christian? No. Can a demon influence a Christian? Yes. Yes. I was saved, born again, two weeks, and trying desperately to make it. Before the other ministers in the Baptist church I was at 
decided that I was never going to make it unless they got what I had invited in me in witchcraft out of me, because it was still there. It had lost control before I couldn't do anything it didn't want me to do. But from the time I accepted Jesus, that broke the control. But it had influence in my life still that had to go. And for those that have been on drugs and those that have been in the occult, and there have been a few that have come up and told me so, they'll, they'll probably bear witness that they have. This is what I was talking about earlier, the, the withdrawal. A lot of it went when I went through the occult withdrawal, which is worse than drug withdrawal. It is tremendously worse. A person that has come out of witchcraft that has been in it strongly and demon worship in particular can be one minute just sitting there really talking about the Lord, holding scripture, and the next minute knocking anybody down between you and the door. I've seen them claw up the wall with their bare fingers trying to claw out of the room they were going through a draw in just to get out because the force on the other side was calling them back to them, the other witches. This is what they do first. Then if they can't get you back, then they try and kill you supernaturally. That don't work on a Christian, so they try and... It's really funny. Most witches had given up the aspect of trying to kill me supernaturally shortly after I was saved. This is how they tried first. I went to Minneapolis, and they hadn't got the message, evidently. So they started casting spells, which didn't work at all, but you could fill them in the air. And then, when they found out that didn't work after a week, then they took the boat. But they hadn't gotten the message yet. But they're slowly learning they can't cast on a Christian if the Christian is sold out. I'm sure a few people know there's those that have Jesus as Savior, and then there's those that have Jesus as Lord. Yes. My wife was saved in a meeting a few years after I was saved, and she, her title was Lady Diana. That was her witch name. She was the state high priestess. She ruled everything in the state of Ohio that was in witchcraft. She was also the witch queen of one of the denominational you know, brotherhoods, the Watchers. On a scale in this country of maybe 1 to 25, she was probably the 10 most powerful witch in the United States for my salvation. And she has close to $50,000 on her head because she's come out, not because she's married me, just because she got saved. And we took her into a rehabilitation ministry, and then later we started dating and were married and so on. But uh, she does a fine ministry. Right now she's just about ready to deliver a baby. She thinks she might even have it today. So uh, she's not exactly ministering lately. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, let me take about five minutes here. The question is, is human sacrifice practiced in witchcraft? I have to be kind of careful since a police officer is present here without incriminating myself or something. But uh, the Broken Cross was written by myself and Jack Chick. When it was reproduced, the guy who was doing the wording in the book, you know, writing our story form out, changed a few words. He thought were stronger. He changed the word witchcraft to Satanism a couple places. And he changed the word Lucifer to Satan. That messed up the book. We didn't catch it until just recently, all these years. I've been reading just kind of skipping over it because it means the same thing in my mind. But when a witch who doesn't believe in Satan reads it, it blows the whole thing. Because it wasn't written on Satanism, it was written on witchcraft. So the next printing coming out, they're changing the words back the way they're supposed to be. Satanism practices a form of, of sacrifice in some groups. Witches practice it more. To the everyday witch, that's a lie, I'm telling you. There's a few witches here in the congregation tonight that I know. You know. But there's a few here also that are in the human sacrifice, and they know I'm not lying. And when you get up into a higher level, fourth, fifth, or sixth, you find out that the power rests with blood sacrifice. You become what is called a human challenge. In other words, you are proving to Satan through the blood and the death of this person that you are sold totally out to him, although they don't believe in Satan. You're proving it to Lucifer. I always, the things that always puzzled me was if we were worshiping a God of love, peace, and joy, why were we killing somebody to worship him? It was one of the things I could never understand. But uh, this is the, the thing that goes on. One of the books most interesting that proves it, I'm saying this for witches that are present, not the Christians, leave it alone, is the Aleister Crowley Library where he was involved in human sacrifice and he was a master magician or witch or wizard, whatever term they want to use. So it does go on. And in fact, to become a six-level witch, you must perform it. It's just like when they, they tell, now this is for the women, not the men, when they tell the young girls getting into witchcraft that homosexuality has nothing to do with witchcraft. In order to become a high priest, the girl must be bisexual. She must perform a bisexual act. So see, every level you go to, they tell you a different story. And they tell you the people below aren't ready to receive it yet. And so every step you go up the ladder, everything you've been told before is a lie, and all of a sudden you learn new truth. The only type of witches that are kind of ignorant, and there are a couple of them here today, 
are the self-proclaimed witches, the ones who are practicing outside the organization on their own, and they think they know it all, he says. They'll find out one of these days when an enforcer comes from the organization and tells them you either join or you die. Then they'll find out it's not a game anymore. See, it's just like the mafia. You don't function on anything else. Let's take a few new back here in the blue shirt. What? Oh, I think it started in the garden. Since the main lie of witchcraft is God's self, and that's the lie that Lucifer or Satan gave Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, we can find it starting in, uh, before the flood and going on through. Of course, uh, we had, um, uh, Neiman, who hunted the souls of man, who sacrificed babies. Uh, I want to say one thing since you brought that up. Astrology comes from Babylon. The high priests of Babylon were called the Chaldeans, and they invented astrology. It is the cornerstone of witchcraft spell casting. If you take astrology away, witches can't cast spells. And the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy lists the death sentences that the Jews used to have on them for doing things and following the stars as one. So when somebody comes up and says, what sign are you, say the sign of the cross. Now I'm going to tell you something. In witchcraft, they have a belief that says you are what you are when you were born. You can never change, okay? There is no miracle salvation in their doctrine. I was a Taurus, and I had all the personality of a Taurus till I was saved. I have none of that personality now. You do change through the blood. If you want to believe that you are born a certain way and have a certain personality, fine. Take the blood of Jesus Christ and you'll find out if you walk in the Bible, you'll all have one personality, that of Jesus. And his wasn't any particular sign. So um, I get Christians who come up all the time and want me to, to give them permission, you know, by saying, yeah, astrology's all right, don't worry about it. And I, it amazes me. They'll ask me and I'll say no, and they'll ask me again and they'll say no, and they'll ask me again and they'll say no, and they keep on asking me and I'm still saying no, you know. And they go through it about eight times. I guess they think they'll break me down eventually. The answer is no. Astrology belongs to the devil. God doesn't use the stars. They say, what about the wise men? The wise men weren't astrologers. They were astronomers. A new star appeared. Not a new fortune under the stars. But if you take the times and the seasons and astrology away from a witch, they can't cast spells. Because spells are based upon astrology. So, if you want to read Gene Dixon or Louise Schubner in the newspaper, that's your choice. You're the one that's going to have to face our Lord for it. Yeah. I'm um, glad you brought that up. Okay, for the tape recorders bit and a few people who didn't hear it. Hey, is in the health business and he's in it. You know, Christians are interested, especially now, I've been noticing, in better health. And I know I'm glad this church particularly is. But he seems to attract in his business. We have a health food store. Uh, the occult. Okay, now this is why. The occults teach good health. They teach herbs. They teach um, vitamins and food. But they don't obey it. It's just like witches teach they are pagan. That's the word for the witchcraft religion. You're a pagan. Meaning you should be a country folk. And many witches have tried to move to the country and 30 days later they're crying and moving back to the city. They can't stand the country. They can't function without people around them. They have a lot of doctrines, but they can't keep them. And the health food is one of the doctrines. It's the devil trying to counterfeit something out of the word of God that he can't keep. That's it. And I remember I always tried to do this and do that and healthy. How? I weighed 149 pounds doing $150 worth of mainline, mainline shooting speed a day. How am I healthy? They can't keep it because the drug and the excitement of the city spoils it. They've got to have it to draw power and energy. They have to be where more demons that that people are because it's like a, a dynamo of power. It's without, you know, getting into the deliverance message here. That's the quickest explanation I can know. I know that when I first got saved, I wouldn't touch the health food thing because I heard about it in the occult. So I started realizing we didn't practice it in the occult. We were just trying to counterfeit it. So I'm very, very much into it. The only problem is a lot of the good things that I have to get come from the Mormon church. So I know, and that's what you mentioned on the Mormon. But it's again a counterfeit. The Mormons try to counterfeit a good, quote, Christian home life. They don't accomplish it very well, but they try to do it. So uh, if we threw everything out that the devil tries to counterfeit, we'd never have anything. The higher up, it's one of the things I can't find out for sure where they get their money from. Okay? That's all I know. Yeah. It's a form of fortune telling. Okay? I know the leader of the occult in the United States, Gavin Frost, reads your fingernail. And I asked him one time when I was in the occult, I said, Gavin, there is no occult teaching on fingernails. He says, John, now you know, or he said, Lance, you know when you lay the cards down 
And this is my way of answering. When they lay a fortune card down, they don't read the card. They read pictures and messages that come to them. That's why it's individual. It's not how the cards fall. The cards are just uh, a prop in the play. They still get psychic messages. It's all a form of psychic reading that they're still going to give you the definition from. He says, I just touched the finger now because the people accept something physical before they accept something supernatural. It's just like uh, witchcraft has grown so much recently because now all of a sudden it's uh, telekinesis and EFT and, and clinical parapsychology names for the devil's power. So it's more acceptable now. It's still the same thing. Yes. How can you detect the witch? Mm. Supernaturally or physically? Well, I'll tell you this. The witch will detect you if you're a Christian before you'll detect them. Okay? But uh, jewelry-wise, usually the five-pointed star in a circle or the six-pointed star or um, the cross with a serpent entwined about it, you see one of those get away from it. That's their little suicide group. That's the one Manson belongs to, the process. Um, the ghost head, uh, triangles. It's, it's, I've had, that's one of the reasons I had one in the black world, but we didn't get it set up in time. Uh, it's jewelry. They're, in certain areas, it depends upon the leader. They make the females dress in certain sensuous ways, but out here they don't. Um, makeup on the eyes, particularly in a female. When we get a witch saved out of witchcraft, they can't touch makeup for almost three months because they're taught to use makeup for witchcraft, which is what it was invented for, and they can't touch it for three months because the spirits that came out of them try to get back into them through the makeup. And we've lost many people through it. Later, if they grow and strong in the Lord, if they want to use a little makeup, they can, but they never go back to using it the way they were taught to use it in witchcraft. Uh, supernaturally, you can detect it through the eyes. Many people, after being around witches for a while, start to see the difference between witches' eyes and everybody else's eyes. It's just simply the demons that were in them, okay? and the wisdom that came with it. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad somebody brought that up. The Attorney General we have now was, before Carter appointed him, and by the way, was also in charge of Carter's campaign, the man who formed the National Lobby for Gun Control. He has spent over $5 million of his own finance to ban guns in the country. Now, we're told two things on the gun control. Then I will tell you what the new gun control act is that's been written that we just got our eyes on to recently. The gun control lobbyists say, quote, we only want to ban handguns. Well, they proved that's a lie when they just tried to ban all guns and gave the National Guard the right to go in and confiscate them in, in uh, um, yeah, Massachusetts. So that was defeated. And the other was the law-abiding citizens could own it. Right now, you can own a handgun in Frisco if you get permission, right? But they're not giving permission to anybody. Now, the new Gun Control Act, and the reason I'm on this about guns is their timetable will never accept, will never work if individuals are allowed to buy guns. This is one of their main objectives to get rid of. If you'll notice, England's a prime example of it, and that was the Rothschild's doing. The new Gun Control Act is you're only allowed to own a single shot or a double barrel or over and under shotgun, something that can't contain more than two shells at a time, shotguns only, and all ammunition and all guns must be stored at the police station or armory at dusk and can be picked up at dawn. And all fired spent cases must be returned and be counted so that you won't be holding any ammunition back. That's Carter's new gun act. He expects to have it a law in two years. The timetable says expect to lose your gun in six to nine months in California. I have a Christian friend that is a special investigator that I just talked to recently on the phone two days ago for the Attorney General's office in California. Brown called secretly last week a special secret grand jury to consider total gun ban and confiscation in California, meaning they can come to your home without search warrant and confiscate any guns if you're on record for it. He expects to have it passed, expects to call grand jury. Every one of the people on it, except the special investigator that big enough information, is every time he brought in information pro-gun, they threw it out. Wouldn't even bring it to the grand jury. Once the grand jury says, yeah, we got a lot of bad stuff here, they're going to take it to the legislature in six to nine months or get your hand done. Yeah. What? You fascinating family? No, I haven't. In witchcraft? Not Satanism. Witchcraft. No, I haven't. Yeah. Right here. Go on. Okay. Uh, uh, quickly, how much time do we have yet? Five minutes? Okay. I will. Have you ever heard of the Aquarian Bible? I'll take first. Okay. With uh, I own the cult stores. My wife owned the cult stores. In fact, my wife, when she was saved, owned the biggest occult store in the United States, the witch's cauldron. And it sold it. It is a Bible, supposedly a book, 
the Paul to be containing the missing first 12 years of Christ's life, and that he was not the son of God, but he was taught in Egypt and India the practices of witchcraft, including raising himself from the dead. That's the Aquarian gospel, that he was a master witch. The next is that I said that Mormons aren't Christian. Christian means follower of Christ. Christ said he is the only way and you must be born again. Mormons do not believe in a born again experience. No, they do not. Have I been a Mormon? I've talked to dozens of Mormons. They do not believe in a born again. They do not believe in, okay, their Bible is completely contrary to our Bible. I'm not going to sit here and debate Mormonism, but they do not believe in a born again experience. Not the way that the Bible foretells the born again experience through repentance and through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? They don't believe in a second coming. They don't believe it in a lot of things that it contains. They don't. I'm not going to argue. No, they don't. I talked with their pastors. I know. I went. I talked to the Mason. I their elder. I talked with the the I quote pastor for the other people's benefit in charge of the temple in Mesa. And that, if you'll know anything about it, is one of their largest. And this is stuff that he asked me because I wanted to know. And this is the fact that he told me. I told him what we believe, and I said, "What do you believe?" And it didn't match up. What they said that tried to make it sound that way. But then I pulled a direct scripture and said, do you believe it this way? And they said, no. Yes. You know, you can get a hold of your pastor. In fact, I'm out here quite a bit talking to him. So he can contact me. Oh, okay. I'll give you our post office box real quick if you want to write it down and you can contact me. Um, give me a second here. I'll get to it before we close and I'll give it to you. Let me take another question. Yeah. No. Uh, it's just the doctrine of devil. That's the way I know how it's Yeah. Going. The healing? Well... You never been to a Christian Science? I mean, a uh, um, Spiritual Church of America, have you? Christian Spiritualism. They lay hands on sick, so do witches. Okay. Yeah. President Kennedy was a member of witchcraft, and I, I, I can't get into it today. But we've got the documentation on three months before he was killed, and the reason he was killed was because he was converted to Christ. The blonde here, right here, behind you there, ma'am. Go ahead. What was your question? Oh, a question? Okay. Yeah. You should tell your mother to write him a very nasty note telling him that... Okay. She has a teacher write... Uh, she has a in history. Mm -hmm. ...whom I've come to know around him well. A man that I respect very highly. Uh, a man who, for having been a Christian for only five years, knows a great deal about the Word of God and about it from a very practical standpoint. He understands the power and the protection of Christ, the lives of those who trust him. He'll be telling you about that. We're glad to have Johnny Todd back with us once again. God bless you, Johnny. Just be. Uh, last time I was here, I, I was sitting down there so I didn't see how many people were here in the second service that I was here. Uh, the last time I was here in the second service. is the young lady we prayed for after the service here. Uh, after the service, we prayed for young lady about some problems. Since then, a few more things have happened around here. Uh, I don't know if the other young lady is here or not. I didn't pay attention when I came in. But uh, as I'm ministering today, I want to point out a very real thing. The witchcraft today argue that the power that they have is extrasensory perception. Many Christians are now believing in witchcraft under the disguise of scientific terms, ESE, clairvoyancy, telekinesis, and parapsychology, so on, because that's acceptable. The scientists say it's so, so that's acceptable. The only problem is, today, and I want to point out through the Word of God, that it was still going on in Jesus' time, and Paul ran across the person of this power. We're going to discuss this in a few minutes in the 16th chapter of Acts. And when Paul was done with this person, he was done with her by casting demons out of her, she no longer had that power. So I have a question for you today. If you're having psych, uh, psychic experiences or your parents had psychic experiences, I really invite you to get a hold of the pastor or his staff after this meeting is over or over the next couple of weeks. I'm still putting very busy here because I'm leaving as soon as the service is over for the East Coast. But talk to him about it because when I was saved, I still contained all the psychic power that I had for two weeks. And I kept wondering what was going on. And my eyes still had kind of a look uh, as people that have been around witchcraft or been in witchcraft know the look I'm talking about. And my eyes still contained this look and people in the church were wondering what was going on. Although I was trying to live a Christian life very hard, wasn't really involved in sin, but I still had all this psychic phenomenon happening around me. I was still very bothered with the things that I'd come out of and addicted to them. Not drugs, but the psychic part. 
And finally, the church decided if it was good enough for Paul, it was good enough for them. And uh, they took me off in a room and they prayed for me for about five hours. And they demanded that the spirits that I had allowed in myself through asking them to come in in witchcraft to leave. When I walked out of that room, I no longer had any psychic power whatsoever. So I don't care what Duke University or what the Inquirer or what the charismatic movement or what anybody else says about ESP or any psychic powers. You call the demons out, the psychic power stops. And witches have argued with me for five years over this. They said, Weren't, didn't you have your psychic power when you were born? Yes, because the word of God says the sins of the parents are visited upon the children, and my parents were witches and their parents were witches, and on down the line. And the witches that were born into witchcraft had that power. But now that they've gone evangelical, now that they're going out and winning people over who have never been in witchcraft, and their parents were not in witchcraft, they have to teach them how to gain psychic power, because they didn't inherit the spirits of their parents. But I want to read some scripture for you. I don't want you to go away mad here. Turn with me, if you will, to Galatians chapter 5. I'm sure all Christians are very familiar with the fruit of the Spirit, but we need to know about the fruit of the flesh also. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lavishness, idolatry, witchcraft. If you have a Schofield or a modern version, it's wrong. In verse 20, it says sorcery. The word in the Greek is for witchcraft. Sorcery and witchcraft are different. Sorcery is the use of drugs. It is not witchcraft. In fact, the base word for it is the same word that pharmacist comes from. And it's the use, occult practice use of drugs to obtain supernatural powers. Witchcraft is different. Witchcraft is demonic worship. This is witchcraft. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations. Wrath, strife, seduction, heresies, envies, murders, it goes on. Witchcraft is a fruit of the flesh, the flesh ruled by the devil. Go with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy 18. If you want to mark these in your Bible, mark them. When you're witnessing to somebody who is involved, particularly I want to point out something today. I'm not so interested in, in hitting on witchcraft as much as I am on hitting practices that for some reason the Christian church today, the liberal churches, I'm sorry to say even some independent Baptists will come up to me and say, this is all right, it's in the Word of God, it's all right, it's in the Word of God, but it's not all right, and we're going to go over it. If you want a list of what the occult is, it's found in Deuteronomy 18, starting with verse 10, and these are abominations unto the Lord. These are things that make the Lord so angry that in the Old Testament he ordered a death sentence of stoning outside the city if you were caught doing these things just once. Not a dozen times, once. Now the reason for this was the Jews did not have what we call deliverance. They did not have the power to call demons out in the name of Jesus. They didn't have this yet. The blood hadn't been paid. So the power was not there to do this. Their answer was to take them outside the city and stone them to death because they knew that if you came in contact with a fortune teller and you let a fortune teller tell your fortune, you obtained the same spirits from her that she had. They also knew that if you went to a medium and sat in a seance, you obtained the same spirits. If you went to an astrologer and had her do your chart, you received the same spirit. I want to give you an example. My foster mother, when she wrote a book, she said that over every chart that she did, astrology chart, she used to work for the LA Times and do the charts for them. She said over every personal chart that she did, she would light candles and demand that spirits from the underworld enter those charts so that when the person took the charts, they would be under her control. Okay, when she wrote her book, she did the same thing to her book, and she demanded that a demon enter every book that came off the press so that the person reading the book would be addicted to the world of the occult. And all writers on the occult do the same thing. All right? Now, let's read what the definitions of these are. Since we're reading the King James, I will stop and I will tell you. There's many repeats. Some of the words mean the same thing. There shall not be... How many of you have got Schofield? with you. Okay, you're going to be a little confused as we go along here. He changes them quite a bit. 
There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That's not walking on coals. The old form of human sacrifice in the Old Testament done unto Baal was to take your child and throw them into the flames to be burned alive as a sacrifice in the Baal. That's what it's talking about. Sacrifice. And a lot of it goes on. Or that uses divination. I'm, if you are going to be embarrassed about it, you don't have to do it. But if you'd like to be honest, it might help some of the others who aren't going to be honest. How many of you have ever had your fortune told, or even with playing cards as a joke at a party, or went to a fortune teller, or anything like this? How many of you have had it done? That's divination. Parapsychology calls it clairvoyancy. They like to change it a little. Okay? That's divination. That's fortune telling without the use of familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are spirit guides, the witches believe, have, are spirits of people who have died. We know from the word of God they're demonic spirits. They're the angels that fell with Lucifer. This is without them. This is using so-called ESP. They're inside them talking, they're giving them the knowledge, and the cards have definitions to add to it. Most people think when a person turns a card over, that card has a definition. Most people will tell you that use the tarot cards or playing cards, which, by the way, were made to cast spells with and tell fortunes before Hoyle ever came around and invented poker, okay? In fact, there are some witches who won't use the tarot cards because the playing cards are older and more powerful. But they usually get psychic pictures besides the definitions. There's much power to that, and that's why God said, no, you don't need it. You have my word, you don't need this thing. The next one is an observer of time. Anybody can shout it out real quick, what's it mean? Astrology. How many of you right now believe astrology is all right for a Christian? Raise your hand. How many of us have followed astrology? Now that means when the LA Times comes in, you just can't wait to open it up and look at it, okay? I do see the other sister around. <laughs> she knows what I mean. She was addicted to it. All right. Is astrology addiction? It's addiction. She was hooked on it just the same as a heroin addict. She had to have a spirit cast out of her before she could stop reading it. She was that addicted to it. She went home and burned it all, right? That's when she got free and destroyed this stuff, okay? There's demons involved in this. People argue with me that astrology is all right because the wise men were astrologers. No, they were following a star that had appeared in heaven. They were astronomers, not astrologers. Okay? Astrologers say that the stars destined you. Once you are born, you are going to stay that way. No matter what happens in your life, you can never change. The Word of God says that through the blood of Jesus Christ, you can change. That's why witches find it so hard to believe in the Christian faith because they don't understand it. There's no miracle change in their life. That's why when they meet me, they can't understand it. I've got a picture in my billfold that we found by accident going through some belongings of myself about uh, a year after I became a grand druid. I want to show it to the pastor later. I didn't even recognize myself. That's the difference in myself now and then. They don't understand this miracle change. It changes you physically, it changes you spiritually. But according to astrology, that's impossible. You stop becoming a Scorpio and a Taurus when you become a Christian. I find it very beautiful when somebody walks up to me and says, what sign you are? I said, the sign of the blood of Jesus. That's all you have to say. You're not a set personality. If that's so, then the Word of God is alive because it says you're supposed to grow in the Word of God and have the fruit of the Spirit, and that's the only sign you should have, is Galatians 5. All right? Or an enchanter, that's a hypnotist. How many of you have been hypnotized? I've heard Christians going around now, Christian ministers, using hypnotists to minister to people. Don't believe it. It was outlawed in the time of God, and if it's called hypnotism now, and if it's called enchantment then, it's still the same thing, it's still the money car, and the Word of God says, uh-uh. Okay? Or oh, a witch? I think that's self-explanatory. That's a person who casts spells on other people and controls them with their mind. Parapsychology calls it telekinesis. Whether it's making you do something with their mind or bending the fork for television's sake, it's still the same thing. A charmer? A charmer is style of a witch. It's a lesser degree. A consulter with familiar spirits. You'll find it on down in the here. A uh, consulter with familiar spirits is a medium. That is somebody who asks the spirits to guide them. How many of you have used the Ouija board? That's a consulter of familiar spirits. How many of you have made the mistake of letting somebody, or you've done it yourself, 
swing the button over your hand to find out if you're going to have a boy or a girl. They laugh about it, but it goes on. It's so strange those babies always have the worst problems after they're born because they've done that. That's consulting with familiar spirits. That's what happened in the 16th chapter. Okay? Or a wizard. That's a male witch. Not warlock. Wizard. Or a necromancer. That's somebody who uses familiar spirits to tell the future. Definitely like the Ouija board. Okay? Consult a familiar spirit to be more like a medium. A necromancer would be the, somebody using the Ouija board to gain knowledge from demonic spirits. Okay? For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. That's why he wiped out the land the Jews went in, so that wouldn't touch them. Because that's what was going on. And all of the time the Jews dwelt in that land, they were surrounded by people who did this. Now the Christians are surrounded about it. Welcome to the club. Turn with me to the 16th chapter of Acts. If you run across the witch, I settle the whole thing. You run across somebody who's in the occult, whether they're witchcraft or not, and they want to argue with you that it's perfectly all right, that ignorance disagree with it, break open your Bible. Of course, witches don't believe in the Bible, so you won't get very far with them. But for the Christians who want to play games with you, who want to say this is right and that is right, and they were born with a par, they were a little ex, they are a little spatial, you know, this is the story. See, the same story that the devil used in the garden for Adam and Eve is the story that he's seeing the world with today that makes the occult grow. I'm going to make you a god. He can't even make himself a god. How's he going to make you a god? Remember what was going to make him a god? Knowledge. And the knowledge of the occult is spreading because people think that with it, they are more special than the person next to them. And that's why they become involved. Okay? 16, reading with me. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination. Divination? Fortune telling. Possessed with a spirit of fortune telling. So for those that like to turn cards and say it's EFP, you read them this. Met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. How many have heard of Jean Dixon? What does she call herself? A soothsayer. Where does she say she gets it from? God. That's blast came from a demon. Soothsaying. Looking into the future and prophesying. Satan's counterfeit of what the prophets of God did. Satan has never originated anything in his life. You can better believe it that if it's in the occult, the Christian church is either doing it today or they were doing it. And God has passed on to a new thing. But God did it once. The devil's not, he is not creating anything. He can only counterfeit. Most interesting, I'm glad that Jesus left us one sign that the whole world would know we were his. Because it's the one sign the devil can't imitate. He does not have anything inside him to counterfeit it. It's called love. That's why you have to have the death threat in the occult to keep it going. Then the same, the same follow Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. I've had hundreds of people come to me and tell me the Ouija board is correct, fortune tellers are all right, because they had just gotten saved, and a year before some medium or the Ouija board or something told them that the Christian way was the right way. Most of the time when I get to talking to them, I found out they never got or born again anyway. They just decided to switch over to being a Christian. The devil knows the blood of Jesus shed. He knows it's the right way. I've had mediums get up and interrupt the service and stand there and preach a message about how God was the most powerful God because the devil was not afraid of losing the person. I've had them come up and ask for deliverance and have the demons removed as a challenge because they did not want them removed. They were not going to leave because the people didn't want them out. And the devil was not afraid of having the person stand up and say it. But Paul left this person alone for several days. If you read it, she did this many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ, not Mary, not Yahweh, no other name, not Diana or Kurnos, Jesus Christ. And it was said by a person who knew him personally, a personal relationship. In the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her, and it came out the same hour. In some translations, it says the same moment. And when her master saw the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and threw them in the marketplace to the rulers. When it happened, when the demon was gone, their gains were gone. 
because she couldn't tell fortune anymore. She didn't have that special little par that the other people went and paid her to tell about because it was gone. It was of the devil and it was gone. So when people come up to you and say that this person said it on the Phil Donahue saw or Mike Douglas had somebody else on it and so on and so on and so on, there was just a big controversy in the L.A. County area about legalizing fortune telling without a license and witchcraft and everything. The reason being was the great crest, so-called great psyche, had told the L.A. Police Department that if they would do this, he would come and tell them who the strangler was. Sure, the devil will think on the devil. He doesn't care. So this was the deal, and they even sent a witch out from Ed Colvin to sit there and cast a spell over the city council or county council, whatever it was, as they were voting on this thing. She was waving her wand around and her incense in the air. But at the same time, there were Christians praying outside the building. And I don't know where the witch's minds were. When it was over, they told the newsman, they said, well, why didn't your spell work? And they said, all some dumb Christians were outside praying against us. Well, that's saying the Christians are stronger. We know that. I'm surprised they didn't have a revival in witchcraft right then and there. I mean, three Christians was all it was outside praying. They had about eight coven all through the area casting spells on the city council, and all the Christians were doing were pleading the blood of Jesus Christ over the councilmen, whether they were Christians or not. It's about time we stand up and start taking authority over the principalities and powers. Read Ephesians 6.12. That's what runs the area. And we need to take authority over it and stand up. And when I was here before, I talked on the Illuminati. I talked on the physical kingdom of the devil. But there is a spiritual kingdom, too. And without the spiritual kingdom, that physical kingdom wouldn't function. Now, I'm going to take a few, few quick moments here. When we come back to questions and answers in the second session, ask anything you want, whether it be on the Illuminati or whatever. If I haven't got the answer, I won't be able to answer you. <laughs> but I'll try. There is a book that we have worked we went down to Chick Publications for two days last week. It's been almost six hours of just working the story out and researching in the Word and bringing out documents. It's going to be called The Angel of Light. It's going to be out in about six months. It's not going to pull any strength. Last time we had a little debate about Mormonism in here when I was in here the last time. We, Jack had the top experts on the Mormon church come in. They're going to hit the Mormon church. They're going to hit anything that has the devil in his earthly and spiritual kingdom in this book. Now, I want to bring it out because I'm asking you to pray about it. Pray for it. They're having a lot of problems with it. They feel that if they do this book, they may never be able to do another book because it doesn't call any strength. The pastor knows a few things that are coming out in it. The other thing I want to bring out real quick is that we have been given the land for the retreat that I mentioned when I was here the last time. There were some buildings standing on this under construction. Somehow, within a two-week period of time, they found out about the construction of this area, and they went and pulled the buildings down to the ground. That's how I was in Sacramento, a witch came up to me and says, we know you've got the land. Don't try to build it. We need your prayers for this thing. We need this thing built by March, by the time I return from the East Coast, because Going out there, we know there's going to be people saved. We have no place to send them if they're in danger. No place at all that they'll be safe. So we need your prayers. If you have building supply, if you have finance, if you have anything, see the pastor or see Tom Collins and get this material to them. Because Brother Tom's going to go ahead and build it while we're gone. It's there. We need concrete block. We need two-by-fours. We need, we need construction people. We need everything. So if you don't know Brother Tom, pastor after you, then he'll put you in touch with him. Okay, how much time do we have, Pastor? Let's take questions and answers. Anybody have a question? Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> they know, but uh, there's no use broadcasting it. It's in California, and it's about 55 miles from here. It's in the mountains. Yeah. We receive them in courier pouches, usually carried by the U.S. State Department. Uh, the only time we received orders like that didn't come from the tribunal. <laughs> They came in Sabbath where Lucifer would appear. But usually he appears. Remember, too many people got the devil spread out all over the place. He is one being. He's not God. He can only be. If Lucifer's standing here this very moment, he's nowhere else in the whole universe. So usually he sets, he's at the Rothschild house to give them orders, or he appears at what is called the Golden Don Coven. One thing I've got to add to you. It's come up too much. We're bringing it out in the new book. How many of you 
read C.S. Lewis. How many of you read J.R.R. Tolkien? Burn them. I'm going to repeat this. Burn them. No, burn them. Burn them. Lewis was supposed to have been one to the Lord by Tolkien. And Tolkien was supposed to be a Christian. The witches call all those books their Bible. They have to read them before they can be initiated. And it is well known in England and published in witchcraft books that they both belong to Rothschild's private coven. Tolkien's son is up for vote in three months to become the leader of the Illuminati. They're not Christian books. We have found books that are out, outside of the screw type letters that are on the gods where Tolkien talks of the gods Diana and Kurnos and others as being the real god. Well, not Tolkien, Lewis, C.S. Lewis, who's supposed to be a Christian, and those books are sold in Christian stores. Burn them. They're witchcraft books. Any questions yet? <laughs> oh, how many times has that question come up this week? Without TV, the Illuminati would never gain control of the world. There's symbols on the TV set that are hypnotic symbols. You can talk to anybody that's a hypnotist, and they can tell you why do you think that you can sit there and somebody can scream in your ear half the time and you don't know they're screaming at you? There are things that are burnt into your mind through the TV sets that are subtle, that are symbols and words and action. And we've talked with people that know of these things that go on and they have confirmed this. Besides, two of the major networks in this country are completely Illuminati owned, lock, stock and barrel, ABC and CBS. And NBC is 90% Illuminati. And then most of the Christian television I don't watch because they receive large donations from them to tone the programs down. So uh, Jack Chick asked me what I thought about him going on TV on a regular series. I said he'd never get there. Try getting a serious Bible-believing program on TV that preaches hardcore gospel. It'll never happen. If you think Jerry Farwell is hardcore gospel, I have a little piece of news for you. No way. The girl that took my plate as Grand Druid, Lavina, is a member of his church, and her parents are on his staff. No way. Yes. To defend me, I never went to court. It never got to court. That's simple. It never got to court. Okay? It just disappeared. I never got arrested. Brenner, guy, Bob Brenner owned Brenner Enterprises that was a covering network for us and got one ticket one time on his Cadillac outside his nightclub, and the police officer was looking for work the next day because he should have known that was his car. Yes. You're going to have to repeat that. I okay. I'll settle it this way because I can't completely hear him. I think I understand. Uh, okay. I didn't. I was going to answer a different question. Okay. UFOs, the inter occult teaches UFOs are angels of light to deceive the world into believing that we will later be invaded from outer space so that you can have a one world army looking that way. Considering they feel that one of these days they're going to be invaded from outer space. And they really believe they can defeat that invasion coming from outer space. Now how many of you know what invasion I'm talking about? They do too. And they really feel they can defeat it. That's the purpose. If you'll notice all of the so-called landings and softer bases are in prime pyramid or cold areas such as the Bermuda Triangle, over the pyramid, over the, the gap in the North Pole, places like this. These are sacred pit openings to the occult. Okay? Any any other? Yeah. The warlock is Scotch Gaelic, meaning backslider or traitor. The Catholic Church applied it to the first Protestant. Okay? It never was applied to witchcraft. The Satanists used it for shock value in this country. The television's added to it. Which is, you see, witch is from the word Wicca, which is the name of their religion, which means wise one. And witch is the female version, and wizard is the male version. Wizard means wise one or teacher, and witch is wise one or leader. That's why the women are the leaders, the men are the teachers. Okay? That's the term. Warlock is, uh, in fact, if you go to England, you won't even hear it. And that's where the stronger witchcraft is. It's just more or less used in this country, and the Satanists use it for shock value, because... If you, you go up and you say, I'm a wizard, nobody knows what you're talking about. Because if you wish, you go up and say, I'm a warlock, everybody knows, well, oh, he's something great, you know. So that's why they've used it, and that's how spread it. But warlock isn't a witch term. It actually was a term applied to the first Protestants in Scotland and Ireland. Any others? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, you're talking about, okay, she, she asked me an occult question. She asked if I know anything about the angel that was supposed to have given a princess in Ireland a Blarney Stone. This is Catholic and witchcraft teachings together. I'm sure it was a demon, okay? Uh, the 
princess was supposed to be the daughter of Bridget, which was the mother goddess in Ireland, which the Catholics made a saint. The Catholics, everywhere they went, they always turned the old gods into saints, so they keep the pagan following following them. Okay, a couple more real quick. Yes, I can't hear you on the last one. I can't hear you on the last one. I don't know a thing about it. I can't answer it. <laughs> I've never heard of it before. Yeah. Yes, I am. I haven't seen it, but I'm... People believe there's two different worlds out there checking this world out because we've had violent contacts and we've had non-violent contacts. Well, you see, the teachings from the Necromonicon, which, by the way, I read scriptures in the Mormon Bible that are directly out of the Necromonicon. I have to turn this over to him real quick. All right. And the Necromonicon, it teaches, it starts, the first scripture in it is out of Genesis, and that's the witch's Bible, uh, the Necromonicon. It says that the sons of God came down and knew the daughters of Adam and they were giants in the land, all right? They teach that we were, when the human race first started, great wise ones from another world came here and started a race and intermated, and that's where the witches came from. Well, the Mormons, of course, teach that Adam came down with a wife and started everything. Where did he come from? So it's all still basing on this thing, and now they're believing they're coming back and checking up on us, and soon we'll have a government of world peace because they'll help do it all. Pastor. Thank you, Johnny. And remember again, Johnny Todd will be back uh, at 11.15. Our church service will be over at promptly 11.05 this morning, so we will give him full time. And uh, <clears throat> the floor will be open for questions and for answers during that session. So we invite you to stay through the preaching service. Uh, just before we uh, dismiss you, we'll give you a break of about five minutes. I'd like to make uh, known these books. This is the book called The Broken Cross. How much is that? Thirty-nine for a dollar. Thirty-nine cents, three for a dollar. This is the story of uh, Manitou Springs, Colorado, about witchcraft in that town. A true story. Information provided by Johnny Todd. You'll want to get that and read it. And then secondly, there's another one just like this called The Gift. A very excellent booklet. You ought to have both of them. <coughs> then we have some books on on uh, masonry. The last time Johnny Todd was here, he mentioned the fact that the oath, uh, which is taken by the first degree mason, called the Entered Apprentice Mason, is exactly the same except for, I think, one phrase uh, with the oath taken by a person being initiated into witchcraft. And that oath, along with the oath of the second degree mason and the first and third degree mason, is also in this particular book, along with the uh, ritual and the initiation of the first three degrees of mason. For, uh, the same. All right, this little book by Morgan, who was killed, by the way, for writing this book. The moment this book hit the press, he was kidnapped by Masons and and uh, drowned in the East. Another book, this is a classic. Uh, this book, by the way, is only $1.50. Uh, this book is, is perhaps a classic. It was taken to the Supreme Court by Masonry, and they tried to pre prevent this book from being published. It's entitled Free Masonry and Interpretation by M. L. Wagner. This book is only $4. Uh, it's been reproduced by Dr. Crane's Clandestine Press. I paid ten dollars for my copy. It's exactly the same book. Actually, it's a better, better edition. And this book you ought to have. There are just a few of these on sale in the back. Another excellent book by one of America's great evangelists of 150 years ago, Charles E. Finney, is entitled Freemasonry. He was what was called a bright mason. He was a Masonic attorney. He was saved by the grace of God by Christ out of masonry and wrote this book exposing it. It's only two dollars. Freemasonry by Charles Finney. Another book by a man who was first a Roman Catholic, then a bright mason by the name of. Uh, uh, Ronani, uh, entitled Maha Bone. <clears throat> any, any Masons here in the third degree will recognize that word Maha Bone. It's a secret word that uh, cannot be given above uh, a whisper and then in the five points of fellowship. This is a very amazing book by a man who was a bright and uh, uh, very informed Mason who later was saved by Christ out of Masonry and then he wrote this book exposing both Masonry and Romanism. Maha Bone is three dollars. Another book that gives a political overview <clears throat> of the involvement in the secret societies in world uh, conspiracy, building toward a world empire or world dictatorship, is this called The Christian and the Other Religion? It's only one dollar, a very interesting booklet. And then there are a few books back there, such as The Naked Capitalist by Scout, uh, Skousen, or Skousen, Skousen, I think it is. Uh, <clears throat> a book, just a couple of those, they're two dollars each, worth having. A book entitled Textbooks on Trial by uh, Norma Gabler, who spoke here back in the early fall. Uh, she revealed what's taking place in the textbooks in the schools. Television was brought out. The schools were mentioned. Uh, people wonder why is the world moving toward world dictatorship? Why are freedoms being taken away? Uh, what's happening to our young people? Textbooks and trials will tell you a lot about that. That book is a hardback, a book that is $5. But those books are all... Please. In the all right. Before we take questions and answers, and the pastor will be up here monitoring until so they get on the tape so everybody will know what the question is. I've had so many complaints. Nobody knows what what everybody's asking. So we'll do that in a minute. Please bear with me for a minute. You might want some pencil and paper for what's coming up. 
Uh, you can decide as you go. How many of you have read this? All right. As I repeat, nothing produced by Chick Publication is a book. It is a track. It is meant for souls. All right? Now, I'm trying to set up something where every student at this school will get one. Uh, how many are in junior high or high school in this school? All right. I want to see if you know what's going on. I talked with the principal. I talked with the pastor. I know what's going on in your school. I want to find out if there'll be a teenager honest enough to stand up and say they know it. How many know about the spiritualism group, the Ouija board group that is going on after school hours? How many teenagers have kind of been invited over to this thing or have gotten the word on it around the school that know what's going on? Any of you, have any of you been approached in the school about this? No? All right. If you are, please go to the principal. Please go to the pastor. Or there are teenagers who are fooling with this in the school and are trying to spread this. And we're going to, or the pastor and the principal are going to take care of it. I told them who I've spotted and know that's fooling around with this. So I, I want to bring that up real quick before we go on. The next thing is on this book. In three months, this book has already been rewritten once. I'm sorry we don't have the reruns. We've corrected a lot of it to where it reads just witchcraft now, and the Satanism part is not in it, which makes it a better track for our purposes. But in the back, this whole back sheet will be redone in three months. I only have three months. It'll, about the end of April, I guess, or maybe four months. This whole back sheet will be redone. The salvation message here will be put up at the top, and this whole space here will be on the bottom, will be a list of phone numbers and halfway houses and churches throughout the United States that people who have death sentences on their heads that one out of the Illuminati and out of the occult can contact. That's why I'm going east. For five years, we have prayed and we have sought to get in the state in New England and Florida and so on where Grand Druids live, where the leaders live. And we have always been barred mainly by interference through the charismatic churches. Well, now God has opened the door to the independent Baptists that nobody can close. We didn't try to go through the charismatic churches, but the charismatic churches there opposed it in such a, a way that the other churches were afraid to do anything. Now this door is open and we're going to be setting houses up while we're there. I need, this is the Southern California contact point right here. We need counselors who are willing, and we prefer husband and wife, who are willing, and we need where they have an extra bedroom or can make room in their house that can take a girl or a boy in one at a time if this church is reached by phone for help and can watch over these people from two to three days. This is 24 hours a day. We need certain guns. So the guns we need are pump shotgun, 12-gauge pump shotgun, or automatic shotgun. Nothing else. Don't Nothing else. If you, if you feel like you'd like to give us something and it's not on the list, save it. We've got to have these precise ones because this is what they use against us. And as a weapons expert from the Army, I know what will be best. The next thing we need are 357 Magnum revolvers. That's the main weapon. Not 38. 38 will bounce off of windows. They've been known to. 357. 45 automatic are the best. That's what I personally carry. The next thing we need... If you don't have them, Tom Collins knows where you can get them for half price, and, and we need them. Our Colt AR-15, that's the civilian name for the M16 rifle. That's what they hit us with most of the time. Or the Mini-14. It's all right, it's not great. We need these weapons very badly. And if you have never been in a firefight, I have stood on a farm in Ohio that was a retreat, and for four solid hours, we never did find out why the police didn't come out, there were over 6,000 rounds expired from both sides trying to kill people. That was one firefight. This is no game and this is no joke. I spent Monday in the hospital because I wasn't careful at a job that I was having and somehow, somebody, I got the blood test to prove it, slipped poison in the pop that I was drinking and I was in critical condition. And I still got the scar from the IV. I went into convulsions and seizures. And uh, a lot of people prayed, and Monday morning, I walked out of that hospital. I looked sick for a few days, but I walked out of that hospital, because I got careless. It was a new way they had tried, and I wasn't ready for it. From now on, we're going to watch all ways. So please, this is an unusual request, but if you have them, we need them, okay? And the other thing we need 
We need material so that clothes can be made. We need a uh, concrete block. We need cement. We need hundreds of two-by-fours, okay? We need bob wire fencing. We need fence posts. We need electrical wire. You can imagine anything in construction. We need lots of sheetrock. So anything that you can, you feel that you write, if you're in a construction field, you have nails. You can imagine how many nails we need. And we need this stuff, okay? We need farm tools like shovels, picks, and so on. We need everything under the sun. It is a retreat that is a ranch. We need farm animals. If you've got a horse and the Lord might lead you to donate the horse, we need horses more than we need anything else, okay? And that's pretty well it. You can just pray about it and see how the Lord will lead you. If you feel like you don't need any money, bring it to the pasture, okay? The land is there. All we got to do is get the things built. And I know people around here like Sean and others will be glad on weekends to come up and hang sheetrock with the rest of us. <laughs> I won't be here, I'm sorry to say, so I'm trusting others. Johnny, I think we'll take one more thing very quickly for our Sunday School Records. But all those people who are not here during first session, please uh, raise your hands. Or if you are not counted in the first, in your second session class already, if you are not in first session or not counted in your second session class, please raise your hand. If you're a visitor who is here and you're not in the first session, your first session, raise your hand. If you're not counted in your second session, session and Mike, you get those right on those sides. Keep your hands up, Johnny, go ahead and talk. <laughs> Well, I was going to ask questions, but I don't think I can ask questions with everybody's hands in the air. So I'll, I'll add very quickly here. We have tried retreats several times. They've always failed because we allowed the supporting churches to have a voice in the retreat itself. Now, I love this church and I'm a member of it, or I wouldn't, I've never joined the church in the five years I've been saved. And that's what I think of this church. I think of this pastor. But the retreat, the workers, if you think that you would like to be a worker at the retreat, <clears throat> just remember, <laughs> it's going to be on the hip the whole time you're there. Tom Collins, I told him and his wife, um, they were out looking at the land with us. And uh, this cold already knows who gave us the land. Tom gave us the land. And uh, I told him and his wife, I said, you know, when you come out here, this is your land. But the moment you come through the gate, you put it on your hip. And so pray for us. Pray while we're eat. We're claiming souls upon souls. I'm going to be talking with the people who train me in witchcraft. I'm going to be going in to the top people that sit on the council, the 13 people that sit on the council. I will be in space for eight of them live, and I expect them to attend the meeting. Okay? Pray for us. We're going to believe miracles are going to be done. Baltimore is the closest I'm going to get to Jimmy Carter, but... Uh, <laughs> And uh, for those that haven't heard, Jimmy's great evangelistic center, sister won Larry Flint to the Lord. But she told Larry that he could keep on publishing Hustler. He just had to add nude men pictures along with the women to balance it out. That was the Christian principle. I wonder what Lord she's serving. Any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Tell, uh, he's going to repeat it for the tape. The question is, <clears throat> what about Charles Manson? Was he demon-possessed? Also about the book and everything. All right. Manson belonged to, a, I had to belong to many brotherhoods, okay? Manson, the brotherhood that he belonged to is called the process. It's the only brotherhood I worry about. They are so radical that in order to kill me, they would gladly give their own life up right in a meeting. They were run out of England for human sacrifice. They have the inner and the outer process. The outer process is a good group. They have free coffee houses, free clothing, free priests to live, and so on. The inner practice human sacrifice. They teach four God systems. Yahweh as the evil God, Lucifer as the good God, Jesus as one being punished because he spoke against Satan, and Satan as the earthly God. And uh, they wear a cross, big silver cross, with a serpent engraved on the cross showing that Satan and Christ are one through the cross. They were rolled up. They were a contract. He was paid to do it. Kate was breaking away. Her husband knew about it. Her husband went over to establish an alibi in Europe. The money came down. $50,000 came down from Toronto through New Orleans, and poor Manson only got 2000 of it by the time it went through all the sticky fingers. But that's what the Tate killing 
were about. The others just happened to be there. She wanted out, and you don't get out unless you come through Christ. And she didn't think about trying out. And her mistake was she warned him in advance. She was arguing with her other. She was having a baby, and she didn't want the baby raised up in it, and she wanted out. And if you remember the trial script from the book, that's the one thing she begged. She says, not, you know, she kept repeating over and over, don't kill me, don't kill my baby. Her baby was what she cared about. And that's the information that I have on it. I belong to the New Orleans branch, and he was called a field disciple or an evangelist from the New Orleans branch. The process. They were the people who first tried to kill me. The first incident that ever happened happened from them. They're very, very radical. They're located, and they've got a few scattered uh, undercover groups in L.A., but they've got an open chapter in Frisco. Any other questions? Yeah. Are, are epileptics demon-possessed? I'm glad you asked that. When I was saved, and I've got the veteran records to prove it, I was an epileptic or wounded numb. I took an EEG this time last year. The brain scan shows I'm still an epileptic. The first thing that the people called out of me, and they did not know I was an epileptic, I was taking the dilant and the phenobarb in secret, they called a demon of epilepsy out of me. I have never had a seizure, an epileptic seizure, since then, except when the VA got a court order about a year and a half ago because they were concerned for me and made me take the medicine and I went into seizure and they gave it up. I've never had a seizure and nobody that I've ever called a demon of epilepsy out of has ever had a seizure since as long as they stayed off the medicine. They're not possessed. And I want to add this real quick. Because of the King James Bible, many places in the New Testament, all demonic activity is called possession. If you'll get yourself a Greek lexicon You'll, and I think Pastor can verify with me, only two cases in the New Testament use the word that applies to possession. The 16th chapter of Acts and Legion. The others apply to activity, demonic activity in their life. All right? Now, give you an incident. We prayed for a girl when I was here last time. Who was the people? You were upstairs with me, weren't you? Who was the other woman upstairs with us? Is she here? She can testify. The girl could not pray the prayer of salvation so we called certain demons out of her. When we were done praying the prayer of salvation, then we called more out of her. But certain ones had to go before she could even pray, but they had not all gone. If that's a little contrary to you, it's because when you give your heart to the Lord, you give your heart to the Lord. The flesh can still be occupied if you gave them permission to come in your life through different things. Epilepsy, there's no argument about it. That's how Jesus delivered it. And all the dialect and the phenobarb in the world will just feed the demon. I've seen hundreds. I feel for epilepsy because I went through years of epilepsy. And I know the feeling, the embarrassment of the seizure and everything. And I've never had, my brain waves shows I'm still an epileptic. I guess if somebody had cancer and had... The Lord had did a miraculous thing, and they still saw the cancer under the scope, but they weren't dying. I don't know. But I have the brainwave test and the brain scan. Both show I'm still an epileptic, but I don't have a seizure, and I don't take the medicine. I really feel that the injury that was done to me was physical, but the demon causes the convulsion. Okay? That's my own experience as an epileptic. Yeah. I can only give you the names of the, the question. Of the, uh, who are the names of the other people on the Council 13? Okay. I can only give you the ones that were on it, plus the girl who replaced me. There has been much assassination. There is a war going on in the occult right now between the traditionalists and the modernists. It's funny, we just argue between traditionalists and modernists there. But the traditionalists and the modernists there, this is why I keep getting invitations to come back and join, because I was one of the traditionalist leaders, and they thought that I got out because the traditionalists was losing or something. They didn't start losing until I left. But this is why they want Torkin's son in. He is the leader of the tradition. But the, the leader of the Grand Council, as it stands a, a, about a week ago, is Gavin Frost. He's the leader of the modern, the evangelical of the group, the ones who say everybody can be a witch. Uh, on it, the girl who took my place is Yvonne Collin, or Legina is her name. Now, many names I'll give you are witch names, okay, because I don't know their real names. That's the law in which if they don't choose to tell you, you can't ask. And even the council don't know the other council members' correct names from it. Jesse Bell, who lives in Florida, is a name Lady Sheba. Sybil Leak, Dr. Raymond Buckland, who used to lead it. Lorca is 
uh, still on the council. Uh, Louise Hubner from Los Angeles is on the council. Uh, Zorla from Chicago is on the council. I think the others that were on it at the time are off. Uh, Mrs. Morgan from New York uh, and uh, Lavina from France are still on the council. The others, I think, have either been killed or resigned or what, and others have been placed in their place. Yeah. The traditionalists believe... Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I keep forgetting. Can you clarify the distinction between the traditional and the modernist? The traditionalist witch believes you must be a hereditary witch, okay? That means you must be born into a family just before, a hereditary line. The modernists want everybody, particularly the Christians, most of all, to be witches, okay? Question, can you tell us about UFOs? Now, and my sister's connection, they, there's a story go, uh, that, that Jack Chick had told each person three years ago that I had told him. My sister, before my wife came around, used to be leader of the state of Ohio, the high priestess there, of the whole state. And her little pastime was calling up, supposedly filling the sky with UFOs and watching everybody's excitement. And some of the most outstanding sightings were in the early 70s in Ohio. And she used to laugh about it because she'd be standing in a circle out in the field somewhere calling up demons. And that's all they were, were angels of light playing games in the sky. Remember, a demon, get the little spooky picture. There are a fallen angel, an unclean spirit. They can assume any form or go into anything except a Christian who walks in the spirit all the time. Know any? You know, or in other words, a Christian who keeps it under the blood and so on. But they can, they can assume forms, including spacemen or solid objects like flying saucers or so on. That's why when they appear on the radar scope and a jet gets up there, they vanish right in front of the pilot's eyes because they're nothing but a spirit. Tom Rose, and you're saying the words possession, obsession, and affliction, and then how it relates to the Christian. Well, let's, let's trade the words around a little. Possession, obsession, no, possession, oppression, obsession, and depression, okay? Let's use those instead of the affliction, okay? Possession means absolutely total ownership. You've seen one of the few, I've seen four or five cases in my whole life of possession, and the young lady that we prayed for at the end of the service was one of those that was possessed. I, that's how many in five years, and I have set in or been part of close to a thousand deliverances. You don't see very many cases of possession. Possession means that person doesn't breathe, eat, talk, say anything that the devil does not allow them to do that's inside of them. Maybe you've seen them if you tried to get somebody to pray and they've actually wanted to pray the prayer of salvation, but they can't get it out. That's possession. Son of Sam, possession. Uh, John Todd, five years ago, possession. Um, Charles Manson, possession. Let me explain. You notice Legion was possessed. The girl in the 16th chapter was possessed. You notice what they did? They wanted help. You know what they did? They went and they challenged God. The most they could do was fall down before him and get the minister's attention. I'd been in meetings where they couldn't ask for deliverance because the, the spirit wouldn't let them. But they could create a commotion by resisting the devil. What they would do is they'd start thinking they wanted free, and the devil would start manifesting, and that would draw the attention of the minister to them. But most of possessed people are possessed, not so much because the demons are possessing them, but they're possessing the demons. I mean, most of the cases I meet that demonic activity do not want to give up the spirit. Remember how much you fought to give up particular spirits in your life. You just did not want to give. You did not want to turn them loose because you liked them. That may seem unusual to you, but it goes on. Think of the man who likes chasing women. He doesn't want to give up the demon of lust because he doesn't want to give up chasing the women. Okay? Now, oppression, possession is impossible for a Christian. Don't let anybody ever tell you that a Christian is possessed. That's an absolute lie of the devil. The next step is oppression. That is where the Christian can come. Oppression, uh, possession resides in the spirit or the heart of man. Oppression resides in the soul or the mind of man. Obsession resides in the flesh or the body of man. Okay? That would be the best way. Depression is outside. It's tormenting spirits from the outside. 
And less, it's a demon of depression, and then it's inside. But usually depression can be just you not depending enough upon the Lord, so you're allowing the devil to depress you. I'm very funny. I don't allow any in between. I'm not a fence straddler. It's either God or it's the devil. There isn't any in between. And that's the Lord's own words. You're either with him or you're against him. Okay? That's the definitions of them. Would you give some examples of how witchcraft and occultism are used in advertising? Uh-huh. Yeah. The Inquirer. <laughs> uh, I get Pentecostals and Charismatics upset because I call Catherine Kuhlman a witch. They want proof. The Inquirer, anybody who an article is done on faith healing or supernatural power in the Inquirer must appear in person before the Council of the Grand Druid. How many know about Kuhlman's article several years ago in the Inquirer? You don't get in there without top approval from the board, all right? That settles it right there. As far as I'm concerned, I don't know how about how you feel. Next, uh, you've got symbols, okay? Without going into a long sermon on symbols, witches and masons identify their ownership of things to the others by their symbols. How many go in? <laughs> witches must do each eight things to perfect themselves. It's 6,000 years old. Two of them, one is drugs, one is alcohol, and one is immoral sex. That's three right there. All right? Without even going on any further. That's one symbol. The symbols all over the thing. The holy year to the Illuminati is the birth date, May 1st, 1976. 76. Anybody recognize that on a sign somewhere? Another beautiful one is Montgomery Ward and Mobile are one company. Mobile belongs to a company that owns Standard Oil, Exxon, and all of them. It's one of the, it's probably 40% of the money that comes to the Illuminati comes to that system of company. So, naturally, those are going to be built up and protected more than others. And what can I tell you? I met a, a PR man recently who told me he is the public relations man for the new Star Wars sequel. He's a homosexual. He told me there's not one star that's a major star in the new movie that has not gone to bed with homosexuals in order to get the part. He also said the majority of them are being kicked from the top occult soap opera in the country. Does anybody have an idea of what that soap opera is, young and restless? Reason, Brad, for those that watch it, is a Christian who counsels through astrology. And one of the new stars is Snapper, the doctor on the show, that will be in Star Wars. And the guy told me that instead of 45% of the Star Wars thing being on the Force, 99% will be about the Force. And for the guys who like country and western music and think they're safe because uh, it's not rock, Tom T. Hall has just brought out the best-selling song in a long time. It's called The Force, about good witchcraft battling bad witchcraft. I think it's good enough. Uh, Bob Melton, question is about acupuncture. Yeah, acupuncture is part of a monk system that also developed Kung Fu and other things out of China. Okay, I'll classify it along with Laetrile. There is absolutely no scientific evidence that Laetrile heals, but it heals. When the people, a new study came out that had been healed by cancer, or cancer through Laetrile, were tested for psychic powers. They all rated in the 75% range, which is excellent. In other words, their faith in the drug, and since God's not using the drug to heal them, their faith in this healing power is healing them. Now, who's healing them? Right, the devil. If you didn't know the devil could heal, I'm sorry, he can't. He'll just end up giving you something worse along the line. But that is what's healing, and it's sweeping through the chiropractic system, especially. A lot of them are using Laetrile. And there's no medical thing to heal you. It's pure psychic energy. And if you were here this morning, you know what psychic energy is. Is there a connection between chiropractor and the cult? Not that I know of, except that the Mormons are now really infiltrating the chiropractic system with the herb healing. Hey, is there any occult involvement in the hill trade? <laughs> Within five square mile area of where I live is where they're dumping all the bodies. Louise Huebner lives in the same area. I don't know. I can't get any information. I can't get any information at all, so I don't know. You know, they're holding things back. I doubt it, but I will tell you what is involved. The same spirit that was in the Son of Sam, okay? 
The same spirit that was in the trash bag killer who said he killed 34 young boys after raping them so he could become the top mass murderer in the world and break the record in Houston. These are demons that are going to come in in the next year. You think this is something. Where do you pick up the newspaper every day and this new killer is struck? You're going to have killers all over the place that are trying to break each other's records. Because you've got demons all over the top place trying to break each other's records. Okay? That's the best I can answer you. I don't know if it's a cult. It may be. But since there's no report of blood loss, I doubt it. Tony? Reflexology and acupuncture? I have no idea. Jim? You mean the fake energy crisis? I'll, I'll repeat that. Excuse me, I'll repeat that. He said last time I was here, I mentioned the, the uh, schedule that the Council of Rothschild had for domination of the world that would be fulfilled within 11 years of 1972. And uh, he asked me if the fake, can I add that word? Fake energy crisis had anything to do with it. What do you think started it? That's what's going to cause World War III. You've got to get out of the system of thinking this guy over here is a bad guy and this guy over here is a good guy. You can't do that. It's not a football game. You can't pick the Rams over the Vikings. You can't pick America over Russia. You can't pick the Dodd over Megan. You can't do it. You've got to look to the guy who's pulling the string. His name is Rothschild. Okay? Remember now, the Dodd's being called the man of peace right now. But who wrote him letters asking him to go to Israel? Jimmy Carter. Who set the whole thing up? Jimmy Carter. Don't lose sight of it. He's been losing popularity. He's never had any popularity with me. They say he's losing popularity with the conservative Christian. That's because the ones who voted for him just because he was a Christian have now learned he's not a Christian. I heard a speech. How many heard his press conference in Hungary? You really should buy a short wave set. I mean it. I really recommend it in my meetings. Um, a Baptist over in Hungary got up that wrote for the Baptist press over there. I don't know what type of Baptist he was. But he got up and he praised Carter for being a Christian and uplifting the Christian standards in America. I don't know what paper he's reading. And would he please get the Catholics off their back in Hungary? He told them, sorry, government and religion don't mix. Why don't he practice it here? No. Uh, he's going to lose popularity. He's going to gain it. But if Carter is the type of man that if he thought that he was going to lose the election, he would take this country by force. And if you don't think a president of the United States can do it, you better do some research. He can overnight by picking up the telephone. He can place us in martial law to suspend everything. He'll do it because uh, it's going to be the time. But, oh, okay. All right. I agree with you. Get on our hands and knees right now and start praying. Yeah. I heard the same thing. They need some prayer. You know, I, some, some re I hate the way Christians pray today. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep type prayer, you know. Uh, five seconds and you've done your duty for the day. I don't know wh what it is. Uh, I guess it's my habit in the occult. I had to spend hours meditating and reading every day. So why can't I do it for the Lord? You know, I mean, the Christian church is wondering why the witches are walking all over them. Because the witch's prayer life is stronger than the Christian's prayer life. Way back here in the back. Yeah. Well, uh, I try to leave it alone because the man who... See, I'm kind of at fault at this. The man who led him to the Lord was bribed out. He denies all this now. Uh, one of the checks plus... A huge parcel of about 150 acres of land in Delaware, Ohio, I arranged as a bride for him when I was in control. So I kind of leave it alone. I mentioned it because I didn't want people to get any hope of the Kennedy assassination being solved in Congress, you know. But um, anyway, the, uh, he, he was led to the Lord in Ybor City, which is a Cuban refugee city within Tampa, by the help of the mayor who had just been converted to Christianity and this minister who is now probably one of the biggest witches within Christianity, bought and paid for, named Leroy Jenkins. But back at this time, he wasn't. Yes. Wait a minute, wait, wait for the boat, John. Okay, speak louder. I got the thing about sailing and I picked up. <laughs> <laughs> He's smiling. <laughs> okay, I'll repeat all this. He'd like me to talk about Salem and the Inquisition. 
and also about the Masons and their contact with the occult. I would love to. I think we'll finish. That, that'll take the rest of the evening. Uh, for one, okay, how many have read history or were taught history on the Salem Witch Pass in school? Sorry, I'm going to disappoint you. No witches were killed. Christians were. The witches did the execution. And if you want to spend a few thousand dollars in about a month like my wife and I did, go to the Essex Museum in Salem, and if you can, trick your way into the library like we did, but you're not supposed to be able to, and look at the original manuscripts, you'll find out that the Collinses and the Putlands and others that were there were involved in the witchcraft, and the main charge, which never comes out in any of our history books, was that the people that were executed were all from another town, were holding Bible studies in their homes, teaching born-again experience, and also discussing the book of Revelations, which was outlawed. But that didn't come out in our history books. But that was some of the main charges. The next thing that went on, the Inquisition, was none of the big witches were ever killed. Most of the people that were killed weren't witches. But the witches sure use it against us, just like Salem. Now, they know that in Salem no witches were killed, but they use it against Christians. They also know in the Inquisition that most of the witches did the executions there, but they use it against us. The bad point is that, and I, I want to give this to you in case it's ever thrown at you, they use John Wesley against us. Because before his salvation, he was a paid-for witch hunter in England who was responsible for thousands of people's deaths in England. But that was before his salvation, and they neglect to bring that up since they don't believe in salvation. Now, the good one, the Masons. <laughs> for four years now, I've been talking to Jack Schick that the Masons were initiated just like witchcraft people. And just... Yeah, I guess it never really sunk through to his head that it was, so I got the blackboard out the other day, and I drew him and told him, word for word, step for step, the initiation into witchcraft of the first level, when you join the Coven for the first time. Okay? He's going, well, oh, that's what the Masons do. I said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. The vow of secrecy, I had Masons deny that there was a knife pointed at them when they were led by the summoner to the challenger at the circle to be initiated. But the knife is there, just as it is in witchcraft. They are blindfolded, they are bound, just like in witchcraft. They are led by the summoner to the challenger to a circle with a star, five points in it. With the altar, they're led through the gate at the same point and exits the circle at the other point, and it's called, and they're being reborn. The only three points that are different is, we receive a new name to sprinkle baptism, a completely new name when we're initiated in the witchcraft, we drop our robe so that we're new when we walk in the circle and we'll re robe because we're born again in the circle. That's been changed now because of the modernists and they stay robed the whole time, just like the Masons. The other is our wrist is cut, but they're doing away with that in witchcraft now. So the only difference between it now and the Masons is a sprinkle of baptism and given a new name. The initiation, word for word, from the time you walk up to the circle to the time you leave it. Action for action is the same as that that I took, my wife took, or anybody else took when he first joined witchcraft. It's what a mason does when he joins. Now you tell me that the masons are Christian. The masons were formed as a Calvinistic organization going undercover to protect themselves from persecution of witchcraft when witches were being persecuted. And that's how they were formed, and that's their right. Alistair Crowley, which some of you may know about, some of you may not, left the Golden Dawn, which is the private coven of the Rothschilds, and formed his own group. He, got, he didn't drop all the Illuminati, but he almost got himself killed because he published two books called The Order of the Golden Dawn. They didn't mind any of it, except he drew the temples of the Rothschilds' personal coven. He drew all the banners on the wall where the altar was set up, but the people were caught everything. And it just so happened there was a book out on Mormonism at the same time that had Masonism that had the very same picture in of a Mason temple. That's my statement on Masonry. Yes. Almost all of you are finance, silver mine control, alpha mine control, a lot of the different leagues, the literary groups that are involved in it. Besides, meditation will lead you, if you go on into particularly yoga, to transcendental meditation or projection and other things. The problem with the meditation groups is they give you half truths in the beginning, just like in witchcraft, and then as you go deeper and deeper, all of a sudden there's things they did they told you they didn't do in the beginning that they're now teaching you if you stay with it far enough. And I personally believe that one of the best ways to fill yourself up with demons is to go into meditation groups. Okay, we're we're running late. I'm not sure. All right, we'll have Johnny Todd back again, the Lord willing. In about three months we want you to pray for him on his Eastern tour. At this time, we're going to have the ushers come forward and receive a special love offering for Brother Johnny Todd. 
I know that <clears throat> Johnny Todd at this time is... But this is a difference from when I was here a month or so ago. I'm surprised, I guess, I really should pray that the Lord night and day that somebody invented the cassette recorder. We get letters every week, 10, 20, 30 letters of people that have heard our tapes and our ministry has done something for their lives in places we've never been and people will never see. So uh, I was a little shocked tonight when so many people had heard my testimony that had never met me. But then there was a lot of people that Paul's left. Uh, he's been gone a long time. If you will, take these out. You want to take some notes probably on them. There is one on the back of it. I think all the, are the colors the same everywhere with the sheets? I can go over color. On the yellow sheet on the back, front, whatever, you got it too. Um, tomorrow we're going to be, this is the sheet we'll be using tomorrow. We'll be using all the rest of them tonight. And uh, I want to correct something. It's not the pastor's fault. The people who prepared it originally, that's Ephesians 6.12, not 6.14. But we'll be, this is what we'll be teaching on tomorrow night, hoping that um, we'll have a large bring-in of materials that we'll be talking about tonight to destroy. But I'll start with the yellow sheet, and I want you to write a scripture text across it. Revelation 18.23. At the bottom of the scripture it says, For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, and for by thy sorcerers were all nations deceived, talking of Babylon. There's no better scripture I know of in the Word of God to describe the Illuminati, which is what we'll be talking about tonight. And we're going to start. I want you to get out. You can lay them across your lap. Find the three pyramids. I think it'll be impossible to lay them side by side because on a purple sheet there's two of them. But we'll do the best we can with what we have. And take out the sphinx. Now, most people do not understand the Illuminati. How many people here have ever done any study on the Illuminati before they heard of me? Okay. How many have done some since they've heard my tapes? A couple, okay. Boy, are the rest of you in for a surprise tonight. I don't want people to listen to me and walk out of here and just accept the things I have. I kind of like it when people go out of here and say, boy, he's nuts. Because they'll go and they'll try and research to prove that I'm wrong. And the more they research, the more they start believing me. It is impossible to research history and to research the conspiracy and to research the Illuminati without coming away a solid believer. As a, the brother who prepared these, Brother Tom Berry said, he went to, through almost 2,000 books for 20 sheets of notebook paper filled with notes. That's how well it was hidden. How many people have a set of encyclopedias at home, a good set? Go home tonight, look up the word Illuminati. In some of the encyclopedias you will find that it existed but does not exist now, and in other encyclopedias you will find that it existed and still exists now, but they don't tell you anything about it. Before we go into it, I want to give you a reading list, okay? Now, I want to explain a book before I give its title, and I want you to choose carefully as to whether you want it or not. I don't want you later getting mad at me because I recommended it. It is not a Christian book. It is not a political book. It is an Illuminatus book. The book was ordered, written, and produced by Philip Rothschild, the leader of the Illuminati in this day and age. It was ordered, written by a woman named Ann Rad, and she was at that time one of Philip Rothschild's mistresses. It was written some 12 years ago. She was already a well-known author, and her books sell nationwide. Most of the people who read them are communists. And she wrote this book. It was supposed to be a novel. It's 1,100 pages, so if you don't like to read, don't buy it. And it was written as a novel, supposedly, but it is a code book. And within the book is a step-by-step -step plan to take over the whole world by taking over the United States. Now, I'm going to say many things tonight that a lot of people will try and go out of here and say that I'm anti-American. No, I'm extremely pro-American. I couldn't be that until I became a Christian. But I'm extremely pro-American. I am just anti-government that exists within America today because it is not the government of the people any longer, and I'm pro-people government. That's a term misused by communists a lot. I'm sorry if you're upset that I use, but that's exactly what it says in the Constitution. Oh, this is what I've been waiting on. I'm glad he brings it. I know what's in it. Wouldn't be the first time. Now, the power of the Illuminati, and I'll give an explanation. The Illuminati is as following. 
Okay, first, most people found the Illuminati in things that have crossed their path. People found it in the occult, and mistakenly they have said, aha, the Illuminati is the occult. Then they have found it in the Masons, and they said, aha, the Illuminati is the Masons. Then they have found it in politics, and they said, oh, it's politics. So they found it in the international banking system, or they found it in Zionism. So they list it as just being that. Actually, it is all these things, and much more. They have found it in the Mormon religion. That's because the leaders of the Mormon religion are high echelons in the Illuminati. They have found it in the John Birch Society. That's because the man who leads the John Birch Society is both a high degree Mason and a Mormon. But it is all these things, and its par is finance. If you would take its finance away, which is impossible. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you the name of the book, and I just realized that. I started out. I'm getting ahead of myself. The book is called Atlas Shrug. Oh, Atlas, you know, Atlas supposed to hold up the world? Shrug, like you shrug your shoulders. Atlas Shrug. Now, this is the warning that goes with it. I'll be talking about occult books tonight and how demons are in occult books and in their music and so on. This isn't so with this book. They didn't place a spell on this book because they did not want people to buy this book other than those told to buy it within the occult and within the Illuminati. They are extremely mad because just this year alone they sold several million of them, mostly to Christians, and they don't like that. In fact, they've tried to stop printing it, but people don't want to stop printing it. They're making so much money. The bad thing about it, though, is that since it is written as a novel, it has some passages that uh, I think might belong in Hustler or other places. Maybe out of 1,100 pages, you might count five that are this way. You can tear them out and throw them away. They're just stuck in there to hope. They're stuck in there on purpose to keep Christians from reading the book. So if you should get to a passage that uh, is a little something you shouldn't read, just turn to the next page, it'll be over by then, and you can go on with the story. Now, if you don't like to read, skip the first 200 pages. The first 200 pages is exactly the way most people in the world are. They're very boring. No, actually, they're the conspiracy from people in all the walks of life talking about this incident happening and that incident happening. And, and um, you know, it's very boring to the fact that unless you know that it's the conspiracy that's planning the incident. It's like reading the newspaper today. You don't really know what's happening behind it. But after about the first 200 pages, eight chapters, nine chapters, something like that, it starts showing you that everything that is happening is conspired to happen. And uh, I'm going to give all these things, and I want to say something before I get the rest of the reading list. The common name for the Illuminati is the conspiracy, or the great conspiracy. Now, until we lost the school system to people within the Communist Party and within the organization of the Illuminati and so on, you were taught in your history classes, and some people can remember this if they want to confess up to being that old, that history was taught that it happened because somebody conspired for it to happen. Then we didn't want in this nation anybody to get ideas that maybe our government was a conspiracy. <clears throat> so they uh, decided to start teaching that it just happened because it happened. You know, World War II happened just because some people got mad. World War I happened because some people got mad. The Depression happened because uh, we bought too much too soon without enough money. They did not want anybody to get the idea that it all happened because somebody conspired for it to happen. But I hope to accomplish one thing tonight more than anything, that I will change your attitude, that I'll set new forms or patterns or whatever in your life, that you will walk out of here and when something happens, you'll go, now I wonder what they're really up to. Really? Okay. And we'll be talking about a few things tonight. I want to start with the yellow sheet. Now there's something missing on the yellow sheet. I want you to draw a block. No, don't draw a block, I'm sorry. Under the First National Bank, write Federal Reserve Act, or the Federal Reserve Commission, FRC, FRA, whichever way you want to write it. You can abbreviate it or whatever you want to do. All right. Now, if you'll look at the pyramid, let's start with the one that says organization. Now, there's no way to preach a sermon when you're given a teaching like this. I'm going to play school teacher tonight. If some of you find it boring, you happened in the wrong meeting because you might as well think that you're back in high school or going to college or whatever because that's about what it's going to be like tonight. I'm going to give a lot of facts. I'm going to try and leave enough time that we can have some questions because there's no way I can say all I'm going to say tonight without leaving some people in confusion. Pastor disappeared. There he is. Did you turn that air conditioner on? It's hot. I didn't know. I don't feel nothing. <laughs> Can't put this many people in a building like this without starting something. Okay. Start with the one that says organization. And if you'll notice on all the pyramids, 
The first three blocks are exactly the same. Now, if you've heard my testimony, you know that I came from the Council of 13. Now, I want to stop, take about three minutes to explain the doctrine of the high part of the occult. The, first, the last four levels of the occult, or the last three levels of the occult, the fourth, fifth, and sixth level, and most of the modern cults today, particularly Mormonism, believe the same thing. How many people ever saw a movie called The Dunwich Whore? Nobody ever saw that movie. A couple people saw it. Okay. And I think um, Sandra D was the star of it or something. Okay. That was probably one of the strongest movies truthful about witchcraft and their beliefs that ever existed. Now, there was the original occult Bible, witchcraft Bible, was called the Necromonicon. There's only three copies in existence today. One is in the town in, in St. Petersburg Cathedral in the USSR. One is in New York City. No, I'm sorry. One is in Glasgow and one is in London. I saw when it was on, the one from the London Museum was in New York for a while. I got to hold it and look at it. So I went up in the occult. Now, from that, the Book of Shadows, the occult Bible, came into existence. Several books have been written from the Necromonicon and are in many Christians' hands today, which were hoped that will burn before it's over. Now, according to the Necromonicon, the beginning of the world happened at man or mortals. If you watch the witch, you know the difference between witches and mortals. That mortals, or everyday earth men, women, and so on, kind of descended from the apes and so on, and that at the beginning of this world, the sun of the creator of all the dimensions and universe came from the dimension that the gods dwell in. They came here by, believe it or not, flying saucers, and that they mated with the people of this world, and their children were the witches. And this is actually found in a book called The Book of Enoch, which contains the Book of Noah, which contains all this garbage. Now, according to it, the little people were the witches, the fairies, the hobbits, the elves, and so on, and they were the dwellers of this world, and then through intermarriage they started becoming everyday people. Now, the, the son of Lucifer was called Adam. Now, this is exactly, except they don't call it Lucifer that is in the Mormon Bible, and that Adam being the father of this world, and Eve, they also called Asherah, Diana, Isis, Aphrodite, uh, many names, Hecta, Selene, the, in other words, the mother of creation, was his wife. Now, according to this doctrine, the people that came to this world were the gods that lived on Olympus and other places of high altitude, and that when the Rothschilds, back in the about the 17th century or so, the gods started living in the Rothschilds. They had chose them as the purest family in the occult belief. And through the Rothschilds, making them gods, not mortals, not witches, but gods themselves, they created the Illuminati. Now, I might throw in this, and we'll discuss it later. They believe that Adam is alive again today and is ready to rule the world. With peace, by the way. What else? Now, if you look at the pyramids, the capstone is free from the pyramid because the capstone is the Rothschild, and they do not consider them human. They consider them gods. And the eye is the father god, Lucifer. Now, the Council of Thirteen is right there because they are the Rothschild's private ministers. The Illuminati functions as all of the pagan governments used to function of Babylon, of Moab, of uh, Egypt, of Greece, of Rome, of Scotland, of Ireland, and so on. All the pagan governments function the same way. The priests and priestesses of the temple told the rulers of the government, like the pharaohs or the Caesars or whatever, what to do, because they were told by the gods what to do, and the pharaohs listened to them. Now, in this case, the gods are the Rothschild. So if while I'm speaking tonight, and if you heard my testimony, wonder why can one man so young in witchcraft and so on tell governors and senators and sometimes even presidents what to do. It's because they belong to the Illuminati and the Illuminati is a pagan government that listens to them because they don't give the orders. They simply repeat the orders that was given to them by that capstone, capstone called the Rothschild. Now we drew the three pyramids that make up the Illuminati and you can study them later. But there's one that I want to take before we go into the yellow sheet. I think it's on the purple one here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's take organizations real quick. I want to read you something. Now, I know we have some masons here. I'm going to get you again. Now, many of you know that I did a book for Chick Publications called The Broken Cross. 
We've written another one that'll be out in about three months. Hmm, you wouldn't believe the threats that have come over this book. It hits the Mormons. It hits the occult. It hits the conspiracy and the Rothschilds. It hits the Masons. Man, I think they're going to have to go into a bomb shelter instead of a bulletproof windows over there. And it's really brought the infiltrators within the Christian church out into the public. And I'm going to read you a passage that came out in the book. <clears throat> I'm going to read you a passage from one of the highest books written in Masons. It is a book that is only supposed to be read by 33rd degree Masons and those of the 30th, 31st, and 32nd whose lives prove that they are not Christians that they can hand this book to. We have a copy of it. We photostaffed the copy, and we have been showing it around the country. We have been getting people out of Masons right and left. Of course, we've been getting a lot of Masons mad at us, too. But I'm not going to do what I usually do and really pick on the Masons tonight. I'm just simply going to read from two books of theirs, and I'm going to let the Masons draw their own conclusion. That which we must say to the crowd is, we worship a god, but it is a god that one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign, grand, inspectors, general, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degree. The Masonic religion, religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degree, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Abaddon, now before I go on, I want to say Abaddon is found in Revelations for you students of Revelation as the keeper of the pit, the demon over all the rest of the demons. Would Abaddon, the God of the Christians, whose deeds prove his cruelty, profanity, and hatred of men, barbarism, and repulsion for science, would Abaddon and his priests culminate him? Yes, Lucifer is God. Thus the doctrine of Satanism is a heresy. And the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Abaddon, Jesus Christ. But Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Abaddon, the God of darkness and evil. They're calling Jesus Abaddon. They're calling Lucifer everything we believe of of Jesus, and Jesus everything we believe of the devil. And that's in one of their own books. Now, if you'll notice on this three blocks of any of them, you'll notice the Council of 33. The Council of 33 is the following. Within the Masons, there are the 32nd degree, then there is the honorary 33rd, and then there is the 33rd. I'm going to read you from the Lost Keys of Freemasonry, written by Manley P. Hall, a 33rd degree Mason, and, ever, and co-authored by another man, a 33rd degree, and illustrated by a 32nd degree Mason. All still, all were in the Masons. This was written in 1942. It's a book for Masons only. I'm going to read you the initiation to become a member of the Council of 33, the third, or actually the second highest council within the Mason, I mean within the Illuminati. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. He must follow in the footsteps of his forefather, Tubal Cain, who with the mighty strength of the war god hammered his sword into a plowshed. Now, when I was saved, I complained. Well, no, what am I saying? What am I saying when I was saved? I didn't find this out until I was saved. When I was in the occult, I complained at our council meetings because the 33rd council had so much power, and I felt it was unjust because I had proven myself so greatly to Lucifer. You know, witches are very proud people. And I complained that they didn't do the same thing. Now, we really didn't know what the Council of 33rd, 33 did or what their rights were because we were cult and they were Mason. When I got saved and saw this, I found out they did do the same thing. The warrior on the block right, remember I said they must prove their ability to properly apply this energy? The warrior on the block right is human sacrifice. They did do the same right. The very leaders that lead the Masonic belief Remember, they said, of the high initiates. They laugh at the Blue Lodge and those below them because of what they really know and who they really worship. We had a man saved about two weeks ago, in, or about three weeks ago now, in Jacksonville, Florida. It was a 32nd degree Mason. His father was a 33rd. His future father-in-law was a 33rd. His mother and future mother-in-law and fiancé were all on the Eastern Star, and he was ready to perform the warrior on the block when he was saved. He told us, huh, can I come hide at your retreat? My own parents will set me up to be killed because I have left the Mason. Now, that's a 32nd degree Mason saying that. You think about it. 
All right. Now, go with me to the back of that purple sheet, the political organization. Okay. The Trilateral Council and the Council of Foreign Affairs. There's two separate blocks there, and it shouldn't really be. You can leave it this way. The Trilateral Council is the brain center of the Council of Foreign Relations. Most people do not know that America, without being an official member, is a member of the European Common Market. The Trilateral Council is the American version of the European Common Market. Every man in the Council of Foreign Relations and every man in the Trilateral Council believes that Lucifer is God supreme, has declared it, has taken a vow of secrecy, and has dedicated his life to seeing that Adam gains the world. Our president is a member of the Trilateral Council, and that is a well-known fact for people who dig into politics. So don't anybody, please, don't anybody tell me how great a Christian he is. Now, let's go over to the all sheet, to the Sphinx, and we'll go on with something else. I'm going to give you the rest of that reading list. I haven't forgotten. Just bear with me. When you study Atlas Shrugs, this book was written, as I said, 12 years ago, you will find out that you are reading the front pages of the paper today. The oil shortage that doesn't exist, they state that they destroy their own oil wells, that they hide their own oil so nobody can have it. They state how they destroy the coal mines and shut the coal mines down to shut the electricity down. They state how they cripple the country and no food is grown. It states how they pick and derail trains and so that no trains go. It states how they sink and pirate thousands of ships every year. We just recently heard a report by the Coast Guard down in Florida how they're asking people not to sail out on pleasure craft in the Bermuda Triangle area, not because they believe in the Bermuda Triangle, but because over 1,000 ships were pirated last year and everybody on board was killed and dumped in the ocean. Now, they don't like to put that in the front pages. You see, that might call some people to wonder about some things. And this is all in this book that was written 12 years ago. And in the book, they gain control of the world by bankrupting their own businesses. The Illuminati owns most, I would say, 99 and 9 tenths of the stores that you walk into and shop and the gas stations you go to. And they are going to destroy them on purpose. They are in the process of buying up over the last few years all the stores they don't own. They bought up grants and they bankrupted. They just bought up two guys and you can watch for them to go out of business. And they keep in business the ones that they've always owned and they are going to bankrupt them before long and cripple them and destroy them. And the idea of taking over is to bankrupt the whole world where nothing is of any value and the currency does not exist anywhere and then come back and solve all the problems. I heard the Gaithers, which are my favorite group recently, on a record in a live concert. The guy was talking about the energy crisis. He says, it's funny, it doesn't matter if it's the Republicans or Democrats, they get elected, they cause us problems, and then solve them so it looks like they're doing something. Now that's about the way it really is. And the book in Atlas Shrugged ends with the hero, John Galt, which is really Philip Rothschild, lifting his hand up in the air and drawing the symbol of his organization. It never says Illuminati in the book in the air and says, we shall follow this symbol back. And the symbol that he draws is that. Can everybody see it for you? It's a dollar sign. Now, the dollar sign is only used in America, by the way. Nowhere else to represent money. It's almost 8,000 years old or probably older. It goes back and you find it in the pyramids. And it means to scourge or to punish and through punishment to purify and make right. That's what it means. Funny that that's what we symbolize our money. Now, the Rothschilds lead the Illuminati, and in every country they have a family, with the head of that family being the head of the Illuminati. In the United States, we have the Rockefellers. David Rockefeller is the head of both the Council of Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Administration or Council, which is the name of the Illuminati within the United States. And these, there's more blocks in these things and more blocks in the pyramids, but we have placed the main blocks that would interest America. And the main source of finance for the Illuminati and the whole world, but particularly in the United States, is the Standard Oil Company. Now, I'm going to educate you about something tonight that the Illuminati hoped nobody would ever find out about. Of course, you can check out who owns Standard Oil. That's David Rockefeller. He's the owner of Standard Oil. Now, when we were in the Illuminati, we had to learn the hieroglyphics of the Illuminati, and we had to go and shop at the stores that the Illuminati marked themselves 
mark their stores by. Of course, they own almost everything, but their main businesses they mark. And Standard Oil is the conglomerate that owns almost everything. If I told I'm going to tell you the things they own, you're not going to believe what they own. It's that astonishing. If I asked most people today, besides Standard Oil, in fact, I'm going to, what would you say was the number one conglomerate within the United States? Anybody, tell me. Besides Standard Oil. Sears? That's Standard Oil. General Motors. That's the one I was waiting on. Standard Oil owns General Motors. They own Ford. They own American Motors. They own Chrysler. Now, you'll see Federal Department stores down here. Federal Department stores is Sears, Penny. A man very close, very powerful in the Illuminati, doesn't live too far from here, that owns all the Federal Department stores. He lives in Columbus. His name is Lazarus. Now, Lazarus owns Federal Department stores. Federal Department stores owns Gold Circle. They own Kresge's, which owns Kmart. They own just about every department store in the United States. Globe, Ontario, so on. They own Woolworths, which owns Wilco's. But Standard owns Mobile, and Mobile owns Montgomery Wards. You getting the message? Now, you can find out what Standard owns because they mark their signs with blue and red, everything they own. They also, in all of their oil companies, mark their oil companies with occult symbols. The main symbol is the sign of their god, the five-pointed star. Now, that was, and the strongest version I've ever seen of it is the five-pointed star radiating rainbow colors, because they know that Lucifer is the god of the rainbow, as they put it. And if you'll read Ezekiel 28, you'll find out he is. He does kind of radiate like a rainbow. He's covered with different colored jewels and so on. And this thing, they have snuckle with the arrow through it because that's the sign of casting a spell, the arrow. They use 76 because May 1st, 1776 is their birth date of the Illuminati. They use the sign of what witches practice in, this magic circle. When they write mobile, they write everything in blue, but they leave the circle in red. Most people don't even notice that, that there's a difference. The winged horse in Marathon, Pegasus, is the messenger of the god. It goes on and on. Holiday Inn is the star with the rainbows. And you just go on and on. The eightfold path of, of what a witch must master to be a powerful witch is the symbol of Denny. That's owned by them. So I see that they've got Sears separate from federal park stores. They really shouldn't. Shell Oil was the last oil company to go when Queen Julianne, which is a member of the 500 here, and her husband, Prince Bryden, and Philip Rothschild own 90% of Shell Oil. Gall doesn't bear occult signs because it's owned by British Products, but British Products is owned by the Illuminati. Bosio's is owned by the Mafia that's controlled by the Illuminati. I don't know why Union 76 is separate because it's a member of Standard Oil. But this will give you an idea. And First National Bank is doing a new thing now. They're putting out 13 circles on their building with all the emblems of the Illuminati on them. I guess they want lots of power. They've used the 13 plus the I and plus all oh, different things and so on. Chase Manhattan Bank is, and Bank of America are both owned by the Rockefellers. First National is owned by the Dows and the DuPonts and the Kennedys. And the Federal Re I am cracking up. I told you right Federal Reserve Act is on there. I'm not even looking tonight. The Federal Reserve Act, most people think is a mem uh, section of the United States government. It is not. The Federal Reserve Act is a stockholder-owned company. It's illegal. It's against the Constitution of the United States, but nobody dares oppose it. Now, what most people don't realize is the Constitution says Congress will set our weights and measures and the values of our dollar. But the Federal Reserve Act does that. Now, the Federal Reserve Act was pushed through by Woodrow Wilson, the first Illuminati president since Thomas Jefferson. And he was smart. He adjourned everybody to go home for the Christmas holidays and kept 55 congressmen and senators back that belonged to the Illuminati. This was back before they ran Congress. And before that everybody could get back, he adjourned Congress, and they passed the Federal Reserve Act. You see, now they, got, they do it in a different way. They own everybody. Now, I want to say a couple more things, and then we're going to go into some things here on those signs, and then we're going to take questions. If you'll take up this blue sheet that says, Illuminati plan for world takeover. <coughs> All right. Look for, it says, Democratic president gets the laws enacted. They're talking about J.C. <coughs> the first law that the Illuminati has, but they have not got passed yet, the number one law they want passed is called the, the, the Dow Gun Act. I'm sorry, the Dees Gun Act. It's penned by Isaac Bronowitz, which you'll find on the Council 13 list there, but it's supposed to really be penned by Martin Dees, who led Jimmy Carter's campaign, and is head of the National 
Handgun Control Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, most people don't know how important it is that we not lose our constitutional right to own a gun. The Illuminati will never be able to start Helder Skelter, which is on this thing, and you can read about it later, unless they can convince the people that they're not going to have to go from door to door fighting their way down the street as they burn and kill and rape and everything else. So they have promised them there'll be nothing existing in the form of guns in anybody's hands within the next year and a half. Now, I think that that's where the Illuminati is going to have a little problem because they had counted on passing the same law in Massachusetts as the test law, and they lost it. The law would have gave the National Guard the right to come into your home and the state police without a search warrant and search for your guns and confiscate them and arrest you if you had not turned them in with 60 days of the passing of the law. They thought that since Massachusetts was the strongest anti-gun state in the nation and since Tim Ted Kennedy supposedly wrote the bill himself, it would get passed. Boy, were they in for a shock. It lost by a landslide, almost three to one. And that has thrown them in fear that maybe that same law would not be passed in the United States. Now, the other laws remove tax exemption from churches, House Bill 41. I spoke up when I was here before. By the way, did they pass that bill here? That one you were fighting, 1441 or They did pass it? They passed it? It was about tax or something here. They didn't come to vote? Okay. Now, 41, I understand, has been passed by now, at least by my information of what I can get. And it is supposed to pull the tax exemption from churches not belonging to the World Council of Churches or not having memberships of 500. And then, or what well, it doesn't say it's a poll, and it says that you must go to court and prove that you should stay tax deductible and you'll spend a couple million dollars in court so it's not worth battling. Then, those that keep their status, all except those belonging to the World Council, I mean the National Council of Churches denominations, which leaves out Independent Baptists, by the way, uh, all except them, no other exemption. You will have your name, your address, your phone number, just people coming in, let's we'll keep on, uh, printed in every post office in the United States. Plus, you may have an IRS audit without any reason, just because you gave it to the thing. This is what the bill's about. The next is the Genocide Act. Now, this law was defeated eight years ago, and it's up for vote again in about, oh, three, four weeks. Now, it will send you to the federal penitentiary if you convert somebody from the faith that they were born into. I don't mean born again into. It's a copy of a law in Egypt that you must leave everybody alone to their own faith. That means if you convert a Mormon, a Catholic, a Southern Baptist, something like this. Nobody laughed on that one. If you convert somebody from another faith, even if they're over 21, their parents may press charges against you and have you indicted, not for conversion of somebody, catch this, for genocide. And you'll stand trial, not for some misdemeanor, but for murder. That's right. And that one is being pushed through. Um, the next is the Presidential Martial Law Powers. It's called the, Pre it's called the Martial Law Act. It's already been passed, I think it passed last November, signed, enacted in a law. Now, I want to say something. If you haven't heard about these, that's because you typically do something that the Illuminati counts upon. Now, people, I'm going to, sit, I'm going to try and change your life with this. When Congress is arguing over something about a law that they're going to pass or something they're going to do or somebody they want to fire or get rid of, start digging and find out what they're really doing that you're not hearing on the television. The only time Congress or the government argues or does publicity about anything they're doing is when they don't want you to know what else they're doing. It's a smoke screen. When they fired... I can't even think of his name now. That guy that was on President Carter's committee and so on, when they fired him, they passed the Martial Law Act while you weren't looking. They, when, right now, they're tr they passed House Bill 41 and they're trying to pass the Genocide Act without you knowing it while they argue over the Panama Canal. Now, we're never going to give the Panama Canal up, even if the law is passed, because we're supposed to get up in the year 200 and all the pol people in politics believe that we'll have a world government by the year 1980. So they don't plan on giving up. In fact, they don't even believe the Panama Canal is going to exist anymore. That it's going to be blown off the face of a map in a world war about the year 1980. So they don't care what they do. They're arguing over it. They could pass it right now if they wanted to. They're arguing over it and feuding and fussing and gaining as much publicity as possible so you won't know about the other laws that they're trying to pass. So when you hear something big explode, like the upcoming trials on the congressman and so on over the Korean thing, that's probably about the time that they'll probably pass the anti hoarding Act and finish up the Genocide Act. The Anti-Hoarding Act forbids you to own more than one month's food or one month's fuel supplies on the penalty of one year and $5,000 fine 
one year in federal penitentiary. Now, I want you to go home and ask yourself why our government, we're not starving yet, we will be before long, but we're not yet, why they want to pass a law forbidding you to have more than one month's food supply in your home, why you are not allowed to stockpile food. We're not in World War II when you had to do this. We're now. There's a reason for it. Those are the major laws that you're trying to pass. Now, I got all that stuff out of the way. Now, we'll play school. I'm going to need a mic. Can I move one of these mics with me? Do any of them disconnect? Or... Okay, then I'll stand over here and point. Excuse me for pointing. It's worse than no knowledge. All right? And in all of theirs, they stopped the Illuminati at the Rockefellers. They're, they always are after David and Nelson and these type of people as the leaders of the Illuminati. They're not. Second, they also say that the Illuminati, and it's in many books and I can prove it and in many tapes, that the Illuminati is a Zionist conspiracy. And it is not a Zionist conspiracy. The learned elders of Zion, or the synagogue of Satan, that were Jews that believed that Lucifer was the true God, okay, existed before the Illuminati, and the Illuminati came, you know, used their teachings to start the Illuminati, all right? But they're not Zionists. In fact, most of us, their leaders are Gaelic. The Rothschilds are Zionists by birth, but they quit believing in Yahweh hundreds of years ago. And uh, Weishaupt had already left the Jewish church, had been a Catholic and a Satanist before the Illuminati was formed. And on and on. And they try to make the Rockefellers and everybody at one time a Jew, and everybody changed their names to hide they're a Jew, and all the Jews are the evil people, and they leave the Illuminati. Well, I have news for them. I said on the Council of 13 that runs that organization, and my family's never been a Jew. They're all from Scotland. So something's wrong in the translation somewhere. Uh, and I cannot believe that a member of the Council of 33, the second highest council within the Illuminati, can run an organization that exposes the Illuminati. It just doesn't make sense. And the other strongest thing, we'll let that one go. That's a little too strong for anybody around here. But uh, all I can say is that the Birch Society is like the Masons. Now, I'm going to hit another group here. You're not going to like it. We've got some people here, but hear me out before you all want to lynch me at one time. It's like the Charismatics. And that's because the people, the little people, it's just like, okay, like the coal miners and like the farmer strike and like the Teamsters. You've got the people in it below who do not know who its leaders are. Okay? Now, where I sat, I had to hand money to people. Okay? And when I come out, people wonder, why are you mad at these people? These people are good men of God. Why are you mad at them? How would you feel if you had to take millions of dollars in checks and currency and dispose it to these people to do things for the Illuminati? Would you respect them as Christians? That's the idea. Too much money went into the Birch Society from the Illuminati for me to believe that it's an instrument against the Illuminati. Okay? I built. That's the I built. I saw $35 million in two years go into the charismatic movement to build the four biggest churches in the United States that lead it, plus the full gospel businessmen. I saw $20 million given to Demos Securian one night. I can't accept it. Okay? I, I'm not a member of the John Society, nor a defender, nor a particular excited about the John Society. I would say for record sake, because I have contact with him, documented he was not all the way through Rochester. Okay. I'm, wait a minute. Well, let me cut you off a minute. I gotta give, I uh, wasn't gonna give it, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it. Some of its biggest people, like the man you mentioned and Gary Allen, have both stood up and just literally ripped by name the Baptist Fundamental Church apart. And have you ever seen the blue book of the Birch Society? No Christian can read that book and say that book is a Christian book. All right? And I've heard them stand up and say they're fools in the fundamental church. Okay? No, I cannot in any way. So let's pass over that one. I hit that, and I also hit a dozen other things at once. I'm going to get lynched by three different groups before I get out of here. But, uh, yeah. Let me inject thing, please. Yeah. Let's hold our questions to one per person. Yeah, really. We've got but, about 400 folks in here tonight. Yeah, everybody wants and, to ask uh, a question. Uh, After what I just said about the charismatics, I know they're going to want to. So so let's limit them to the yeah. question. Uh, what, what's, charismatic? what's a charismatic? 
Okay. A charismatic, uh, let's put it this way, a charismatic movement, the charismatic movement to the outside people is the movement that declares the speaking of tongues. Okay? That is separate from the Pentecostal denominations and churches. Most people do not realize that the Pentecostal churches are not part of the charismatic movement. In fact, many of them oppose it. All right? The charismatic movement in reality was one of three steps declared back in 1964 to do two things. While the main function was to destroy the fundamental church of any type. All right? The Masons was one, and the charismatic church was another. Okay? And then the political maneuvers was the third. Now, the charis most people, you know, they, folk, they get caught up in the charismatic movement. They don't stand back and watch it. It has two distinct signs where it goes. If it isn't a fundamental church, it splits it every time. I have never seen any fundamental evangelical church stay the same after it came there. And the other thing it does is it unites all the liberal churches. It has brought the Catholics, the Lutherans, and the Mormons, even the Mormons, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, Presbyterians, everybody together. Now, I'm going to make some quotations. See, I'm not a charismatic, I admit it, but I'm not a Baptist either, so don't say I'm saying it because I'm a Baptist. I'm against it. I'm against it for one reason. I was on the Council of 13 and had to pay too many millions of dollars out to that organization to accept that it be of God and its leaders, since I know most of its leaders by first name basis. They used the charismatic movement to establish Jesus Rock. I had to deliver a $4 million check that was the second $4 million check that Chuck Smith, that created Calvary Chapel and Maranatha Productions, received from the Illuminati. And he knew it was Illuminati money before you go out of here and say that he didn't. The purpose of it was to build Maranatha Industries and Productions, which started Jesus Rock. Back when the Christian church was preaching against rock music, not knowing why, but preaching against it just the same, and throwing it out the churches, that scared the Illuminati and the occult world to death. At that time, they almost thought their end had come. Because if that really happened within the Christian church, the Christian church would have the biggest mass revival of souls in the United States that this world has ever seen. That's the purpose for rock music, to make sure that that never takes place. Now, okay, let me finish all this, because it's long, before any hands come rushing up. When that took place, they got scared. So they got smart, they thought, and they built Jesus Rock. And you can take some of the top Jesus Rock songs... And you can play the same rock songs over here, and it's the very same tune with new words stuck in. Now, I want to give you a, a key that witches know about. Okay? The sign of the devil's music, that they say of Lucifer's music, is not the words. It's the music. The powers in the music. The sign of Christian music is not the music. It's the words. That's why one song written by a group will catch on and will bless Christians' hearts and others won't. Have you ever wondered why the Gaithers are the number one group in the United States? It's not because they sang great, it's because the songs they write and the par in those songs. Now I know from being in the occult world the par in music. And I'm saying all this because I was the leader of Zodiac. I was going to get on this and I'm, I'm still taking care of yours at the same time. By somebody asked me about rock music, but I'll do it this way. <coughs> The thing about rock music was I was the leader of Zodiac Productions, which is the conglomerate that owns almost all of the rock booking agencies and production of concerts in the United States. Almost 95% of the groups that you hear in concert belong to contract to Zodiac Productions. Most of the friends that I have that are still in the world are friends that I met in the rock industry of people whose albums you buy today. Okay? The Illuminati doesn't produce rock music to entertain you. They don't produce rock music to make money. They don't need that money. They own everything anyway. They do it to put demonic influence in your life. 
The w music is a spell, and every witch knows it. That's why when somebody's saved out of the occult, and they say, uh, the saved pastor, what do I do? The pastor will go, well, burn everything that has to do with the occult. That's all the pastor says. And they'll bring in their rock records. Nobody has to tell them to do it. They were in witchcraft. They know what rock music is. Now, kids, I'm going to get you with this. Parents, don't pray that your kids throw out the rock music. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to you. Amen. You are the head of the house, and although you think it belongs to them, according to God's word, everything in that house is yours. And you are the one that will face Jesus and say why you had it. The problem with Christians, particularly in a Baptist church, is that they don't realize that there's two judgments coming. One for the lost and one for the saved. And you will have to give account at the judgment seat of Christ for the things you didn't do and did do. You get it coming and going. So, if you think that you're keeping your kids from being rebellious by having the rock music in the home, have I got a surprise for you. They wouldn't be rebellious if you'd burn the stuff. Amen. So go home tonight and get rid of it. As I told the congregation last night, you can go home and count how many demons are in your home or at least the minimum number, by how many rock albums and 45s your kids have. Now, we started out as charismatic somehow. The Probably the strongest person in the charismatic movement is the man who led the charismatic conference in Kansas City. Now, Charismatics, I'm not picking on you as individuals. I'm picking on your leaders in the movement itself. Just like I'm not picking on Masons, I'm picking on the leaders of the Masons. Now, it's funny. I can come in here and I can tear down Billy Graham and nobody will lynch me. They may, somebody people might think I'm crazy, but they, they'll let me alone. But if I get in the Charismatic Church and I touch one of their people up here, they're ready to crucify me on a moment's notice. Now, I'm going to tell you this. The man who led that conference was a Catholic cardinal. But when they elected Pope Paul, lost by two votes. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Pope Paul's in critical condition. They're already talking about a new pope. And they're proclaiming him by a landslide, the leader of the Catholic charismatic movement. And, by the way, the leader of most of the charismatic movement. He said five years ago at the Notre Dame conference, it's a matter of public record, but they like to keep it from you. That give him ten years, and you'll have all of the churches as one because of the charismatic movement. That's why the uniting of the liberal and the destruction of the fundamental. You'll never get the fundamental churches to unite as one. They can't stop arguing long enough to do it. <laughs> Which I praise the Lord for. Keep us on our toes. But they are getting the liberals. Now, most of you probably sitting here would not be in this meeting unless Jesus was your Savior. But I have talked to thousands of leaders in the charismatic movement who say it is not necessary to repent of your sins and be born again. Demos Securian, this is what Demos believes, head of the full gospel business. He does not believe that you need to repent. He does not believe in a rapture, and he does not believe in a tribulation. He believes that a one-world government is coming, which Christians will lead. He has said over and over, if you receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, and you belong to a church that is not preaching the word of God, don't leave it. Stay there. Don't leave it. Now, I believe that the word of God says, come out from amongst them and be ye separate. Amen. And I also believe that the same as when a prophet prophesies wrong one time, you mark him and leave him alone. If a man preaches false doctrine, you leave him alone. Of course, you can leave me alone if you think I'm wrong about the charismatic. That doesn't bother me a bit. My job is to tell you what's happening. And I'm going to tell you whether you like it or not. You yell for it, you praise the Lord when I'm telling the Masons. Keep on praising when I'm telling you. The second most powerful man, or third most powerful man in the charismatic movement is Ralph Wilkerson. Ralph Wilkerson is the head. He is really the person who tells all the charismatic leaders. He's actually the number one, but he's supposed to be ranked third. 
He is the man who must appear before the Council of Thirteen to take back the orders to all the rest of the people in the charismatic movement. He is the pastor of a multi-million dollar church called Melody Land, one of the largest independent charismatic Bible schools and universities in the country. And they gave that man so much, everything that is there, the Illuminati bought and built for him and him knowing it all the whole time. The reason that he preaches that witches can't be saved and can never be saved is he's so scared that some of us will blab on it. And you're right, I'm doing it too. <laughs> now I have, if you think that everything else I say is great, then why would I lie about this particular, I have nothing to gain. I go into charismatic churches and say the same thing. I do. You think that's rough here? You ought to be there. <laughs> My job, when I got saved, I told the Lord that everything that I knew the devil was doing now was going to let the world know. And man, I'm going to let him know whether you like it or not. Now, I told you the, the thing about it. And I can go on with more churches and more churches. The point is, you're going to have to question yourself about the thing. Okay? People are preaching a last day revival in the United States. The only last day revival we're going to get in the United States is the devils. You may not like it, but the United States is just like Jeremiah. Now, I mean, the United, the United States is just like Jerusalem and Jeremiah's day. They were all waiting for God to save them when the prophet was telling them that God was going to let them be destroyed because of the sinful ways. And one of the things said, you went off under every tree and, com and committed whoredom with every belief there was and worshipped all the pagan gods there was. That's America. The biggest, fastest growing religion in the United States is the occult, and that's a fact. We're not having a Christian revival. It really tickles me how we're supposed to have two-thirds of the population as born-again Christians. I understood that almost 75% uh, of the United States were into witchcraft and the occult. Something wrong somewhere. People, something is terribly wrong. When we have a country that is so sold out to the devil and its way of life, and we have at the same time such supposedly mass revival of a Christian belief, something stinks somewhere. Now you're going to have to pray about it yourselves. But I'm telling you for a fact, you better question it. You better question what you're into and the little groups. And this, I don't know if the charismatics know it here, but see, I, I get all the charismatic books and read them and all the teachings, and I know what's taught by this thing or that. It's funny, they'll say one place, something, someplace, and something different, someplace else, and so on. I don't know if they ever know what they're saying. And they're really recommending that you not go to church. Most of them are teaching. Bob Mumford, Prince, and Basham, and others are preaching, stop going to church. To go home and hold your own individual prayer meetings in your house, and don't go to church anymore. I'm sorry, that's not in the Word of God. Amen. There'll be a day where you won't be able to go to church. But why you can do it, that day has not come yet. And your home won't be safe when it comes either. Okay, I took the longest on it, but go ahead. Try to get these others. Uh, this card that you were talking about, with that symbol on it, now, would we, we don't have a choice. We've got to take it in order to... Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's back up a minute here. The Bible says that if you take it, you're lost. Okay, so this is the mark. This is the mark. If you're waiting for a tattoo, I've heard Christians say, well, I'll take the card until the tattoo comes. <laughs> Let's go about that tattoo for a minute. It says that an angel of the Lord is going to come down and, and seal God's people in the forehead and hand. Now, does that mean we're going to rock around with a tattoo? So if it's spiritual there... It's spiritual when we're sealed in the forehead and the hand with the mark of the beast. Now, I want to tell you something. The forehead means the mind, and the hand means the works. It always has in Bible prophecy, and it always will. There's something strange. We'll go over to Ezekiel. We'll go over to Isaiah. We'll go over to all the other prophets, and we'll read their prophecies in Daniel, and we'll say, Oh, praise the Lord. You know, that, that means this and that means this and so on. We know that, that the dry bones meant something and the wheel within the wheel meant something and the statue with the ten toes meant something. 
But we'll go over to Revelations and we'll say, well, of course the Antichrist is not going to be a dragon with ten heads and or seven heads and ten horns and so on and so forth. We don't really believe he's going to be that. And we'll call that spiritual. But we'll go over here and call something else physical. What makes Revelations different from the rest of the prophecy books? I thought it was the same God giving the prophecy. You can't do it that way. No, when this card comes, when you take it, you've made your stand. As for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. And you can't do both. So you're going to have to go home and ask yourself what you're going to do when you can't go to the grocery store. Thank you. Mm-hmm. It's not established. <laughs> you, I mean, they don't put a sign and say, here we are. Yeah. No, the witchcraft on the post is undercover. Totally. But it, it's not so undercover that most people on the base don't know it exists. Okay? Yeah. Uh-huh. Right here. Um, you mentioned in your tape that re you recorded it before. Somebody asked you a question, and I think it was in fact, was Jimmy Carter the man mentioned in the sixth letter as being the son of his He is Adam. He is Adam. Uh -huh. Right here, the best. Oh. You said in your other tape that there was a different reason for the fight, a fashion interview. Okay. Well, I can say the others. Um, okay. Melanie Land teaches that witches can never be saved, or anybody that ever practices in the occult. Well, we got a lot of lost people tonight night because a lot of people read their astrology charts. Uh, Ralph Wilkerson is teaching that there is no rapture, that the uh, church will either go through the tribulation or there will be no tribulation. He hasn't quite made up his mind yet. Um, I want to think about these because I want to make sure I word them the way that he worded them. Okay? The Old Testament is not the ordained word of God that Luther, Lucifer inspired it, and that the Ten Commandments were not written by God or delivered by God to Moses, that Moses was fooled and the devil delivered them. I'd say that was quite a few right there. Now, these are things that he has said. And I'm being taught in his Bible college. Okay. Over here. First Corinthians chapter 8, Apostle Paul discussed the subject of idol worship, which at that time was demon worship. Same thing today. He makes the remark that the threatening of the symbols, for instance, me, the offer to the idols, and the very presence of the believer even in the temple of idols, which is the first Corinthians chapter 8, were not the final to the believer. I'm a little concerned about the statement you made that the Alright, we're not under the law. We're under grace. First to admit it. And Paul is talking about grace, mercy, and law, and so on. Now, I would never place myself under law. Because one thing I learned in witchcraft was that all of the devil's power was through the law. And that he was defeated by grace. But he is our accuser, okay? People get very hostile to me when I say that according to a Christian's life depends. Not, they're not immune from a witch casting a spell on them or demonic influence in their life just because they're a Christian. That's not a cure-all. I sum, sum it up, but most people don't understand what I mean when I say it. But there are Christians that have accepted Jesus as Savior... And there are Christians that have accepted him as Lord. Okay? Oh, by the way, I wanted to add, it just struck my mind, Ralph Wilkerson also teaches that Satan and Jesus have been united. Okay? Um, now, the thing here about these symbols is it's like the Word of God. The Word of God, and I think that everybody will accept it here, unless, of course, you went to Melody Land, that the Word of God was inspired by the Holy Spirit through men. Okay? That it wasn't created by man. Man didn't sit down and pick it up. Any person with any intelligence can know it could have been put together the way it was put together with man's intelligence. You couldn't do it with a computer. Next, this was drawn by the devil's instruction. This isn't meat that was sacrificed to idols that came out of a thing. This was something that the devil said, do. Okay? This has power. Most people don't realize how much power. You should have been a witch, then you know how much power. This has power to it because of the words that are in it and the power of those words, it has power. 
Now, we have found this very extensively. That's why some of the other translations are so bad, because they have stripped the power out of it. Now, this jewelry was inspired by the devil, and all I can tell you is what I have seen. And that is that I have seen two things. That at a council meeting of the 13, it was decided that above all, more powerful than rock music, more powerful than Christians owning books and astrology charts and Ouija boards, was to place them this in their hands. All I can tell you is that demons follow this. They're not going to follow the slice of pork sacrificed to an idol, but they're going to follow the idol. I'm, I'm getting to it. I'm, I'm trying to lay the groundwork. I can't just jump into it. Now, let's take the two Christians. A person totally serving Jesus Christ as Lord is not going to have him in his life anyway. And that's where it lies. A Christian that's living... That's assuming he knows. Okay, what happens when he knows? Uh, okay, whether they do or not, all right, I think that Jesus stops being the Lord of your life when you know this and keep it. I mean, you're not going to set up in, in your house an altar just because it's safe to go into a pagan temple with a statue of Satan. Okay, so you're not going to set this stuff up. When you know, you're going to get rid of it. That's the idea, okay? If it was harmless to lordship Christians, I'd shut my mouth and let it go and keep the heat off my back. Everything I say in me is controversial one way or the other. You know, I could be a good minister. I could be another Billy Graham if I watch what I said. I just can't announce to do it. <laughs> it's not jewelry. The trick is jewelry. It's not the symbol. It's when it's cast in jewelry that it holds its power. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Well, they belong to the same bank. They belong, okay, Prudential, Case Manhattan owns Prudential. Actually, Lords of London owns most of the insurance companies in the United States. And Lords of London owns Chase Manhattan, okay? So it's a chain. Uh, all states owned by Sears, which is owned by federal department stores, okay? I mean, you can, when you study conglomerates, you'll find out there's four conglomerates in the world and everything's owned by them. It doesn't matter what it, who they say owns them, it's who really owns, who owns them, okay? I, th I, I think you'll get the message. Uh, let me, I know you got your hand up. Let me ask other people, if you've asked a question, hold it off and let me get some of the others. Yes. Yeah. I'm a bit concerned about what you said that the rapture my concern is that uh, if a Christian has eternal life, as the Lord says, and he receives that sign in the next year and a half or two, but however it is by a credit card or jewelry, whatever you may call it, he said there's room that he's lost. And this confuses me because I understand that a Christian has eternal life, he can never be lost. And so I wonder how to stand on eternal security because if eternal life is anything, it's eternal. You don't get lost by a sign or something else to take. So I'm going to put it in position. You believe eternal security is free. Okay. I believe in eternal security. I believe in everything that I believe in for reasons that I see. Okay? I believe in I came to believe in eternal security in a very real manner. Because I believe in demon possession and demons in Christians' lives. And I've seen hundreds and thousands actually thousands of people that have been Christians originally going to witchcraft and no matter what they did, they couldn't be possessed. That convinced me right on the line. It may not mean anything to you, but it meant to me. Oh, I believe in eternal security. But I have a question for you. What happens if a Christian blasphemes the Holy Ghost? Well, we get into a discussion of what <laughs> Yes, we will. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Oh, yeah, I said it. I believe in eternal security, but I believe that if you knowingly blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you're lost. I believe that's what the Bible says, too. Now, that's why I speak the Holy Spirit, and people back in Jesus' time were able to do that. They didn't have that son. But was that blasphemy of the Holy Ghost with Christ and she on earth? Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost can come in many ways. When you sit there and you take a sign that the Bible has said, now remember, we're not talking about the lost who might take it ignorantly. We're talking about the Christian who knows all the way through the Word of God that taking that is rejecting God. And rejecting God is blaspheming the Holy Spirit when you reject Him knowingly. I answered you. He can't? 
They can't? That they lost his faith and saved his body. One person can't. You're lost. quoting one scripture and I'm quoting the other. It's something you've got to decide. The Bible says that if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you're lost. So no forgiveness, but if a person is saved, he's already forgiven. And the blood of Christ is trying to be lost in him. He is forgiven. So it's obvious that Christians can't be lost if he's saved. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that a Christian can sin? Absolutely. But he's had his sin paid for on the cross. So sure, but if he can sin, if he can sin, he may not be lost. But does he have to ask for forgiveness of the sin that he's committed after he's saved? All sins are forgiven. Does, if you sin after you have had your sins washed away, do you have to repent of the sin you've committed? All my sins. I asked you a question. Do you have to repent of that sin? Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. That's not the word of God. Right here. Is the Mooney movement connected with the Illuminati? The Moonies and the Krishners and the Way were all created for one purpose, and that was to pass the Genocide Act. Because when the Genocide Act was first tried to pass, the Christians fought it. This time it's being passed because the Southern Baptist Church and BJ and other places are backing it to stop the Moonies. And I don't know if they realize what it really means. It means that the same thing can be done to a Christian. Okay? Yeah. Spiritualism? Have you read? All right. How much do you know about this book? Okay, I believe it. And I'm not making. I'm not making fun of you. I'm going to use it to answer your question. Uh, no, no. Ho, 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 ho. Wait a minute. Now let me say something here. Because somebody says they believe in God, big deal. The devils do too. They know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No, the Bible through and through, particularly Deuteronomy 18, forbids spiritualism, consulting the familiar spirits and, de and demons, consulting the mediums. And it says in Revelation that these people shall have their part in the lake and fire, and before the blood covenant, it was punishable by stoning and death. All right? In fact, the only time that I ever know, and boy, was the witch surprised, that the real person ever came back and communicated was when Samuel came back and talked to Saul, and the witch was so surprised that the real Samuel showed up that she ran out of the place. Okay? No. No, the Spiritualist Church is called the Christian Spiritualist Church of America. They believe in God, but their teaching is not the Word of God. They don't believe in heaven. They don't believe in hell. They believe in reincarnation. Uh, they don't believe in the devil. They don't believe in demons. I mean, there are over and over. They don't believe in salvation, repentance, born again. Nothing. You know. No, uh, some time back, oh, about 70, 80 years ago, I guess it was, maybe even longer. Uh, yeah, it was. It was before the turn of the century. Well, that's about 70, 80 years. Uh, they decided, the Illuminati decided that not everybody would ever worship witchcraft. So they pulled four of the major beliefs out of witchcraft. Spiritualism, okay, uh, uh, which created psychic killing, okay, and, and many other supposedly signed gifts and so on that were counterfeit. Um, they created astrology separate. That's when astrology started picking up. They created yoga, or TM, Transcendental Meditation, which was astral projection. And they created psychic powers of ESP and so on. Okay, and controlling somebody with your mind. They call it, they call it parapsychology, telekinesis, and so on, which is the same thing as casting a spell. So, they, this way, by giving it scientific names. But evidently, the professors at the uh, Parapsychology Institute at Duke University never read Act 1616, where it said that a person with this power had demons, and when the demon was cast out, they lost their power. That would blow their philosophies out the window. But, um, no, uh, it's definitely of the devil. Okay? Back here in the blue. Oh, go ahead. No, it's all right. Ma'am, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's appearing just like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's appearing just like that. In fact, in Jerusalem, almost all of the license plates begin with 666. <laughs> What? This this right here appears. It is on the card. I've seen a copy of it. That's what I said a while ago. It is. That's why it's so funny that supposedly a born-again Christian said, I designed the card and put that on there. Mm -hmm. Right here. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask the best question. I may not You won't be the first. <laughs> Uh -huh. Did you uh, have any knowledge of some of our uh, big Christian leaders run up and get in the, in the You want the Baptist to get me now, huh? No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm not talking about Billy Graham or Joe Roberts, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah, quite a few. Let me say something. 
Have you ever noticed the bigger you get, the less fundamental you get? Now, there's an exception to that. I, see, in the occult, I didn't have any heroes. Now, I like John Wayne. You know, I don't know any better. No, my heroes are, are heroes that were enemies to us when I was in the occult. The most feared man in the world is a Baptist fundamental preacher by the name of Jack Howe. He is the most feared person. In fact, it was barely a month went by that that man's name didn't come up in some way. Wow. By several doctrines he preaches, an armed Christian for one, uh, preparing for the end times, the Christians will see trouble before the rapture, the requirement of Christian retreat, the separation of the Christian from the world, that really scares the Illuminati. The Christian, when he starts becoming separated from the, wor the world, and when a man teaches the Lordship of Christ, that causes that. And they're scared of that. Because that is an enemy they can't reach. They're sold out. Okay? That's, that's the main reason. Also, he teaches on the Illuminati and other things. And he teaches it the way it really exists, not the way somebody in Macon, Georgia said. Yes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Smith? I don't know his first name. I never met him after that night. I never met him after that. Huh? Oh, he was talking about all my testimony. In my testimony, I talked about the Baptist minister who prayed and fasted and ordered the demons to be silent and not have any activity in my life so I was saved. Now, all I know is his name was Smith. I don't even know his first name. He pastored a little Southern Baptist church over by the Air Force Base. But that's all I know. Okay? Yes, I'll go. Oh, uh, when were you saved exactly? What do you believe that to mean? Okay, I was born again, which is what I believe it is, completely a new person. Uh, let me explain what born again is first. I'm tired of people saying they're born again and not. Amen. Oh, I like those amen. <laughs> born again is two things. One, it is the complete change of your life. If you are not a changed creature, you are not born again. And the only way to be a changed creature is through repentance. That doesn't mean that you are perfect and that you will not sin, and that you will not need continual forgiveness. It is unscripture for anyone to believe otherwise. Second, the fruit of the Spirit will be present in your life if you are a Lordship Christian. Now, see, these Christians that are know him just as Savior, I won't deny their salvation. I may frown upon it a little. I can't believe that a person can be a born-again Christian and not sell out to Jesus. But it seems to be done a lot. But I do know that where he is Lord of your life, the fruit of the Spirit will be. Now... That happened to me on May 1st. I'm sorry, May 1st. I got May 1st on the brain tonight. It happened to me on Labor Day, 1972 in San Antonio, Texas. Now, all my problems weren't solved that night, and I was born again, and I was changed. There is to believe that this country isn't any special than any other country, and it's going to fall. And when it falls, and until Jesus comes, they want to survive. The question is, how do we as Christians, I like that, prepare for the coming days in regard to our necessity supplies? food, fuel, etc. Well, I can't go back over and lay the groundwork for all of you that weren't here last night. So I'm just going to have to go ahead and answer, uh, answer the question. And if I confuse you, I'm sorry. If you've got a pencil and paper, I'm going to give you some information. It will probably save your life. A man named Mal Tippin writes for a magazine called Guns and Ammo. In December 1976, he started a column called Survive. I followed very closely. In fact, I, I really invite that everybody write Peterson. You can go out and buy a copy of Gun and Ammo Magazine, get the address of Peterson Publishers.
First, I'm glad that you came this evening. Brother Todd will have his seats at the back. If you want to take the message tonight, we'll not have enough ready immediately following the service. We do have the message from last night and the questions and the message tonight. If you recorded the message tonight and would be so kind as to let us copy that, we have a high-speed duplicator. It'll take exactly four minutes. And we greatly appreciate it. This one time lady here has allowed us already to copy hers. If we could get some others, if you've got a good, clear copy, not of the question and uh, answer session, but of the message for the previous, uh, if you'd allow us to copy that, then we can choose the best one. And that way we can get this out. We sent out between three and five hundred of the testimony tapes, and we expect to send out about twelve, fifteen hundred of these. So you see, it's important for us to have a good copy. The dirty low-down devil got into this thing tonight, but he's not going to be victorious. Amen? Philippians so 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. Amen? Would you say that together with me? Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. Now think about it. Do you believe it? Lesser crowd that time. I'm not going to try to talk you out of it. My friend, if you're a Christian, there's no mountain too high to climb. Any kind of children, uh, father, or older, your children are downstairs. So I'm going to turn the door here, downstairs, and come to the great parts of that. Your children are in the bathroom. If you don't want them, I'll take them home with me. <laughs> All right, just a moment. Wait a minute, we're not dismissed yet. Okay, the uh, Todd tapes are right here at the back. If you want the tapes of the, of the other uh, messages that we have, various other tapes, uh, you go back here to your left and around, the ushers will direct you back to the church office. But if you do want the tapes mailed to you, you have someone that you want to mail to, if you'll see our folks back there tonight, uh, our tapes are $2 a piece, that covers the mailing and all. And that covers the cost of them, and, and we'd appreciate that. If you can't afford the $2, we'll mail them anyway, but we would appreciate the gift. So we're glad that you came this evening. Brother, would you sing a dismissal song with us? I'm going to ask you not to mill around too much. Folks are being saved here at the front. And, you know, we get in such a big hurry. If you were in a ball game and they just gone into overtime, they couldn't drive you out with a shotgun. But Christian people are the most unusual people in the world. They'll start crowding the aisles 30 minutes before the message is over. Especially if they get to a clock, if they get used to the preacher, well, they'll, they'll just start crowding the aisles. Well, you've been in the presence of something tonight, whether you recognize it or not. We look for miracles. Anytime someone's born again into the family of God, it's the greatest miracle ever performed. So let's remember those things. We appreciate your coming. I hope you'll pray for the ministry of First Baptist Church. I hope you'll pray for Brother Todd. And just uh, continue to serve the Lord, and we'll look for his soon appearing. Hope that none of these things that we hear about happen, that he'll take us out first, but let's be ready for them. All right, sing with us, please, as we're dismissed. The rows in the back, the chairs, are we getting those gentlemen so folks can get out? The chairs were blocking the aisle. If we get those quickly while we're singing our dismissal, and then folks can get out easily. Okay, we think the little chorus here isn't too wonderful. If you know it, sing along real loud. If you don't, like you know, we can't get here and we can do it again, okay? CIA and everybody else know about, but our work is not secret, otherwise I wouldn't come up here and say we were planning it. If an organization is good and it is Christian, then why must it be secret? Why must it not only be secret to the outsiders, but it must be secret between the levels of its own members are to know what the other members are doing in higher levels? Now, I read last night from the highest mason books in here that proclaim Jesus Christ, the God of evil, and Lucifer, the God of good, and they that proclaim the Masonic religion, a Luciferian, uh, the Masonic religion, a Luciferian doctrine. 
by nations' own mouths in their own books and proclaim to be a 33rd degree nation, not an honorary, but the initiate 33rd degree, you must commit human sacrifice. Now that is what the Shriners and the Easter Star and Job's Daughters and everything else is. Now, I gave symbols last night. You can go to Frisco, you can go to any church that is a functioning satanic church and the emblem of the Satanist church in the broken cross back there is an upside down star with two points symbolizing the horn god or the goat or Satan. This was created before the masons ever existed and this is their emblem. Their initiation rites are identical to those that I practice in witchcraft. Their secret ceremonial rites that we have seen in books are those identical to the I practice in witchcraft. Now if you do the same thing a witch does, if you say the same thing a witch does, if your emblems are the same thing that a witch wears, Tell me what the difference is. Give me a difference. Who is the Antichrist? I think we've covered that. How can you tell if a person is a witch? Well, since the Christians insist on living like witches and wearing the same jewelry and playing the same music, you have to look in their eyes. But then since Christians do the same things, oftentimes you get the same look in their eyes because they got the same demons. Because the look in the eyes is simply the demon. So I don't think there's much to do about it anymore. What, what, by what procedure will the 666 card be distributed? By mail? How can you receive mail? <laughs> I know I do a pretty good job of it. I mean, when you get a package and there's no return address and it's a little bulky and lumpy and it ticks, <laughs> well, we've gotten a few of those. <laughs> Bathtub gets filled with water real quick. I don't know how it's going to be distributed. They haven't said. I can only give you what. It's funny. I know all about these things. Nobody else says them on the news. I don't know what's wrong with these people. Oh, I know what's wrong. Everybody's watching Laverne and Shirley. They never pay attention to the news. Now, I know that you're lied to a lot on the news, but if you pay attention, you can hear enough to know what's happening. I'll tell you something. If you doubt anything I say, and if you don't believe that the end times are close and the rapture is around the corner and all these things are going to happen, I used to say under 65, but I found out they just got five. If you have 179 spare dollars, you should have given to the retreat. You can go down the radio shack and you can buy a shortwave receiver. Not one of these multi-band things that don't pick up anything, but this thing will pick up broadcast anywhere in the world. And when you hear the man that's the head of the Baptist Church in Poland, that's the church the government sanctions. That's not the real Christian church. Stand up and say, Mr. President Carter, we as Christians in Poland believe that you are our salvation. It'll do something to you. That was just half of what he said. I, 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 you can't stand all of it. But I'll tell you one thing. We monitor short wave and we know what's taking place. You only get 10% of the news. If you went and you looked in a history book or at a museum where they had newspapers, of the two days, including the very morning that the stock market collapsed, the paper said the Congress and the government and the President had everything under control. So don't believe the newspapers. Probably the day that the Antichrist takes the throne, they'll say the President's got everything under control, and about that day he will. Okay, I can only handle a couple more here, and then we're going to turn it over real quick. Do you have any comment on the coal strike? Oh, yeah. I've never prayed, except that when Carter ran against Reagan. I don't think I've ever prayed so hard in my life for something not to happen. I had Christians around the country praying on that matter. The Illuminati almost jumped two years ahead of their schedule, and we didn't have the retreat ready. At the coal strike, was to continue for two more months, eight million people in the United States will be out of work. Now, when you put eight million people out of work, you're going to have trouble. 
real trouble. The only reason we don't have a depression in this country now, I think we do anyway, is because we have welfare. They didn't have welfare back then. This country is worse than it was in the 30s and the late 20s. Now, all I can tell you is this, that in Atlas Shrugged, their coal book for world takeover, they destroyed the coal mine. First they destroyed the oil, then when all the electric companies started switching over to generators run by coal, then they destroyed the coal. They plan on shutting the city completely off from everything. Fuel, electricity, gasoline, and food. I'm going to close with this. I'm sorry I couldn't handle your, all of them. It's just there's too many. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't lynch me for it. I want to close with this. I felt very, very neat and very important. And that's this. They're going to make a strike happen. Now I want to say something. When this takes place, it'll be too late to go to retreat. They're going to cause a mass strike across the United States of the Teamsters. No trucks will move. Nothing will be fit by trucks in the United States for close to a year. During that year, or almost as long, nothing will be unloaded by ships because the long storemen will go on strike. No airplanes will fly, not just because the pilots went on strike, but the air controllers went on strike. Only military planes will be in the air. Nothing will go by rail because you need to watch for this. The bridges over the railroad tracks are going to start crumpling under the trains being blown up. More trains are going to be derailed to the point that whole towns are going to be wiped out by poisonous gases and explosions. They're picking these trains. It's already been proven. The one that killed so many people with chlorine gas down south was hit. They let the train hauling nothing go over just before it, and then they derailed this one. They know what is being shipped by trains and what's on the train, because they own the train. Nothing is going to move. Now you ask yourself a question. If nothing is brought into the city from outside by shipping to the grocery stores, what are you going to buy in the grocery stores? You're not. If the, even if the farmers go ahead and plant and don't go on strike, it doesn't really matter because there'll be no way to get the food to the grocery stores. Now, if you don't think that's possible, you stop and think that all the small strikes that happened that paralyzed us in a little way. I can remember when nothing got unloaded by the longshoremen, and we didn't have a lot of goods in this area for a long time. I can remember when the teamsters went on strike and nothing was moved, and we saw it just then. What happens if everybody goes on strike at one time? Every form of transportation ceases. You say, well, what about the car? Well, how does the gasoline get to your station if the teamsters don't move it? Then your cars don't move. Then the coal. Big deal, so the coal miners go back. If the teamsters don't move the coal and the trains don't move it, you still aren't going to get any electricity. You think about it. Patrick, it's all yours. I'll give him a break until September. Hey, man, Brother Todd will be back with us September 8th, 9th, and 10th. If we don't all take off, unless the Lord comes first, and then I won't be here, and I hope none of you will be. As I said last night, sometimes I say things are very depressing. The Apostle Paul said it should be encouragement. He said the second coming of Christ is the blessed hope for child of God. I look for the day the Lord comes, but I know my long priest that Christians in all likeliness are going to suffer much before that time. I believe it's an honor. I believe it's our privilege to live in this day, be missionaries, be evangelists in this day. As I said last evening, and I repeat this evening, the purpose of this meeting is not only to alert Christians, their Christian hearts, to win others to the Lord Jesus Christ before it's too late, but to give you an opportunity 
to the Holy Spirit of God to speak to your heart, advise you of your lost condition, and then for us to have the privilege of taking the Word of God and showing you how you can truly be born again. The Bible says without repentance there's no salvation. We see a lot of confusing things sweeping America today and even the world. The Bible is still the Word of God. One day each one of us will be judged according to this blessed book. We live in a day when there's a lot of easy believism. You walk the church aisle and shake the preacher's hand and get a few drops of water on your head and be immersed. You put your name on a church roll, but that doesn't make you a Christian. This evening we're not trying to make a Baptist of you. We would like you to search your heart. Ask yourself this question. If I would die tonight, am I assured that I'd spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven? If you do not know that, you can know it. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know. You say, I've been taught otherwise. Let's put all you've been taught aside. March 25th, 1968, a man came to my home. I said, I'd like you to show me something out of the Bible. I've been told a lot. And he took the word of God. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. I didn't understand that. Maybe it's a lost person tonight. You have no idea what we're talking about. Then he showed me the Bible said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Folks can say a lot of things with their mouths. They can deceive even their own self sometimes, but it's what's in the heart. You receive Jesus Christ to your heart as your personal Savior. God will do the rest. That's your part. But he said, well, I'll do my part. The only thing you can do is come to him with a broken, repentant heart. The Apostle Peter said, repent and be converted. That's what you need to do. As we bow our heads and close our eyes and no one looking around, and Christians pray, let me ask you this. Do you know that you're a Christian? Some may say, well, how, how could I really know? How could I be sure? The Apostle Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, a new creature, recreated, made again of God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Here's how you can know beyond any shadow of a doubt where you stand with the Lord tonight. If there's never been a changed life according to God's word, not according to this preacher or any other preacher, according to God's word, and that's the word you're going to be judged by, if you've never had the evidence of a changed life, you've never received Christ to a repentant heart. Now let me give you the verse again. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all, all things become new. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, and I ask no one to look around, please cooperate with us. No one looking around out of curiosity. Has there been a time in your life where you were genuinely sorry? Not sorry you got caught but sorry you'd sin before a holy God, sin again, a holy God. And when you came to that God, to that repentant heart, and received his son Jesus as your personal Savior, if you did, he changed you. The Holy Spirit of God indwelt you. He sealed you. He'll never release you. But you can be certain if there was a changed life. Was there? If not, you need to come this evening. We'll have the preachers come. I'd like for them to come at this time. They'll be here at the front. They'll pray with you. They'll take your, your, their Bible, and they'll help you. They'll show you what God has to say. I reemphasize not to make a Baptist of you, but to show you what God says, how you can be born again. You think about the terrible days that we have ahead. 
They might have frightened my friend, it will not compare to a Christless hell. It will not compare to what you would undergo a million years from tonight in hell where the worm dieth not and the fire is not planned. You may have came tonight out of curiosity, but God speaks to your heart if you receive him. All your heart's tender. The Bible said when Christ returns, it'll be as in the days of Noah, and as the days of Lot. In Noah's day, the ark door was open. <coughs> Noah gave the message, come, anyone in the world in that day could enter into the ark and be saved. The same thing's true this evening. The crucified Christ, who died in your place, who paid with his own precious blood for your sins stands with his arms open and says, Come unto me. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that same Christ says, I'll not turn you away. God promises, I will not turn you away. It matters not to God what you've done. He'll forgive the past. He said, I will not turn you away. But for those who reject him, the Bible said one day, he'll say to them, Depart from me, you that work in equity, for I never knew you. He did not say, I knew you one time, and now I no longer know you. He said, I never knew you. Depart from me. The blessed Savior who paid the price to say to the rejecter, No, no longer come, but go away. You made your choice. Would you choose for him tonight? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and Christians are praying. The preacher's here on the platform praying. They're concerned for your soul's salvation. Each one of them is saved, walked in old-fashioned church island. Most of them knelt around an old-fashioned altar. But where was the church their home? Baptist church? A hole in the church? No matter where it was, they all had to come the same way. Repent and receive Christ as Savior. They're concerned for you tonight. They love you. They want you to know the Savior they know. They want you to have an eternity in heaven with him that they'll have and enjoy. So our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'd like the privilege, just before we stand together and sing, to pray for you. You're here and you say, Preacher, I'm unsaved. There's never been the change in my life, and you are unsaved. Say, I, I've never had the change, but I am concerned. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you have the courage to raise your hand and say, Preacher, I acknowledge that I'm unsaved, and I want you to pray for me. Lift your hand very quickly and let me have the privilege of praying for you before we sing the invitation. Very quickly. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Very quickly. Folks, this is such a serious matter. Not to become a church member. Not to be baptized. But to be born again. Not to become a Baptist. We don't want to make Baptists. We want to make Christians of you. And only God can do that. Let me have the privilege of praying for you. I'm going to pray that God will give you the courage to walk the aisle in just a moment. I'm going to pray God will not let you leave this auditorium and die in a Christless hell. But I would like to pray for you. Anyone else? Very quickly. I'm not sure, preacher. Pray for me. How about that? Anyone say, I'm just not sure. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Let me pray for you. God bless you. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'll go back here. Anyone else? Just hold your hand up till I see it. Say, preacher, what's the importance of the hand? Well, it just depicts what's in the heart. Yes, God bless you, man. God bless you, lady. Anyone else? I want to be sure about this matter. Now let me do this. Perhaps we should have done it first of all. What about that Christian that's let Satan have the victory in their life? You haven't won a soul to Jesus in so long. Maybe you never have. You were genuinely converted. Your heart filled with joy. You hated sin. 
Now you've spent too much time in front of the television and not enough time in the Word. You've spent a lot of time gossiping about folks that you haven't been talking to the Lord about them. You've been trying to handle your own problems. You can't handle them. You've got your life in a mess. You don't even care much about it tonight, lady. Would you let me pray for you? You lift your hand, Christian. Say, I know I'm saved. I know I've received the Lord. If heads are bowed, I ask again. No one look around, please. Be fair to these that have a need. How about a Christian? God bless you. Yes, yes. God bless you. Any other Christian? God's speaking to your heart. Not this preacher. God's speaking to your heart. You know it. All right. Anyone else? God bless you. I see you in the back. Anyone else? All right. Okay, yes. God bless you. I believe here's what we all do. Yes, Lord bless you. Quickly, another Christian. God speaking to your heart. I think here's what we ought to do. I believe those Christians who need help, those Christians aren't living for God. I think you'll slip out from where you're at and kneel around this altar, get your heart right, and then we'll trust God to save these that are unsaved. We stand together. Those of you that are Christians, I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm going to pray for you, like I said. But we're going to stand together as we sing. Now, before we sing, I'm going to pray for you. I will hope, I trust, that each Christian that has a need find their way to the full second altar. And then we're going to pray and we're going to give the invitation, trust God to save the lost. Let's stand together. With our heads bowed with our eyes closed. We join our hearts together in prayer. Christians, pray with me. Those of you that have a need, why don't you come ahead right now? Don't hold back. Come and kneel around this altar before I begin praying. Get everything right with God. While there may be a dozen people between you and that aisle, come on, that's it, amen. Come on, Christian. We're not going to see unsaved folks saved here tonight till you get your heart right. You quench and grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We'll be victory. That's it. Come on, hurry. Hurry on here. Some of you preachers pray with me. Come on. Let's do it quickly. You know it's right. Say, preacher, you tricked me. I didn't trick you. You confess. Now God wants to give you the victory, and the devil wants to take it away from you. Our God, our Father, in Jesus' name, we pray you take this invitation time. And our God, I pray that you would just take complete control. We plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and over the power of the demons, and our God, over all the power of Satan. You said it's our victory. If we'll just take it, and we claim that victory tonight in Jesus' precious name, I pray that you forgive these Christians about this altar. God, I pray for those that haven't had the courage to step out. But our Father, there's folks here tonight that are on their way to hell, and I ask you to save them for Jesus' sake. Our God, take control of this invitation. Lord, it's the most important part of this entire service. And we ask you to take control and glorify thy own son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brother, what shall we say? Just as I am. Those of you that are unsaved, meet me here at the front. But one of us take the word of God and win you to Jesus. Do it quickly. a moment we're going to sing another verse. I don't know what else I can do for you. I believe somebody tonight that God just pulling on your heart strength. Maybe he's speaking to you like he spoke to Judas and he said you're going to die, you're going to split hell wide open. 
I believe when Judas got down to water to be baptized, the Holy Spirit of God said, Judas, you're going to die and go to hell. And Judas said, no, I think I'll go on later on. He walked yet another day with the Lord Jesus. He came down to the garden and he never thought he'd ever get there. And he placed that kiss upon the cheek of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit must have said to him again, Judas, you're a traitor. Judas, you're going to die and go to hell. Judas said just a little later, and I want to repent. But you know the story in the Bible tells us tonight that Judas has been nearly 2,000 years in hell. It's real to him tonight. You stand here tonight and you say, well, I'm not too bad a person. Judas wasn't either. He was a good moral man. No record that he ever committed adultery. No record that he was a murderer. Judas was the kind of man that you'd been happy to live next door to. He'd have been a good neighbor. But Jesus said, you've got to be born again. You must. There's no option. You must be born again. My friend, your goodness will not get you through the gate of heaven. God's speaking to your heart tonight, and you're saying no. There will be a day when he'll never speak to your heart again. Tonight, he brought you here for a purpose. You may not know why. You may think you just came to see the show. Maybe you came out of curiosity, but God brought you here to save you. Don't turn him away. One other verse, our brother, if no one else comes, we're going to close the invitation. Christian, are you grieving the Spirit of God? God's speaking to you, and you know what you ought to be doing. Some of you are linked up with liberals in the world. God's speaking to your heart, and you know what you ought to do. Won't you do it right now? Don't put it off in tomorrow. Do it right now. Tomorrow is not sure. Do it right now, as we say. I'd love to take this book. These preachers, any one of them would rejoice to take this blessed book and show you what God says. Here you have victory. Here you go out of here a saved person tonight. The new leaf on life. Only you can make the decision. God gave you the worst enemy you'll ever have. That self-will. Only you can decide. I don't know why he did it that way, but he did. I don't know why his blessed son died for you. You weren't worth it now, I wasn't either. But he did it that way. We must come. Here's why. One other verse. Rise. Let's pray again. Two more have come. There's Christians here tonight that love God that stand here until morning. You'd come and get saved. There's Christians here that stay and pray all night. You'd get saved. There's Christians here tonight that do anything in this world to see other Christians get right with God. I believe the Lord's still moving. I believe he's still speaking. Christians, would you join your heart with me in just a few moments of silent prayer, every head bowed and every eye closed, and Christians lifting up their voice to God. Let's ask the Lord to save every lost person. The Bible said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not God's will that anyone perish. It's his will that all be saved. Let's do our part. Let's be a surrendering Christian. Let's not grieve and quench the Spirit of God. Have an unsaved person go out of this building tonight and never be saved. Brother Reader, you come pray with us. Then we're going to say another verse again of say if no one comes. We will close the invitation. This is the most important part of the service, folks. I mean that with all my heart. This is the most important part of the service. Brother Reader, read it, please. Our Father, again, we're grateful, Lord, for what we see here. God, thank you for the need, Lord, to straighten out the lives of these that come tonight. Father, we pray for those that are still here and still need to come. We pray, dear God, for Christians. Lord, that need their lives straightened out. Need to make you the Lord of their lives. 
I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd deal with those hearts. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, right. give them the courage to step out. Say no to Satan. Yes to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Lord, I pray for lost in here tonight. I pray, dear God, that you'd bring the lost. Mm-hmm. Lord, I pray that you'd give them the courage to step out, admit their guilt, admit their sin, mm-hmm. come and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. God, I pray for indifference that mm-hmm. here tonight. God, I pray that you'd remove the spirit of indifference. We're so glad that you came this evening. Father Todd will have his seats at the back. If you want to take the message tonight, we'll not have enough ready immediately following the service. We do have the message from last night and the questions and the message tonight. If you recorded the message tonight and would be so kind as to let us copy that, we have a high-speed duplicator. It'll take exactly four minutes, and we greatly appreciate it. This one-time lady here has allowed us already to copy hers. If we could get some others, if you've got a good, clear copy, not of the question and uh, answer session, but of the message for the previous, uh, if you'd allow us to copy that, then we can choose the best one, and that way we can get this out. We sent out between three and 500 of the testimony tapes, and we expect to send out about 12, 1,500 of these. So you see, it's important for us to have a good copy. The dirty, low-down devil got into this thing tonight, but he's not going to be victorious. Amen? Philippians so 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. Amen? Would you say that together with me? Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. Now think about it. Do you believe it? Amen. Lesser crowd that time. I'm not going to try to talk you out of it. My friend, if you're a Christian, there's no mountain too high to climb. Any of the children of poverty or older, you're turning them downstairs. So I'm going to turn the door here down the south because the great part of that is turning the bathroom. If you don't want them, I'll take them home with me. All right, just a moment. Wait a minute, we're not dismissed yet. Okay, the uh, Todd tapes are right here at the back. If you want the tapes of the, of the other uh, messages that we have, various other tapes, uh, you go back here to your left and around, the ushers will direct you back to the church office. But if you do want the tapes mailed to you, you have someone that you want to mail to, if you'll see our folks back there tonight, uh, our tapes are two dollars a piece. That covers the mailing and all, and that covers the cost of them. And and we'd appreciate that if you can't afford the two dollars, we'll mail them anyway. But we would appreciate the gift. So we're glad that you came this evening, brother. Would you sing a dismissal song with us? I'm going to ask you not to mill around too much. Folks are being saved here at the front, and you know we get in such a big hurry. If you were in a ball game and they just gone in overtime, they couldn't drive you out with a shotgun. But Christian people are the most unusual people in the world. They'll start crowding the aisles 30 minutes before the message is over. Especially if they get to a clock, if they get used to the preacher, well, they'll, they'll just start crowding the aisles. Well, you've been in the presence of something tonight, whether you recognize it or not. We look for miracles. Anytime someone's born again into the family of God, it's the greatest miracle ever performed. So let's remember those things. We appreciate your coming. I hope you'll pray for the ministry of First Baptist Church. I hope you'll pray for Brother Todd and just uh, continue to serve the Lord and we'll look for his soon appearing. Hope that none of these things that we hear about happen that he'll take us out first, but let's be ready for them. All right, sing with us, please, as we're dismissed. The rows in the back, the chairs, are we getting those gentlemen so folks can get out? The chairs were blocking the aisle. If we get those quickly while we're singing our dismissal and then folks can get out easily. Okay, we need the little chorus here. Isn't he wonderful? You know Law, serving Satan, and uh, through the power of the gospel, he was miraculously saved back in 1972. He's been serving the Lord since, and there, uh, under many dangers, many obstacles, has a real testimony of the power of God.
He also has an insight into the other side that many of us just do not know, we're not aware of. And many of the things that we take for granted and assume to be harmless are really tools of the devil. And so I'm just going to let Brother Todd come and share with us these things that God has laid on his heart. All right. Uh, I understand that many parents from the school here have been calling the principal with questions about what all took place the other night. Uh, I'm sure that teenagers can uh, tell it one way different than it happened, but uh, the report seemed to be very good. I'm glad that I did was able, with the testimony that I gave the other day, to touch many of the teenagers' hearts. Uh, I'm sorry that I won't be here for the fun on Tuesday, which is destroying the record. I got kind of a little, like, you know, something like a Tonka blast last night. I got to break up a bunch of KISS records. Now, uh, that may seem kind of strange for you. What kind of nut gets thrills from breaking up KISS records? Same kind of nut that gets the same thrills from burning J.R. token books and breaking up Ouija boards. But uh, I came out of a world, which I'll explain about in a few minutes, where these aren't innocent little things. And whether they be in the Christian world or in the witchcraft world, they're still not innocent. They're very dangerous. And they're carefully laid traps to entrap people that the occult has spent millions and millions of dollars to devise. Before I give my testimony, I want to say something real quick. Most people have a kind of elusive idea of what the occult world is, and they miss the whole point of the occult world. It is not just something where witches get together and there are real creatures or whatever called witches around. Uh, it is not a place where people get together and hold seances and float tables all the time and so on. The occult world is a very political and financial world where some of the most influential people in the world today believe that Lucifer is God and the only answer to the world's problem and they trust the people in witchcraft to be their ministers and they are just members of the church. I'm going to be talking about an organization called the Illuminati today. So I might as well get that organization out of the way now. Then many people who have discovered the Illuminati in different phases of life, 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 whatever, across the United States. My pastor first discovered them Dr. Rasmussen, when he dealt with the Masonic Lodges. Other people have discovered them in the form of the Catholic Church and in the occult world and the political world and international banking system and many other types of conspiracies that existed. And when they discovered it without knowing any more about it, they thought that's exactly what the Illuminati was. And they ran off and wrote a book on the Illuminati saying this is where it was at. When I came out of witchcraft, I had dealt enough with the Illuminati to know that witchcraft wasn't the total Illuminati. Witchcraft and the Satanist church and the spiritualist church and other things, when they're combined together in higher levels, in lower levels, they're all scattered here and there. They resemble much like the Christian church. They're always arguing amongst themselves. But in higher levels, they're one. And the ministers that are in the higher levels are like the pastor here. He's the pastor and you're the congregation. You're supposed to be Christians, most of you are. But you're also mechanics, construction, white collar businessmen, and so on. Well, in the Illuminati, it's the same way. There are bankers, there are politicians, there are ministers, and so on. But their ministers are the people in higher levels of witchcraft. And I was born into a family that helped create the Illuminati, the Collins family. They were selected just, all oh, probably close to 100 years before, over 100 years actually, before the Illuminati became, per se, the Illuminati. They brought witchcraft to the United States. Many of the people that they chose to be their ministers are very famous in the early revolution history of America. I mention names across the United States and people say, oh no, those were good God-fearing men. And then I start quoting from 
newspapers in Boston and reports around the revolutionary times where this man was caught doing this and this man was caught doing that. And all of a sudden they don't look too much like three of our most important legendary figures that helped our country be birthed were arrested at one time for human sacrifice and the charges were dismissed. They had the body, everything. The building they were in doing the right one night caught fire. A bunch of people perished and they got arrested and so on. And they kind of got out of the charge. You know how it is with important figures. Still had a little pull back then. But this is the world as it really exists, and we're going to be talking about it today. You may think that it's uh, a little different from anything you've ever heard, and I must either be crazy or lying, or I've got a good story or something. And the reason for that is that you sat in front of your television quite a lot, or a lot of most people do, and the television has a very absorbing nature upon people. You begin to accept that what you see on television is reality, and that's the way people are. Across the country, we've named people that are in the occult world that are also on television. Told, in fact, a couple of people I know that I used to have a lot of dealings with when I was in the witchcraft world that are now superstars on TV. And you can't, ex most people can't accept that because they watch them and these are nice, you know, clean cut figures. Surely from their television shows, that's just the way they are. But it's not so. In fact, just to kind of break the ground, I'll give you an example before I go with the testimony. One of the most powerful witches in the United States is on television. She's a homosexual. In fact, the young lady she lives with in marriage is a very famous rock star. And they thought it was very unjust of witchcraft that homosexuals weren't allowed to be ministers in witchcraft. I think they were smarter than the Christian church. But, uh, so they decided that that was unfair. So they formed their own denomination, or as we call it in witchcraft, a brotherhood for witches and for homosexuals that are witches. Now, this nice, clean-cut American girl has one of the top comedy, situation comedies on television. Most people watch it on Tuesday night when they don't have anything else to do, like pray. It's called Laverne and Shirley, and the girl's name is Cindy Williams that plays Shirley. Now, that's the real world out there. It's not the world that you see on television. So today, if I say a few things that are astonishing to you. I say these things across the country, and so many people have booked these poor people with tapes because they're running out of their ears of, of these things I said. I have ended up in court because usually I quote actual news releases and statements made to the public that most other people don't catch, or I quote knowledge in the past that I can prove. So believe me, I get up here and I say the things that can be proven, and uh, I'm very careful what I say. So you think about it for a while. At least do this. Most people that hear me that can't accept me decide they're going to go prove I'm wrong because they can't stand what I said. It just will shatter their lives, I hope. And so they run out and they go to all the libraries and they try to prove against what I say then I get my strongest believers after that. Because when you go to the library and you go to the book stands and you start buying books and you start researching the things I'm going to say today, something very mysteriously happens. You find out I'm telling the truth. It's all there. So I invite you to go spend a few hours, turn off the television, and do some prayer and do some reading of the Word of God, and do some reading of other books when you leave here today, and you might find out what's really, really happening today. Now, I came from a family, as I said, the Collins family, that brought witchcraft to the United States. They were originally Druids in Scotland. Their name was Colleen. And they had to flee to Scotland because of being hunted for witchcraft, and they came down to England and pretended to be a Puritan family. 
one thing I want to point out over and over today is that there are many just as communist trained KGB agents to come to the United States and infiltrate into political and religious circles. So does the occult world. They have a whole training center, two of them in fact, one in St. Louis and one in St. Paul, that completely trains a witch in how to act and talk like a Christian. And they usually do it better than we do because they're pretending and we're stumbling. So just going to point this out as we go today. But they went down and they pretended to be Puritans and they came overseas. In fact, they brought the first, first Puritans to the United States on board the ship that Francis Collins owned. They landed at an area called Collins Bay outside of Salem. And it's, in fact, that's why it's called Collins Bay. Now, many of you, how many of you, excuse me, remember a show called Dark Shadows? Okay? You can guess who that was about. When I was a teenager, I was asked to, at all expense paid, fly out to Hollywood with the diary that I had inherited as a child through a will from my great-grandmother. And they were the diaries of several members of the Collins family. One of them was a character named Franz Williams Collins, which was the secretary in the coven that Benjamin Franklin was a high priest of. And the diary dealt great heavily with three political figures, Jefferson, Franklin, and Hamilton. You can call them by name in the diary and so on. And this is the man that they copied the character Barnabas Collins from in the show. And uh, I was out there for a few months during my summer vacation one year telling all about the Collins family as they were putting the scripts together. That was a very interesting thing that happened to the show. It had the highest ratings of any show that's ever been on television, and it was literally preyed off the television. It still had the high ratings when they quit. And for no understandable reason, they just quit producing the show. And it's, they still haven't figured out why they've done it. In fact, they've tried to bring it back several times and repeats across the country. And every time it's arose, as repeats, Christians have started praying. And it's only lasted two or three weeks and went off the television again. So if it happens to come up in this area, you might decide praying a little. It was a very, very strong occult show. Probably, besides Bewitched, was the main reason that the occult grew as strong as it grew so quickly, other than rock music. <laughs> now, I was raised, born and raised in this family, which automatically placed me into a witchcraft atmosphere. Many of you have known nothing but Christianity. Many of you have came out of the world or are Christians, and many of you are still in the world, which I hope you'll get out of today after hearing this. But I was born into a witchcraft family, and as I was telling some of the teenagers different places, when the kids were coming to Sunday school and memorizing memory verses, I was memorizing the witches chant. When they were reading stories of Moses, Moses and Joseph and so on, and the disciples and the gospels, I was reading J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. When they were studying different things and uh, they were learning the Lord's uh, about the Lord's Supper, I was learning how flying saucers about the first men to the earth. When they were learning about the garden and Adam and Eve, I was learning about Adam and Eve being the sons of God. So it was a little different. And of course, when they were learning how to pray, I was learning how to light candles and incense and cast spells. But I grew up in this atmosphere. Many of the kids had something I never had that I never missed until I became a Christian and realized it really existed. Now I miss it. I never had a childhood. In witchcraft, the parents are not allowed. And even if they could, they wouldn't have the ability to. They're not allowed to love their children. The children are the property of the craft and not of the parents. They are raised by all the witches in the craft and the parents say nothing. One thing you might be interested to know is they're never allowed to spank their children. They're never allowed to punish them. From the moment the child is five years old, he's considered an adult 
and he's treated like an adult. And therefore, you have some very rebellious children. But that's the way they like it. Now, when I was 13, I was taken to a thing called the outer court. And the outer court is a school, like you might send your child to specific Coast Bible College. Only each Cohen has their own Bible college, it's called the Outer Court. And there I was trained to be a priest in witchcraft. And at 14 I was initiated a priest. Now if that seems young for you, you can imagine at 13 or 14 you picture your own child and that's the way it was. I have a little bit of news for you. My sister progressed even faster than I did. When she was 13, she was the witch queen of the state of Ohio. She had over, close to, about 15,000 witches under her direct control, and all of them were almost adults. So age has nothing to do with it. It was how fast they were trained and the family they came from. In fact, they're after teenagers. The 95% of the people who join witchcraft are inducted by their school teachers in junior high and high school. So if you're sitting out there and you don't, in the past, I've been asking you to say this, this is just a firm belief of mine. If you don't have them in a Christian school, I suggest you get them in a Christian school. Real quick. My wife's not here today because tomorrow is the opening day of our rehabilitation center, something we've prayed for five and a half years to have. And she moved all night till about four or five this morning. Some of the people from the church I just called and they had just now were going to have to miss Sunday school because they were so sleepy they've been up for over 24 hours moving and getting the center ready so it'll be ready tomorrow. But her testimony is that two people started her in witchcraft, her pastor and her drama teacher in junior high school. So uh, that'll give you kind of a idea of what the occult is like. She was inducted when she was a freshman in school. She wasn't born into a family. But when I was raised, you had to be a witch to be in witchcraft. And then it started changing because they wanted the numbers. Now, at 18, I was initiated a high priest. When I was 14 and initiated a priest, that made me draft exempt from military service because all of the Brotherhood of Witchcraft and the Satanic Brotherhood of America, which is the Satanist Church, are federal recognized churches. It might interest you to know that some of your tax money pays for a chaplain in every federal prison in the United States, a chaplain of the Witchcraft Church. They have an altar and a service every Sunday for all the witches in the federal prison. And your taxes paid for the chaplain and all the instruments that he uses during the service. Nice to know, huh? But, uh, in fact, they got started at Folsom and San Quentin were the first two prisons to do it. And Folsom's a state prison, so some of your state taxes are going to it, too. That was Jerry Brown's idea. You might consider that when you vote for him next time. Now, you know, they're not published net on the television commercial when they say all he's done, have they? Anyway, at 18, I was initiated to high priest, but at 19, I decided that the military needed us. They needed witchcraft. Whether they knew it or not, we were there, the answer to the world's problems. So, I decided that I was going to enlist, and I rode around the country to all the other uh, high priestesses and high priests that I knew, and I suggested the idea to them, and they thought it was a good idea, so we all ran off and enlisted in the service, and went in, had, I couldn't do anything halfway, which is, have a tendency of never doing anything halfway, I guess that's why I don't do anything halfway as a Christian now. So if I say something that you think, well, that's too strong for a Christian, you got to understand that I came out of a thing where I didn't hold anything back to the devil, and I'm sure not going to hold anything back to the Lord. But I went in, enlisted in the Special Forces, went to Vietnam, came back, 
came back medically wounded. In fact, for a while I didn't think I was going to live, and if I was going to live, I was going to lose my eyes and this leg. But I came through the situation. I really feel that the Lord had his hand on me at that time. And I re-enlisted when my time was up and went back into the service immediately without even, you know, just getting the discharge and, and the same minute taking the oath to go back in. And I went to Germany. When I arrived in Germany, I had six years I had just re-enlisted for. I took one month of leave and I spent once in Germany, one night while drinking. In the month of June of 1970, I was drinking quite heavily and taking drugs. I got in an argument with an officer in downtown Stuttgart, and I shot and killed the officer. Now, the Army does not appreciate sergeants shooting officers. They have a way of dealing with that. And they locked me quickly up in solitary confinement, started court-martial proceedings, and... Leavenworth was looking like my next home for good. Now, until this time, witchcraft was a religion to me. That's all it was. I know there were several brotherhoods. There were big witches, but they couldn't have been any bigger than actually I was because I was third level, and that's as high as you could go. And, and everybody knew that your power was the... You were a god in yourself because of your SP and psychic powers, but there were pagan gods that we worshipped also, multi-gods, and that was all there was until this moment. And I decided that I needed some help. I knew witches were very powerful, and it hadn't been the first time that witches had cast spells on judges and juries to make them vote a certain way. So I sent word out to a prisoner being released, to call my foster mother in Los Angeles. I asked him to have her get a bunch of the big witches together and cast spells on the three judges that were going to finish giving the verdict, make them think I was a good guy, that it was all a mistake, and the officer was probably the bad guy and let me go. Now that's what I thought would happen. Except that three days later, after the phone call, my cell door opened, Next day, I was to go get the verdict, and my cell door opened, and I walked out. They called me out into the corridor. There stood two men I'd never seen before, but I found out quickly that one was named Senator Saxby, and another one was named Con Congressman Wiley. Now, Saxby, as you know, later became our Attorney General. He was the man responsible for keeping law and order in the United States, and he just was breaking the law because he handed me an honorable discharge. There was a couple of generals standing there with him. He, and the honorable discharge reads, honorable discharge. It doesn't explain what I'm going to do with the rest of the six years of my service, and it doesn't say why I'm getting out. It just says honorable discharge, just like anybody else that would have completed all their service. They further told me that my court-martial records had been shredded, but as far as the military was concerned, the court-martial never took place and that I had nothing to worry about because all the testimony had been shredded and that the people who had testified had been ordered to forget the whole thing and many of them were at that moment receiving orders to go to Vietnam. And at the same time I was told not to worry about it that my military records would be destroyed later. It was interesting, when the fire swept through the record center at St. Louis, only the Korean and World War II records were supposed to have been destroyed. The mine was Vietnam records, and mine was destroyed in the fire. So, anyway, I flew back on the military plane to Fort Dix, got everything together, and went home to Ohio, arrived very confused. Arrived at my, I have two mothers, a, a mother and a foster mother. I arrived at my mother's home, I said, look, you've been in this witchcraft thing a long time. What type of spell makes senators and generals do what we want? She says, you don't understand, do you? That wasn't a spell. They're with us. She handed me an envelope and said, this is for you. I opened it with $2,000 and $100 bills and a first-class plane ticket to New York City. I said, what's this for? She said, you make a phone call 
You get the next plane you can out of here, and I'll make a phone call and tell them that you're coming. They'll meet you at the airport. I said, who are you going to call that's going to meet me at the airport? She says, you'll know when you get there. Now, witches are very curious people. That's why they always get in trouble. I just couldn't wait to find out who was going to meet me at the airport. I mean, I had $2,000. I could catch the best plane in the world back if I didn't like it. Besides, $2,000, that was a lot of money. I had to find out who could flash this type of money around. So I got on the plane, flew there, got off the plane, and a man whose books I had studied for a long time walked up and met me. He was head of the anthropology department at Columbia University at that time. He is now he's the president of his own witchcraft Bible college in New Hampshire. His name was Dr. Raymond Buckman, handpicked by Philip Rothschild to lead the Illuminati for him. And I arrived there, got off the plane, Dr. Buckman took me to his home, and the next few months he literally tore down everything that I had been taught in witchcraft, that it was all just the stuff we told the lower people. It's much like the Masons. The higher Masons believe one way, and the lower Masons believe something else. But the lower Masons think the higher Masons believe like them. In fact, the higher witches have said a statement that was also made many times in the Sonic book, that the lower people are sheep to be sheared in their ignorance. <laughs> so that's how they think of the lower witches, if we have any of them here today. And the one thing that I did learn very quickly was that witchcraft just wasn't witchcraft, that it had a goal. And that goal was to return Adam, or the Son of God, to the earth to create peace so that his father, Lucifer, could return to the earth. Now that's the gospel of the witches. And that was their purpose, and that's what the Illuminati meant, the light bearers, to bear the torch for Lucifer. We learned all this, we learned all the things that, I learned all the things that politics had done so far, the Illuminati had done in politics, had done in finance, and what their plans were for the immediate future. Then I was taken up to Colorado and I was placed through an initiation at a place called the Summit Monastery. Now the Church Universal Triumphant, or Summit International, holds its main Bible college in Pasadena. They bought the old Nazarene College there. They used to be called the Process, and the Process still exists out on the East Coast. Manson was a member of the Process. That kind of gives you an idea of what they're like. Very racist type group, American Nazi type group, but they believe in human sacrifice and Lucifer being God. They believe that peace will only be achieved when the Christians when the churches are burnt, as one leader said, Isaac Bonowitz said, when the churches are in ashes and the Christians are against the wall, then our God will give us peace. I imagine that's when their God would give them peace. But anyway, after all this training, this initiation, I moved down to San Antonio so I could direct direct the drug traffic coming across the border there in three places and a couple places in Arizona. I was given a 13 state area and all the occult activities in those 13 states. I didn't have California. My foster mother leads California. So, but I had, had a lot of dealings because of her in California in the occult. Now, my only job was to meet eight times a year with the top witches around the country to decide things that would happen. Right now, today, is one of the days that the witches meet eight times a year. This is New Year's Eve to witches. This is Beltane, the most important day in witchcraft. Now, a very strange thing has been taking place. Instead of a one-day meeting, which was scheduled, those 13 witches and several hundred others have been meeting in Los Angeles for the past three weeks must be very important what they're going to be up to. But anyway, if you always wondered why the birthday of the Illuminati and the birthday of the Communist Party is May 1st, that's because the Illuminati always uses May 1st because that's New Year's Day and they begin everything on May 1st. The 
you can always watch for big things happening on May 1st. But I lived there for a while. The other thing that I did, as I told the young people here before, was to pass out money. I would receive checks starting about a half a million dollar figure and working up cashier's checks from three main banks in New York City would come by armed messenger. It would be my job to place them in people's hands. Now, most of the people that received these were in the charismatic movement. That's why I don't like the charismatic movement. I don't know why some of the Baptists don't like it, <clears throat> but I know why I don't like it. I don't like it because I had to pay most of its leaders off. And we bought most of the big churches that are charismatic churches today, like Melody Land and Calvary Chapel. That's why I don't like it. The occult world does not spend money to their enemies. They give it to their friends. So you might consider that if it ever crosses your path or if it has. So that was mainly my function. And then one thing happened that changed it all. I was slowly getting dissatisfied with this thing because it wasn't the religion that I had been raised in any longer. It was politics. It was conspiracy all the time. It was this devious act and that devious act. And then that just wasn't what I had been promised when I started becoming a priest at 14. But you can't get out when you get in, supposedly at least. Nobody had ever heard of getting out at that time. And then August the 1st happened, 1972, a courier from our State Department from the London Embassy arrived in San Antonio where I was hosting the meeting on, it was called Latimer, August the 1st. All the witches, the 13, were gathered together there. The courier came in and left the sealed pouch with the uh, Secretary of State seal on it and left. Dr. Buckland cut the seal and opened it and took out six letters which bore the crest of the Illuminati. The crest of the, of the Illuminati is on the back of your one dollar bill. The capstone in the pyramid with the eye in the capstone. Opened the letters and most of them were instructions to give this check to this person or tell this politician to get this bill passed or do something or other. The last two were totally different from anything we'd seen. They were in Philip Rothschild's own handwriting. Now, according to the doctrine of Wicca, of pagan movements, if you're going to write something that is religious, something from the God, it must be written in your own handwriting with a dip pen. And both these letters were. The first one was 30 pages long. It was a step-by-step -step chart for the taking over of the world. As strange as that may seem to you, it was there in black and white. An eight-year plan, and it closed with, Lucifer will give us the world at the end of the year that begins the age of Aquarius. In plain old-fashioned talk, that's December 1980. So that's why all the thing about the age of Aquarius. Now, after all this, and by the way, I've been watching that plan very carefully over the years. They're right on schedule. In fact, they're a little bit ahead of schedule. And then one more letter came out. The sixth letter. I guess that's why they waited and, and labeled it number six. Talks about Adam. All the witches went into a hoot and a holler and started praising Lucifer and so on and so forth. I just kind of sat back in shock because it said, We have found Adam, and Adam will lead us in peace. In Christian terms, brothers and sisters, they had found the Antichrist. Philip Rothschild says we will spend every dollar we have, which is most all the dollars in the world, we will cause as many wars and we will destroy as many governments as it takes to put him on the throne of peace so that his father can return in the age of Aquarius. Now that's when it was time to get out. 
I don't know about you or you would have thought to do at that time, but I wanted out. So these people were serious. I didn't really think they could do it. I'd been there all this time on the top council, and I just then realized I thought they were joking the whole time. That it was just a game so they could spend money. But you can't get out. Other people will try to get out. It was just impossible to get out. The next month I went through in total depression, stayed on drugs. I was doing $150 a day worth of crystal. One guy was talking to one of my brothers yesterday. I showed him the scars on my arm from the needle marks that have never went away. And just down to about 149 pounds, just existing. In a constant state of paranoia, which the drug produced anyway. And slowly, I just kind of gave up, said, well, it won't be long. They'll either get dissatisfied with me or I'll take an overdose some night or, or, or something will happen. And that'll be it. Get away from all these crazy people. I'll come back in another life and start all over again when it's more sensible. The only problem was, the Lord had other plans. It wasn't a problem, except for the devil. I'm glad he did. Because a Baptist minister in town had found his daughter, an initiated witch. And that's when his teaching at Baylor University didn't work anymore, that witches were fatal. And he started praying, he started reading the Word of God, and found out that all through the Old and New Testament, witches existed. He found out that in Babylon, that was the religion. And he found out in Revelation that it would be the religion again. He found in the 16th chapter of Acts, 16, 17, 18, 19, that the power of a witchcraft was the ordering of the demons in the name of Jesus out of the person. And that we had the victory through the form of God over the devil. And slowly, first, he didn't believe in witches, and then he believed in me, got afraid of them. Then he realized that being afraid of a witch was being afraid of the devil, and that was ridiculous. So he came looking in prayer and fasting for the head witches around the area. And I was very well known in the area as being very involved in witchcraft. And he prayed, God, let my path cross his. Now my occult name, the name that I was sprinkle baptized, that's where you get your sprinkle baptism from, a name I was sprinkled baptized with was Lance Collins when I was initiated a priest. They sprinkled baptized me and made me a new person, supposedly. I walked out of there, Lance Collins, from the initiation, so that's the name that, while well, Lance, and then I attacked my family's name of Collins on it. So he went looking for Lance Collins. And something mysterious had happened. The guy who was running one of our occult stores that had an overdose that night. And the cashiers were banging on my apartment door telling me to let him in or get something done. And I came down and let him in. And just as I was leaving, he walked in. Now I knew he was a Baptist the moment he came up. He was carrying this big black Thompson chain reference. Now that's the way they go around in southern Texas. They believe in showing the sword. As one Baptist preacher told me, if I can't cut him with it, I'll beat him over the head with it. <laughs> but he came in. He says, I'm looking for Lance Collins. And I go, oh boy. I said, I'm Lance Collins, but don't you start preaching at me. I don't want to hear it. I've got the light, and you're in darkness, and you don't know where you're at. And he started preaching to me, and I started cussing at him. And about five minutes of this screaming and hollering on my part, and his preaching on his part, he stopped and said, okay. And I stopped and said, oh, you're going to quit now, you're going to leave. He says, no, I'm going to take the authority over the devil on you. He says, and I ordered the demon in you to be silent. And I started cussing, and he said that, and I shut up like that. I had myself convinced, boy, this guy's weird. I want to hear what he's saying. But I couldn't say anything. I just stood there dumbfounded because he had taken the authority over the real power in Lance Collins. The person that did the thing was a shell, and the directing force in him was the demon of the devil. 
Now that's the difference between Christians. We need to get a few possessed by the Spirit of God. So where Jesus is so Lord of their life, they're the shell. And the directing force in their life is Jesus Christ. I sit there and I listen to the man as he pleaded the blood of Jesus Christ over me. And he said, I demand in the name of Jesus. I command in the name of Jesus. That the devil never give you one more benefit till you come to grips with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that includes his drugs that he's giving you. And he turned around, picked up his Bible, and left. I'm standing there, huh, anybody knows the devil's a boogeyman the Christians created. See, witches don't believe in the devil, just the Satan. That's the difference between witches and Satan. And I walked on upstairs, very shaken, trying to kid myself. That guy was crazy the whole time, like you're trying to do with me right now. And I picked up my needle, got it all warmed up and stuff, gave myself another fix and used up the last of the crystal that I had because I had sent everything off the night before because I had a huge drug shipment coming in that night across the Laredo border. No reason to worry. Man, that drugs would keep me going and, and most of the witches in the United States for the next six months. Once it was cut, put on the street, not to worry about it, ordered the drugs not to come to me. I mean, we had the border patrol paid off. I mean, that was a large ship, but we could afford it. Everything was set up. Nothing could go wrong. Except that there were some illegal aliens going across the border that night. And the two border patrol that we had paid off were removed for a stakeout. And a reservist was put on. And when this big car pulled up and the idiot that was driving it, just set three big cartons of the white powder in the back of the seat in plain sight, pulls up to the border, the guy pulls out his gun and arrests him. I mean, what would you do? And there went the drug. So as the phone rang about midnight, I was told this, and after getting calmed down and everything about it, it started hitting me. Hey, I ain't got anything here. So all night long, I was calling around trying to find drugs and Finally, I worked the phone calls up to the state of Ohio. They said, yeah, no problem. We can get you some back down from the same stuff you sent up here. It'll be back down in your hands Tuesday morning. I was doing three fixes a day. Tuesday morning was a couple of days away. That was just a little too long for me. But as Monday night went around and I was so far into withdrawal that I thought I was actually dead but couldn't die, and I got in my car about 10 o'clock at night, tried to drive my car out of the parking lot to go find something to calm me down. I wrecked the car trying to get it out of the parking lot. I just walked off, left the car, went walking down the street, came upon a movie theater. The movie theater was called the Aztec Theater. I walked into the theater, paid my money, walked in, sat down about three rows back, going to get my mind right into the movie, you know, like you do. When your wife's screaming at you and you turn on Starsky and Hutch, you know, something like that. Or when the wife turns on the soap operas to get rid of all the kids and, and the worries of the bills and stuff. I sat there and watched the movie and the weirdest thing happened. This idiot came out waving his Bible all over the place. The flash bulbs were popping. The movie was called The Cross and the Switchblade. <laughs> and I sat there... At first, I was really mad. Stop, and I said, oh, I wasted all that money. And I said, well, I ain't got no place to go. I must have sat here. And I got intrigued with the part of Nicky Cruz. And I must have made everybody in that movie theater mad. Because I, I really got intrigued with Nicky. He was my type of guy, you know. And Dave Wilkerson go around witnessing to him, and I said, get away from him, preacher. Leave him alone. Don't you dumb Christian know he knows more than you do. And just scream out and yell, boy, I bet you. <laughs> so the ushers wouldn't touch me because they knew who I was. They were, you know, just wouldn't have anything, you know. I'm sure everybody ran out and said, get him out of here. And they said, not me. But I sat there 
I went through a movie that something that changed my whole life took place. Mickey Cruz got saved. But that's all right. I mean, the Masons talk about being born again, and the witches talk about being born again. I guess the Christians can talk about being born again. But something that doesn't take place at the other two incidences happened with Nicky. He changed. Now listen to me. I don't, I guess I'm old stick in the mud or something. My heroes are Charles Finney and Billy Sunday and people like that. We need a few heroes in the world today. And I believe, like they believe, that if you give your heart to the Lord and you're truly born again, it's not because you say you're born again or because you walked up front. It's because there's a distinct turnaround change in your life. You're not the same person that walked down the aisle. And if you are, when the altar call is given today, you might consider doing it again. I don't want to take your salvation away from you. But I don't want to give you any false hope either. The judgment's too close and too important. And I believe that when you give your heart to the Lord and you repent, you're a different creature. You're not the same person. And Nikki Cruz changed in that picture. And according to astrology, and as I told people last night at a youth rally, there's three things required to cast a spell. Herbs, Jewelry and talismans, which we'll talk about in a minute, and astrology. And you can't cast spells without astrology. That's why astrology was invented. And according to the doctrine of astrology, you are a set sign, a set personality. You are born that way, you are destined that way, and nothing you're going to do is going to change your personality. Except Nikki's changed. And as the movie ended and I got up and walked out of there, it just had destroyed every doctrine that I had ever learned. I walked out of there and I said, boy, these Christians are weird. I tried to convince myself that couldn't have really took place. Because I'd never seen any Christians that acted like they were Christians except the guy who walked in it, and I couldn't get him out of my mind either. I walked out and I was about to meet my third Christian. He walked up. All the people were walking out. He said, he, I talked with him later. He didn't know who I was. He just felt directed to do it. Walked up and he handed me a track. I was the only one he handed one to. He didn't say anything. He said, here, this is especially for you. Turned around and walked off. That was the end of it. It was special for me, too. It was called Bewitched. Couldn't have handed me a better one. I went looking through it. I think 90% at that time struck me as being real, but I discarded it because it said that the devil was real. And I just couldn't believe the devil was real. So I threw the track away and I went on back. Started to go to my apartment, decided to go into one of our nightclubs down below in the city called the Club Aquarius. And what, well, I mean, what else would you call witchcraft club? You know, Club Aquarius. Walked in the back, locked the manager's office, and sat down by myself and started thinking things out. I wanted to talk with a Christian and find out if what they believed was the same things I had been taught they believed, which is a world of difference. The only problem is that we had paid and bribed and blackmailed so many ministers in the area that I didn't know who we could call. Because if I got a hold of the wrong one, I could end up getting killed. Because they'd report me. So I sat for a while and I thought it over. And finally I remembered that the night before, one of the witches had come in complaining about a coffee house called the Greengate Club. Now this coffee house is a very, very strange place. It had been a burlesque parlor. So a minister went in one night jumped up on the bar and shut the strippers off. He wasn't too polite about it. He didn't get polite with the devil. He started preaching the gospel. About 15 minutes later, the strippers had pulled the curtains down off the wall and wrapped them around their bodies and were kneeling down in front of the bar, giving their heart with the Lord. 
along with half of the customers, the men and women that own the place, the band, and the bartenders. About 30 people saved in 15 of a good old-fashioned revival. Now, the people's lives were so changed that they gave the deed to the place to one of the Baptist churches. One of them that was praying and fasting that Lance Collins would get saved. It was all shaping up. But I didn't know that. All I knew was that this witch that was a prostitute had come in screaming at the top of her lungs when I was going through a draw and wasn't interested in hearing it. Bought this place down the street. How she tried a proposition of soldier down by the bus station. Here they wouldn't be preaching the word of God at them at the same time. To bankrupt you. To really put you out of business. She was very unhappy about it. But I went in there. Two in the morning. Got up to the door and it said closed. Twelve. You know, midnight. I said, well, you know, Christians are funny people, maybe. And I pulled on the door. It opened. I went inside. There's one guy in there, toolbox on the thing, bent over trying to fix this Coke fountain. See, the Coke fountain had broke just about the time they were going to close, and he decided to stay behind and fix it. That's the way the Lord has to treat some Christians. He has to break things in their lives to keep them in one place long enough to do his will. But he stayed there, and I walked in. I, he looked up and says, oh, can I help you? And I said, yeah. He looked at me and says, yeah, I think you need some help. He yeah, had to see me. I was with some brothers the other day, and one of the girls that I used to live with in witchcraft walked right by the car, looked right in the car, and didn't even recognize me. Now, that's what I mean. When the Lord changes you, I believe he changes you. And I walked in, I sat down, and he started witnessing to me, and got nowhere with his witnessing. And finally, I got to the point that I was in witchcraft, you know, I told him about it. After he caught his breath about 20 times, he picked up the phone and called the pastor. It was only 3 in the morning. And you know that would be very weird. Nobody ever calls the pastor for prayer at 3 in the morning. <laughs> so he called the pastor and he explained. He says, oh, that, yeah, that's Lance Collins. We've been praying for him a while. You know, and they started acting, I think, the way that they must have acted when they prayed Peter out of jail. He arrived at the door. They couldn't believe that it was taking place. So they, he said, well, I'll call up a bunch of people and I'll pray, we'll start praying for him. You go back and you witness. They witnessed some more and it wasn't getting anywhere. He was doing the standard witness and it just wasn't reaching me. I just wasn't receiving what he was saying. And finally, he stopped and he said, Lord, give me the sermon in this matter. Give me knowledge. Give me a scripture of your word that will do something that will break the devil's hold on this man. I heard the prayer. Oh, boy, this guy's weird. Here he goes talking about the devil again. And he got 2 Timothy 1.7. And he opened it and he read it to me. And I gave my heart to the Lord. It was too good of a promise to pack up. I spent... All my life, in fact, I guess from the time I was five years old, in a world of absolute total fear, and, when, and also all the guilt. In fact, my mother, at that very moment, was in a mental hospital. She is so barred out on barbiturates now, even though she's out of the mental hospital, that she doesn't even know who she is most of the time. And it's because of the fear and the guilt of the things that she's done. And when he said the Lord would make my mind new, and take away the fear. I said, that's it. Show me now how to get it. And we knelt down and we prayed. And I accepted the Lord. And I said, Jesus, I want your forgiveness. But can you take the guilt and the fear away? And I got up out of there and talk about no fear. I went out of there and almost got myself killed because I didn't have any fear. I still don't have the fear today. And if anybody should have a fear, it's somebody that came out of the Illuminati. I don't have the fear today. And that's why we're having our rehabilitation center now. We're trying to take the fear out of people's lives and teach them that Jesus can make them anew. We have a center that we're opening tomorrow. It's very funny. The doors of the center aren't even opened yet, and it's already filled. There's cars coming from the East Coast. In fact, the most second most powerful witch that has ever been saved was just saved last April after I left the East Coast. Her testimony is almost similar to almost everything I've given today about the Rothschilds and the politics and Charles Manson and other things that she knows about. And she's coming out here to go through rehabilitation. I'm going to put her through just as fast as we can and get her out and get some tapes made on her and let the world know there's another nut out there saying the same thing. But we've got, like one girl moved in last night as we were moving the furniture into the place, we moved one for rehabilitation in. And it'll just... This fill up. In fact, we'll probably have to start believing now for another six months for another building. 
But these buildings are necessary because when a person is saved out of the occult, out of the Illuminati, a contract is placed upon their head where professionals, not amateurs, are looking for them. The summit has some very good professional people. And they'll send them after to kill you. So we try to guard these people and protect them for a period of time so they're able to stand on their own two feet. He said, well, what about me? Why had some loving Christians around that had sense enough to hide me out till I was able to come out of it and was able to stand on my own two feet and know how to protect myself and stay alive and so on. My wife, when she was saved, the same thing was done for her. And now we're believing that hundreds will get saved because the fear will be taken out of their lives. So we ask you to pray about it with us. And right now, this car is going to be leaving in a little while from come across several thousand miles from Maryland to California. About three, four people that have been saved out of the occult will be in the car along with bodyguards. They may seem to think that's kind of funny, except there'll be a 100,000 people trying to collect the bounties on those kids between here and there. It's not funny at all. It'll be a miracle if they get here, but I serve a God of miracles. And I ask you to pray that that car gets here with all of its occupants in absolute safety, protected by the blood of Jesus. Okay, we're going to go for some questions and answers here real quick. I'm sure I probably stirred a few up in your mind. And if you'll just lift your hand, a man will walk back with a microphone, take the question. Back here, the lady in red. Or brown? Yeah, brown. All the way in the back. Lift your hand up high so you can see. My question was, I mean, it's not a question. I know, I know what, uh, when he was mentioned, uh, uh, revivals and things that saved him. I know they do because my daughter is married to a minister and I was saved and I know what Jesus can take out devils and demons and on revivals and things and people can be saved because I was. Okay, let's stay, let's stay with questions so we can sit and think right here, young man, real quick. Stand up so he can see you because he can't see your hands walking around so much. Could you explain the Rothschilds? The Rothschilds? The Rothschilds are a family. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen the three little globes that hang around the pawn shop as the emblem of a pawn shop. That comes from three acorns off the Rothschilds family crest. They were money lenders to begin with in Austria and they became, which they are now, the largest, the richest family in the world. They are not considered humans by the occult world. They're considered gods. They believe that gods, sons and daughters of Lucifer, dwell in these human bodies. And when the humans die, the Rothschilds die, they go into the next Rothschild born. And they're not to be treated as men. They're to be treated as gods. And believe me, they are treated as gods. Their word is absolute law. That's the Rothschilds. They created, they founded the Illuminati. And they, not, many people can't understand why a family of Rothschilds 200 years ago, it's actually, been, it's actually three because they existed 100 years before their birth date, would create a conspiracy for a takeover that they never hoped to see fulfilled. But that's because witches believe in reincarnation. And they believed that they would be alive during that time to see it happen. This may seem funny to your ideas, but when you're raised in it, it's absolute truth to witchcraft people. Right here. <coughs> I'm going to use this, yes, just a minute. Um, Friday at, at, in chapel at school, you said people that were involved in Hollywood and music and things like that were somehow involved in witchcraft. Do you mean that they were actual practicing witches to be popular today, or did they just have to go along with it? And also, does that include things like all forms of entertainment, such as um, different parts of the country, country music and Broadway and New York and things like that? Well, <clears throat> there's a scattering of it through country music. I guess probably the leader of it in country music is a man named Tom T. Hall. But uh, in rock music, you must be an initiated witch, a COVID member. That means you're a minister, okay? To be, and anybody in the last two years that's come on television must be an initiated witch. Three of the major soap operas on TV have now made it a fact that to be a member of their staff, their television, you know, actors and actresses, on these three major soap operas, you must bear the scar of initiation to be on. Okay? That's why the leading one, the young and restless, is so popular. Okay? Now, that's, if you, any of the new shows coming on, you can just check them off. Those people belong to a witchcraft or Satan's brotherhood somewhere or they wouldn't be there. Okay? And eventually they'll get all the older ones out that got in there, do different things you had to do back. You've always had to do something. You're not on television or in the movies because you're good. 
You're there because you paid a price, whatever the producer wanted from you. Now, it's witchcraft. In the early 70s and late 60s, it was homosexuality. And before that, it was the producer's couch and so on. Okay? But now it's witchcraft. All right? Uh, yeah, two things. Uh, first off, you were talking about the Rothschilds. There's a book that I just read I'd like to recommend to anyone who's interested in the international banking. It's called None Dare Call It oh, Conspiracy. Conspiracy. And that really explains it in the context of what's happening in the world today. And secondly, I would like to know about the witchcraft. What about these uh, cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the Mormons? Uh, stuff like that. Can you tell tell us what influence that? Well, the closest to witchcraft is the Mormons because their Bible so resembles passages from the Book of Shadows, but which is the witchcraft Bible. But see, here's the thing about the cult and so on. We we have a mailing list. I mean, a post office box, and people write in, communicate with. There are so many thousands of cults, and most of them go to the skies of Christian churches today that are teaching this var variation from the Word of God and this variation and so on. And the thing here is that I firmly believe is there's one way to the Lord Jesus Christ, or to the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ in Calvary. That's the only way, through repentance, through a born-again experience. But with the devil, there's always but one. And all these cults are to serve one purpose, to keep your eyes off of Calvary, the only way to make it. And that's why all the television and all the literature out today is so down on the Christians for only one reason. That they try to say they're the only way. They're not saying they're the only way. The Lord Jesus Christ is saying he's the only way. And they try and put you down because you believe that repentance and the blood of Jesus is the only way there. Okay? But it is. And that's why certain well-known ministers today are trying to become popular and say, well, it's possible to make it to heaven other ways. Well, the Bible said there'd be idiots like that in the last days. Yes. The age of Aquarius, you said, was like 1980, right? Mm-hmm. And you said that um, the man called Adam would be the Antichrist in mm -hmm. whatever, uh, the covenant or whatever. Well, they believe he'll be the world okay. dictator. It's getting yeah. pretty close to 1980. Yes, it is. Uh, do you have any idea or, you know, who it might be? Cause his name was most... mentioned, but I'm not going to give his name. Okay. Too many of you wouldn't believe me, and I've already lost happy anyway. I want to keep the rest of you through the service. Okay? Yeah. Listen, I'll just say this. I had to put up with all of the uh, Christians running around for about five years telling me how Dr. Kissinger was going to be the Antichrist. I had to turn away and go, <laughs> because I knew better. Okay? But remember, what, who I'm saying it is doesn't mean that that's who it is. That just means that the Illuminati is going to do everything they can to make him the world ruler. Okay? But the way this country is going, and since Christians won't turn and seek the face of God and repent, and God can't save the country because they won't fulfill Second Chronicles, I would say he's probably going to be right on schedule. Yes, I had a, a question about your sister. You said that uh, she was more advanced in witchcraft than yourself. No. At, at, or at one no. time? No, no. She, she was given a position faster than I was. Faster than you Because were. women are given positions faster than men. Women, except in the higher councils, are the leaders. The high priest is in the coven, but he's only the enforcer. The high priest is, is the pastor. I see. Is she okay. still is she still in the cult? That was the first question. Yes, the other she one? is. She is. Okay. She's, she's one of Philip Rothschild's girlfriends, and she runs messages between Philip Rothschild and David Rockefeller on a regular basis. Okay. And the next question is, uh, you met your wife when she was a member of the cult, mm -hmm. and that must have been an awkward situation. Did you leave first? Or did you leave she together? My wife after she got saved. She took my sister's place as witch queen in the state of Ohio and owned the second largest occult store in the country. And she got saved in one of the meetings. And after going through rehabilitation and so on, we got married. Okay? And before you take any questions, let me do something here real quick. Because we're running out of time here. I spoke with your teenagers here at chapel, and I told them about a plan of the occult to place certain objects in Christians' homes to be able to put demonic influences into the home and tear down the home and the Christian prayer life and place rebellion and depression and suicide upon Christians. Now you may think, well, I'm a Christian. That's impossible. Listen to me. When you take something that belongs to the devil into your possession, 
you're asking for trouble. All right? The Holy, the, the Bible, the Word of God was wholly inspired by the Holy Ghost. All right? Nobody, I think, will argue with me that's a born-again Christian, at least. Certain objects are inspired by the spirit of Satan, by demonic influence. Rock music. If witches can't cast spells on witches, they got, I mean, on, on Christians, they got smart. They'll let the Christians cast the spells on themselves. The witches will quote the spells in rock music, and they'll let the Christians play them, and they keep casting spells over and over on themselves. That's why rock music. Now, you may think that's garbage, but the witches believe it. And I believe it, because I've seen it done. That's why rebellion and drugs and the sexual revolution have sweeped your children, and you try to shelter them from it by sending them to a Christian school, and then you let the world be brought into your homes in the form of rock music. But they didn't just want the kids. They wanted the adults. They pretty well got them with the soap operas. But they decided that they would put their most powerful object in witchcraft into the hands of Christians. First, they changed the names to make them look innocent. They didn't call them hexagrams and pentagrams and pentacles and leprechaun's horns and, and stuff like that anymore. They didn't call it the Ong or anything like that. They changed their name to things like just stars and, and crescents and crosses of lives so they could sell them in Christian bookstores and so on. In fact, that would probably surprise them that they would start selling them in Christian bookstores. They decided to sell them through their conglomerates first, and they used federal department stores, which owns most of the department stores that you ladies and gentlemen shop at. And the one that's not owned by federal department stores is Montgomery Wards, and it's owned by Standard Oil. So it's owned anyway. And then they wanted to go into all the rest of the homes that maybe wouldn't pick them up in the jewelry stores. So they used one of their largest companies. And if we have any distributors of this company I'm going to name, don't you come to me, because I've got a stack of testimony of how distributors... When they first started selling this, depression set in their home, their marriages broke up, and three or four people actually tried to take their own lives and fit the depression that they didn't understand, and these were born-again Christians. And then when they heard about this, they destroyed the stuff, and they've never had any of this in their home since. All the depression left, all the marriage troubles left, and the thoughts of suicide left. So I've got the testimony, so don't come and tell me about it. Those are the first three. Now this jewelry I'm going to show you, except the second two pieces, could not be bought in a store until a few years ago. You stop and think about it when you started seeing this stuff. To buy these symbols here, you had to go to a, a, an occult store. Of course, that was easy for San Francisco. They've always been a little weird. But you'd go to the occult stores, but you had to prove that you were initiated witch of a coven before they would sell this stuff to you, and it was made by their coven silversmith. The first one's called a pentacle. If you put a circle around it, it's called the pentagram. It's a symbol of witchcraft. At one point up, it's the symbol of witchcraft. Two points up, like it's showing kind of there, it's the symbol of Satanist church. The symbol of the horn god. You might also notice it's also the symbol of the eastern star. We were in San Francisco last night, and in the building that the Illuminati houses there, the Rothschild's private enforcer, Isaac Bonowitz, he's like a living computer, he's also one of the members of the council that I left, in the store down below, which sells many pieces of occult jewelry, they sell ladies' compacts with eastern stars embedded in them, with all the little runes and so on. This is called the hexagram, not the Star of David. The Star of David is a name change on it. David was dead and buried when that star was created by a son that had backslid and went into demonic worship. Solomon would seal his documents of war and his occult documents with that thing. They call it the Crest of Solomon or the hexagram. And that's where the word to hex or to cast an evil spell came from. Witches, when they conjure demons, they call the demons up to talk to them in person, this star must be drawn on the floor for the demon to arrive in or it won't appear. Now that gives you an idea. It's the most evil sign in the occult world. This symbol in various forms means that you're an initiated witch of witchcraft. And if you'll watch television, well, I'm sure you do. If you watch television you'll notice that many of the television stars are now wearing this symbol openly. Why not? Christians don't know what it means. you also notice it was a sign of the Shriners, too. This one up above is being sold. Oh, well, this one. Oh, well. Somehow, there we go. Let me get out. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work. There we go. Hey, we got it worked out. The first one's called the Yonk. They call it the Cross of Life now, it's done in Christian bookstores and so on. The Cross of 
wife of the Ankh comes from Egypt, means that you are a worshiper of Ra, the sun god. That's the Egyptian name for Lucifer. So it means that you worship Lucifer. It means that you despise virginity, that you're against virginity, that you practice orgies, and that you believe in reincarnation. That means that you don't believe in heaven or hell, that when you die you're going to come back again, and the word of God is a lie because it says you'll live once and then judgment. But they say no. The next is the broken cross, the peace sign. It didn't originate in Frisco or London during the peace movement. It's been around a long time. We've heard a lot of cracks about it, you know, the footprint of American chicken and all this type of thing. This is what it is. When a member wants to be, when a person wants to become a member of witchcraft, and they come from a Christian background, there, I didn't have to take this initiation because I was born into witchcraft. They're given a cross made out of ceramic clay, you know, baked clay, and it's turned upside down, and they take the crossbars and they break, it, forcing the crossbars down and break the crossbars off, and they throw the pieces to the floor and shatter it. And the priest or priestess, whoever's doing the initiation, then announces, "You are free from the bondage of the Christian Church." And because of this act, you shall have peace evermore. Thus, the peace sign. It's called the broken cross. This one you're not going to find until about a year from now. Anybody ever seen this symbol before? Everybody wants to... <laughs> you're right. 666. It's three overlapping sixes. Okay, here's where you can find it. You can find it on the world currency printed out of Brussels. We bought $10 billion of it, but our president decided that it's better to go with the credit card than the currency now, so we're not going to use it. You'll find it in clothing and shoes made in the common market countries, in the labels of the clothing. More recent, about a year ago, it was on national television, when the president of the United States, you know, the peanut eater from Georgia, well, I mean, you know, and that's about the best I can do for him. I could say more. Said he had personally designed a national security card that would be the answer to the problems in the United States. And that every citizen, law-abiding citizen, would have one of these cards to prove they were a law-abiding citizen. You know, whatever. Then, he got done making a speech, he left, his press secretary came up and says to the newsman, here's a picture. Now, for some reason, with all the flashballs popping and stuff, that card, this picture, never got printed in the paper. I don't know why. Maybe they decided it was a bad move. But in the center of the card was a pearl white glossy card, computer plastic type. In the center, in kind of a gray with words written over it, you know, but in the background, you know, like a watermark, was this emblem. Welcome to the last generation. They're putting their forces together. Now, the California National Guard has switched to this patch recently. It, there's a circle of three arrows coming out of it on their behalf. We've known that Florida, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and about six other states have switched to it this year. We've been told by the end of the year that all the National Guard in the United States will wear one patch. They've all, at the first of this year, were hooked into a computer in Dallas called the National Security Computer. That's who they call up, by the way, when they check out your Visa cards or your Bank of America cards or whatever the case may be. Now, if you've been going to the grocery stores and the department stores, you've been noticing the new computer cash registers. The, you know, one shopping step type cash registers and you put your card in it and ring up the purchase and it does all the business for you right then and there. Well, all the stores are supposed to switch over to them and the little poor stores are supposed to get the little phone unit that hooks into your phone and you zip the card through. This is all supposed to happen in the next year. Right on time schedule, just like it should be. Then, things will be a little different around here because by then they plan on destroying the money that you have and then you'll have to use the card because the money will be worthless. Now if you think, you've, if you've been noticing all the television commercials, security is the word that everybody's been using on television commercials. Prepare for the future, pack up for security this and security that. And then they're going to turn around and they're going to wipe your security off the face of the man. I'm going to destroy that microphone before it's over. Now if I'm stepping on your little safe world, I'm sorry. I'm trying to tell you something in advance. And I'm going to give you a reading list so you don't think I'm the only nut in the world. The first book is None Dare Call Conspiracy. I'm going to give these quick and then I'll take a few questions. We've got a few minutes and that's it. The next is The Rockefeller Files. And the last one is Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter. Now, those can be found in most bookstores. They're by Gary Allen. But I recommend one that you find in the Christian bookstore. 
It's called the day the dollar dies. You might decide to invest the financial money that you're saving in your savings account that will be worthless before this year is out in the work of God. I'm serious. It will be worthless before this year is out. This time next year, the time schedule they have, I'll give you a few events. I'm not prophesying. I'm giving you physical knowledge. You may think I'm crazy. They thought I was crazy back in 1972 when I said we were going to have a fuel shortage. They thought I was crazy back in 1973 when I said watch for the coal mines to close. So you may think I'm crazy, but next year when it's all happening, at least I told you in advance. You got a little bit of warning. There'll be 10 million people out of work this time next year. Now that's when our welfare system, unemployment system, and social security system goes collapse because it won't be able to handle that many people out of work. And you may want to go home and pray and ask yourself what this country's going to be like with 10 million people not eating and not having any money. And then you may want to pray that a lot of souls get one and Jesus comes quickly. I know I'm going to. Okay, I'll take some questions and answers. Let's just go without the microphone so we can do it quickly, and I'll, I'll try to repeat the question. <laughs> I believe you. Go ahead. Silver and gold coins, and, and uh, I forget the South African coin, and so on and so on. Okay. Yeah, huh? Kudaran. Okay. Real quickly, I heard everybody in the world described as the Antichrist. That's why I'm not giving my opinion along with it. Okay? Yes, I've heard about him. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about him. And as for your silver and gold coins, okay, how are you going to spend them if you're not allowed to spend them? You understand what I'm trying to say? Okay. All the silver and gold in the world, you're right. You do have the right idea. The only system that will exist then is either the government no-cash system or a barter system between people, okay? That's why people like Tom Berry, myself, Joe Boyd, and other ministers across the country are now telling people to prepare for a barter system, okay? You can make it till the Lord comes on the barter system. But gold and silver is the wrong way to go, okay? I take your gold and silver if you've got it stored up and invest it in the barter system real quick. Because even if you could spend gold and silver, okay, the barter system would still work even better. Because they've got to have goods. The number one most valuable item will be one that is illegal and almost impossible to obtain at the time, called a firearm, a gun. The next will be ammunition to go in that gun, and then dehydrated and freeze-dried food, or canned goods. Okay? Well, water will probably be the most expensive item in existence. Okay? They've got a few surprises for the drinking system that you now have. Okay? Next question. Back here. All the way in the back. Do you? Yeah. Yes, he is. Is the Antichrist in politics was the question? Yes, he is. Yes, he's in American politics. Yes. Well, we've won quite a few Jehovah Witnesses. I'm not saying that this will win them, but you could try one question. It usually starts the ball rolling. What tribe are you a member of? You'd have to understand their doctrine, but it really starts with stuttering and stammering. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm against the Catholic Church for one reason, okay? It's because when I was in, well, it's two reasons. When I was in the Catholic Church, the occult world received a sanction from Pope Paul that white witchcraft was permissible for Catholics to practice. And second, I can watch Catholic Mass. I can go in and write our Masses down, our rites and witchcraft, and let you read them as they go through them in the Catholic Church. Most, most, of, most of the doctrine, the doctrine of the saints, the doctrine of the mighty ones in witchcraft. The doctrine of the wine being turned to blood, that's in witchcraft, okay? Uh, the doctrine almost of everything, the altar, the minus the night, is the only thing missing on the Catholic altar from the witchcraft altar. And in some countries, not America, the, the, not the night, but the scourge, which is also on the uh, witchcraft altar, is laid on the Catholic altar. And most of all the doctrines, the doctrines of the, the virgins, the, the nuns, the doctrines of the priesthood, and, and so these are all come from the temples of Diana in Rome and were invested into the Christian church at the Nicene Council. Okay? It was back when the witches got smart. They said, if we can't beat them, we'll join them. And they've been doing it ever since. Yes. Well, there's a book coming out. Okay? Called The Angel of Light. All right? 
And in it, it compares the Mormons, the Masonic, and the witchcraft doctrines. And they're almost all three. They're like triplets, okay? It'll be from Chick Publications in the form of the Crusader comic books. It'll be out in about two months when the artwork's done. Watch your Christian bookstore for it. I get a feeling it's going to win more Masons and more Mormons out of the occult world than anything has ever done before. Because it quotes from some of the most inner books of the Mormons and Masons. The problem with the Mormons and Masons is they live on that secrecy thing. You never know what the inner circles are doing. So this book brings the inner circles to the outer circle. And boy, it's going to open some eyes, too. I want to see the Masons stutter and stammer around when they read out of their own books that Jesus Christ is the God of evil and Lucifer is the God of good. And then I want them to tell me that the Masons are a Christian organization. Yes? I can't hear you. You mean the Salem witchcraft crowd? Okay, there's another book coming out from Chick Publications as soon as the Angel of Light gets out. It'll be out in about a year if the world hangs around that long. And it's called Mancho, and it's on the Salem Witchcraft Trial. Now, I went back there because my family, the Collins family, is credited of building the Salem Church, building the building. So I went back there, and I kind of conned myself in, half prayer, half conning, into the Ethics Museum Library where the original manuscripts are. And I went through the original manuscripts. Except for one prostitute, every person executed in the Salem witch crowds was not a Puritan, but a born-again Christian. They were from a group across the river that had separated from the Puritan church, and the pastor there was preaching the born-again experience. And that this one thing that would upset a witch is having a bunch of freaky Christians next door to him. So they hung him. Considering the pastor wasn't a pastor that, that had the Salem church, he was a slave trader. That's a matter of history. The Collins had built the church, and it was the first American witchcraft coven. So why were they going to hang real witches? Of course not. And it comes out really plain. And one of the main charges was that the Christians across the river were reading from the book of Revelation. And that was against the law. Okay? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know it was that sloppy. Uh, and another, uh, my boy went to your, went to your uh, meeting on this Friday. And he spoke that you had to take part in your sacrifice. Is this the case? Why are you dead? Those are good questions. One, I'm packing a weapon because I've had so many attempts on my life. Okay? I don't, I know some Christians can't understand a Christian having a weapon. The same Christians have never had their families and themselves shot at dozens of times. I've got a wife and children and myself. And I might as well go ahead and say at the refuge house the way that those people are going to stay alive is because the workers all pack weapons within the house. Now, before that was done, we had one other refuge house. Three people were machine gunned to death in the house. That's why I pack a weapon. Okay? Next. I don't, I obey the laws of California. The weapon's on me when I'm in the church. When I leave, it goes in the trunk of my car. Okay? But, uh, we take so many different routes. <laughs> They're gonna have a hard time finding me when I leave the church. Now, I wanna go up with this a little more and then I'll ask your other question. There are many ministers today that are packing guns. All contracts on their life. All well-known ministers. One of the most well-known ministers in the country today is Jack Howes. Jack probably won't win when he's here. He'll trust the churches to have security for him while he's here. We had to when he was down at our home church a couple weeks ago. In fact, several of the people that are guarding me today guarded Brother Howes as bodyguards when he was there. But he preaches behind a bulletproof podium, and two bodyguards escort him all over the place when he's in Hammond. There's been that many attempts on his life. Tom Berry, Joe Boyd, they go armed all the time. Okay? Now... Chick Publications, after doing The Broken Cross, the book that I wrote, had to move into a building with bulletproof glass in the windows. And when you drive up to the building, you'll still see the bullet holes in the windows where they tried to go ahead and shoot them anyway through the windows. Now, that is the real world out there when you start dealing with the occult. Next, the human sacrifice thing. I did. I went, gave all the information to the FBI. I told them what senators were involved. I mean, the man who handed me the knife to do the ritualistic killing was a United States senator that ran for president named McGovern. I gave the times, the dates. I said where weapons are stored. Now, this will give you an idea. Right now, and we have one witness back here who saw several trucks with thousands of machine guns and thousands of grenades unloaded two weeks ago in a storage place five miles from our home church up to Panga Canyon. We notified the alcohol, tobacco, and farms, the county sheriff, and the local police. It's still there, with more weapons being moved in every day. When we told the FBI, I had four ministers with me. They said, well, for turning this information in, 
and they didn't give it to me in writing, you have community and all this, and they walked out, you know, we walked out, so, oh, good, we're really going to do something to the Illuminati. We can just see McGovern walking in the handcuffs. Call back two weeks later, they denied they ever talked to us. Now, that's the real world, okay? Now, if it happens th- several times, they've tried to get, get grand juries, we try to get grand juries going. And all the only person they ever wanted to indict was me. So we've now learned that if they ever try to do that again, when we go in, we just bring a lawyer along with us. I don't mind going down, you know, uh, as long as the Illuminati goes with it. But they won't. Because you're talking about presidents and senators and FBI agents and everything else. I turned down preaching in a church in this area because two FBI agents were present. Nothing against the pastor or the congregation because it has a fine reputation as a church. I wouldn't go there for that reason. Because two years ago, we tried to get a grand jury, a federal grand jury, to indict two FBI agents that were spotted by dozens of people openly trying to kill me, shooting at me, almost at point blank range. Guess what happened? Nothing. Okay? Next question. One more question. Way in the back. With the call? Okay, I'll give you a bombshell you're not going to believe. Kennedy got uh, saved pretty much before his death. That's why they killed him. Okay, I can take about ten minutes, but I don't want to, to explain and prove that, it ha- that that's the truth. But it did happen. In fact, several people, if they were there last night, I went into detail about it. Okay, but it did happen. He was saved down in Tampa, Florida, uh, through a man that helped arrange the Bay of Pigs that became a Christian a few months earlier, and then witnessed to him along with a couple of ministers, and he gave his heart to the Lord. And they tried to call him back. The Pope even ordered him into a private audience a month before his death and ordered him to take mass, and Kennedy walked out of the place refusing mass. The lady might give that to her husband. Okay? But that's why. Okay, Pastor, it's all yours. All right, I need some help up here. Dan, perhaps a couple of you fellows can remove some of this and bring the pulpit up here. We appreciate your your kind attention, and I realize there's still a lot of questions that that you have. This is uh, not the typical church service that we've, we've had, but we feel that God's people need to be made aware of some of these things that are taking place. Very good experience to find yourself being told that you're not quite there yet on 680, so you keep on going, and you end up in San Jose. And then you turn around and try to rush back. But uh, somehow the Lord got us here. Everything that could have been thrown against us on the road was car trouble and everything else, so we're very grateful to be here. I kept saying over and over as I prayed going down the road, uh, that this had to be something tonight, some type of fantastic meeting, because usually when we're this well thought getting to a place, something's going to take place. So I came in expecting something. I'm sure you were expecting to leave as late as it is. But um, if you must go, as they said, go ahead. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, bear with me. I'll try not to keep you too long. The only complaint that my pastor has against me is that I'm long-winded. And the only complaint that another pastor had last Sunday night was that I wasn't long-winded enough. He wanted to go to 11. And I promise not to keep you that late. But anyway, uh, I don't fool around, so I'll just uh, start right out. I can only make you one promise that what I've got to say is the truth. It won't seem that way to some of you. It always just seem that I'm either crazy or I'm the biggest liar and, and storyteller in the world. That's what our televisions have done to us. They've gotten us to a plane of mind that we do not realize the real world around us. When I talk in many youth rallies, many of the Christian schools, I start right out by tearing their television and rock idols down by personal experiences that I've had with them in the occult world. And then from there we try to build them up with real heroes, the number one being Jesus Christ. But uh, I come from a family that, where I grew up having my own heroes. My number one hero was my great, 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 somewhere way back there, grandfather, named Francis Collins. Francis Collins owned the first ship that the Puritans landed in here. It just so happened that 50% of the people on board were also witchcraft people fleeing from Scotland. And they were called the Collinses. They were all his family, and that's how all witchcraft came to the United States. So when I grew up, I was being trained how great my family was, that it was the second most important family in the Illuminati and the occult world, and that someday I'd be very important and so on. So I had my own heroes. And television didn't help much. The reason I'm so down on television is I grew up around the television world, on the insides of it. When I was just a teenager, 
Hollywood paid for my way out to California so that I could bring a couple of diaries that uh, belonged to my family that I had inherited by will as the last male heir of the Collins family. If you wonder why that fits with Todd's, the Collins family changed their name about a hundred years ago to Todd to cover up some of the things that they had done. But I'm sure some of you will remember the show Dark Shadows. That was the show that paid for me to come to Hollywood to bring the diaries. Many of the scripts were taken from actual instances in the diaries. And, for instance, Barnabas Collins was based upon a man named Prince Williams Collins, a Revolutionary War hero. When I was growing up in the occult world, we were always taught that we had been somebody else before. It wasn't good enough that we were the person we were now. We always had to be a dozen people that we were before. We had to deal with this life and all the ones we were supposed to have had before and all the ones we were going to have in the future. And I was supposed to be in France Williams Collins. So I said that's who they based Barnabas on, so I wasn't exactly the nicest guy in the world. I grew up this way. When I was 13, I was taken into what is called the outer court to be trained as a priest in witchcraft. That had been like your pastor who just stepped off or better yet, more like the youth director or something. When I was 18, I was initiated a high priest. That would have made me the pastor. At the same time, I became draft exempt. I did not have to go into service, but a bunch of us smart aleck young, I have to correct the pastor, not warlocks, but wizards and witches, went into the army because we felt the army really needed witchcraft. It just couldn't get along without us. And since the army didn't think that they needed any chaplains that were witches, we just kind of went in on our own. So I went on in, along with a lot of others, and I never did anything, I guess, halfway. I got in Vietnam, found out I liked Vietnam so well, I was willing to re-enlist. In fact, I'd already signed the papers to stay for another tour in Vietnam when I became wounded in the last month of the first tour, and I was shipped back to the United States. My time was almost up, so I was discharged, and the same day I re-enlisted. I asked for Vietnam, and they said because of my wounds that hadn't totally healed yet, I couldn't go to Vietnam yet, so I got Germany. Now, I had re-enlisted for six years. And until the time of my re-enlistment, I always thought that witchcraft was just witchcraft. There was nothing more to witchcraft than just casting spells and that we were smarter than the Christians and other religions because we really knew who the gods were and we were born with special powers because our ancestors had passed them down to us and all the little stories they liked to tell us. Witchcraft was a little different at that time when I first got into it as a, teen, I was a young person. You had to be from a family that had generations after generations of witchcraft. In order to be a COVID member at the time, you had to have three generations at least. While the minimum that I had that we could find was seven. So there wasn't any problem, and we knew it went past that where there weren't records kept anymore. But uh, that was all witchcraft was. As I tell many people when, you know, many of you were raised as Christians, and I guess that's why I can't understand why some of the Christian teenagers are the way they are today if they were raised in this glorious gospel, why they're so rebellious. I would have given anything to have been raised this way. But uh, when you were learning the 23rd Psalm, I was learning the witch's chant. When you were reading about Moses opening the Red Sea, I was reading J.R.R. Tolkien. When you guys were re uh, learning uh, different memory verses and so on and the four spiritual laws and the Ten Commandments, I was happy to read C.S. Lewis. Of course, I've been greatly surprised that Christians read that too. But uh, this is the way I grew up, and this is all I believed in was just that there were mighty gods and we were special people. We were their priests and priestesses until I re-enlisted. I went to Germany, spent a month home, went to Germany, spent another month, two months out of a six-year enlistment. One night while taking drugs and drinking, I shot and killed an officer in downtown Stuttgart. Now, if there's one thing that the Army does not like, it does not like its sergeants killing its officers. They have a quick cure for that. They threw me in solitary confinement. And as the court-martial proceeded on, and things began to look like I was going to spend the rest of my life in Leavenworth, if I was lucky, all of a sudden a riot took place in the stockade, and although I was in solitary confinement, other place, people were placed in the cell with me. One of the men that was placed in the cell with me had been scheduled to get out that particular day and was held because of the riot. So I kind of talked him in by bribing him a little, that uh, if he made a long-distance phone call for me and told certain relatives of mine that I was in trouble, he'd receive some money for it and I'd be a lot happier. So he called, collect to Los Angeles and talked to my foster mother, explained what the situation was. 
And I was sitting back waiting for all, her to get all these big witches together to cast spells on the judges and make all the officers that were trying me think I was a real got nice guy and that it was self-defense and everything was going to be fine. They just let me off. Now, that's all that I had ever been taught that witches could do. But three days later, my cell door opened there in solitary. As I stepped out in the light for the first time in 32 days, I heard some very strange words. You are honorably discharged from the United States Army. And the man that was saying them was a senator by the name of William Saxby. He had a congressman with him named Wiley and about three or four generals. And they were handing me an honorable discharge. And on the discharge papers, it didn't say I was bad. It didn't say that I had been in jail. It didn't say anything. It gave me all my time and rank, security clearances that I had in my possession, and didn't explain why I still had over five years to go in the United States Army. It just discharged me honorably. So as I took it and didn't want to argue with him and left and went back to the States and arrived at my home in Columbus, Ohio, I asked my real mother, I have two mothers, foster mother and a real mother, I said, what type of spell is so good that it makes senators and generals do what you want? And it's a really good spell. I like to learn it. She just looked at me and said, you just don't understand, do you? She said, they're, that what, we didn't cast a spell on them. They're with us. I said, oh, far out. Senators that are witches. She says, no, they just belong to us. And I didn't understand what she was saying. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do now? You know, I'd like to take my old coat and back over and so on. So she handed me an envelope that had been waiting there. She had explained that there was one there and one in Los Angeles. They didn't quite know where I was going to show up. I opened the envelope. Very intriguing thing. $2,000 in $100 bills. A lot of money. Also was a one-way plane ticket to New York City. I said, well, what's this for? She said, well, you make a reservation. You get on the next plane. You get out of here and you get to New York City and they'll meet you at the airport. I said, well, who are they? And where did this money come from? She says, you get there and they'll tell you and you'll know who's supposed to meet you when you get there. Now, witches are very curious people. That's why when we do some of the most demonic rites imaginable and our hair would stand on end and almost turn snow white overnight from all the spooky things, we couldn't wait to get back in there. We were always curious what was going to happen the next. I think that's why some of the people get on roller coasters and like to be scared to death. It's just the way with the witches. They really have spooky things going on and they can't wait to get back and this was extremely intriguing. So I got on the plane and I flew to New York and I got off the plane, sure enough, no problem with recognizing who met me. I'd read his books for years. In fact, he's the man who first created Christian witchcraft. His name was Dr. Raymond Buckland, head of the anthropology department, Columbia University. At that time, he isn't now. Graduate of Oxford University, Rhodes Scholar, handpicked by the Rothschilds to lead the Illuminati for him. So I arrived, and he took me to his house, and the next few months, he carefully rearranged all my ideas for me. He told me that all the things that I had learned about witchcraft were just stories that we told the lower people. And where I thought there was only three levels and I was as high and as powerful as a witch could go, he assured me there were three more. I guess I should have backed off then and figured if I was lied to the first time, maybe I'd be lied to the second time. But as I said, witches have an incurable curiosity. They've got to find out everything. So I let him train me. He explained to me that since I was a male Collins, I was in the Collins family, that I had a position to take and that there was a board of directors called the Grand Druid Council, which contained 13 of the most powerful witches in the world, and that my place was on that council. And I said, oh, you know, great. When do I take it? And he said, well, somebody just died. I kind of always wondered if he died or they shot him or something. You never can tell in the Illuminati. But uh, he sent me to Los Angeles. I studied for six more months with my foster mother, holding kind of a temporary rank on this council and then taking up the Colorado Springs and initiated. And I do believe that when I testified here at the last time, I explained who the person was that handed me the ceremonial night for that ceremony, another senator named George McGovern. You might, before the night gets over, start to realize that Washington isn't bad as you thought it was. It's worse. But uh, the ceremony, by the way, was human sacrifice. And the leader of that ceremony that night was George McGovern. That's why when we did the broken cross, we drew his picture into the broken cross as a person practicing human sacrifice. But after the ceremony, I went down to San Antonio and decided that would be the perfect place. And I moved into San Antonio to watch all the drug traffic in the area, and I was given a 13-state area. 
had totaled out to about 65,000 initiated witches and wizards, priests and priestesses. Now that's just the staff of the church. That's not the congregation. So if there's that many ministers in that area, you can imagine what the population is. In California, whereas most of the Grand Druids have many states like I did, I had 13, California has a Grand Druid all to itself because there's that many witches in California. In fact, it's the most populated area in the world for witchcraft. And uh, the Bay Area just happens to have the most. But anyway, this is where I lived. I only left it eight times a year to attend what we called council meetings. Now, to give you an idea, Monday was one of those council meetings. They hold them eight times a year. May 1st, they held a council meeting. And from our information, they held it in San Francisco. So you were kind of close to it this time. Things went along fine. I enjoyed the money par. I always thought they were kind of weird because they kept talking about controlling the world. And I thought, let's stay back with witchcraft, you know, this, this world government thing. You know, they're a little weird. Witches are never going to control the world. And finally, on August the 1st, 1972, things changed. Courier from the London Embassy, a member of our United States State Department, arrived with a courier document pouch sealed with the crest of the State Department, brought it through customs, unopened, nobody could touch it, brought it in to San Antonio, and I was hosting the meeting this time. And it was on Latimus, August the 1st. The man came in, laid the pouch down in the temple room up in the casino building, walked out and left it. He wasn't to know what was in it. The door was locked, security guards were placed on the outside, and Dr. Buckland took up what's called the Atame, the witch's ceremonial night. He slid open the seal, unlocked everything, and took out six letters. We'd seen letters like this before, no big deal. They had the crest of the Illuminati, which is on the back of your one dollar bill, so you can look at it later. On them, sealed in wax, red wax. The only problem was that the first four were standard business. They only contain checks, you know, I, you know, bribe checks and so on. Usually bribe checks start at about $500,000 to give you kind of an idea and work up into the millions. But then they've got almost all the money in the world. Why should they worry? You spend a $5 bill and you panic. For what a $5 bill feels like to you, a million dollars feels like to them. So believe me, they've got the financial strength to do it. The fifth one was totally different. It's very thick, about 30 pages, and it was handwritten. Now, according to the laws of witchcraft, if anything is religious, it must be written in a spatial ink with a dip pen and the person who's writing it own handwriting. Nobody, you know, you don't dictate it. It doesn't get typed up. Nobody writes it for you. Now, in the Illuminati, the Rothschilds are not humans. They're not the, just the richest family in the world. They are gods in human bodies, more, more or less the counterfeit of what Jesus Christ was when he was on the earth. They're the sons and daughters of Lucifer in human body and his wife and so on. So that this council that I was on is the private priesthood of those gods. And when those gods talk, the priests listen and the priestesses listen. Then they tell political people. That's why a handful of witches have so much power over so many political people. Because they're simply just like a tape recorder for some very powerful people that everybody else considers to be holy and to be gods. So we opened this one in Philip Rothschild's handwriting, and it would have been the same to what well, it was like, you know, the God sent their own private message. So we opened it up. Dr. Buckland started reading it. It's a chart. A friend of mine, Dr. Tom Berry, has placed that chart in a 30-page book, and we're proofing it now, and Dr. Stuart Crane is going to publish it, and we hope to have it in Christian's hands in about three months. It's a step-by-step -step plan beginning in 1973, at the first of the year, to the end of 1980, to take over the world by taking over the United States. And before you think that that's impossible, I've watched the news over the past five and a half years, and they're not only on schedule, they're a year ahead of schedule. And when I told people this five years ago, they thought I was crazy, like a lot of people think now. When I told them that we were supposedly not going to have any fuel, although we were going to have it, and that the gasoline prices were going to go sky high, 
I even told them a crazy story that the farmers were going to go on strike and the coal mines were going to close down. Now, I wonder where I could have gotten a crazy idea like that. And I was saying it five years ago. Only when I went on the East Coast this time, nobody was laughing because they were getting cut back on electricity and people were only working 20 hours a week because there wasn't any coal. So after reading this, I thought, hmm, these people are really crazy. You know, crazier and crazier. But I stopped laughing when I read the sixth letter. It was in Philip Rothschild's handwriting, too. Now, before I tell you what's in it, I want to say something. The Mormon doctrine and the witchcraft doctrine are almost identical in how the world began. According to the witches, Lucifer chose his son and his daughter, which were married, to come to the world and lead the rest of his little kids down here. Believe it or not, they're supposed to have landed in a flying saucer. And they landed here, and man was just more or less assuming their shape from apes. And they intermarried with man, and that's how, well, the original people were the witches that arrived, and their children became the witches, and the ones that they didn't marry with are the mortals. If you remember Bewitched, you remember the doctrine of, of witches and mortals. Now, that may seem a little crazy to you, but they firmly believe it. And that Adam, who had the ability to turn back into other lives again, like everybody else did, did not. Because when the evilness of man settled into the garden, and that's why the garden was bad, there's no original sin according to witches. And Lucifer had planned to come and live on this world along with his children, but he couldn't because of all the evilness of man. And when they say that, I almost feel like they want to write Christians sometimes, the, the way the doctrine goes. But Adam would come back to bring peace to the world and to unpollute it so his father could come back. Now, that's their doctrine. And when the sixth letter said, we have found Adam to be in the world and he is ready to make peace so that his father can return. I knew enough about revelations in the Christian Bible to say, hey, I'm in the wrong camp. And I asked a very stupid question at that moment. I said, isn't this in the Christian Bible? Now, witches teach that the Christian Bible is an absolute lie created by the God of evil named Jesus. Okay? So when I asked that, I almost got lynched. Sometimes more or less like the Christians like to do when I'm two hours late. i got to get you to laugh somehow. So I said, well, you know, I'm just kidding. Don't worry about it. I was just joking, trying to lighten things up. They calmed down. I left, did some more drugs. Now, I was doing about $150 a day worth of crystal speed at the time. I weighed about 149 pounds. And I, after looking at some of my rock friends like David Crosby that's doing $200 a day worth of drugs now, I firmly believe that if the Lord hadn't saved me, I probably wouldn't have made it another year. At that time, from August the 1st on, for the next 30 days, I thought of nothing but how to get out. But even though I realized that the Christian Bible was telling the truth, it just never dawned on me because of the spirits inside me that if it was telling the truth in that, then salvation and Calvary were real also. So I went on trying to think of a dozen places I could go hide in this world and marking everyone off that they'd find me any place I'd go and deciding that since, you know, if I died, I'd just come back in another life and that wouldn't be too good if they were running the world, so what was I going to do? Finally, God, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to say that because I come from a world that Lucifer has been God too. Finally, the Lord Jesus Christ started moving for this the best way I know how to put it. I don't believe in accidents. I don't believe that my salvation or anybody else's salvation was an accident. I believe in God incident. I believe that God sets in motion the things to bring you about. You still have the choice. But many of you who don't know him tonight, the Lord brought you here whether you know it or not. Much of you were probably brought here by praying friends and relatives. A man found his daughter, a pastor, by the name of Smith, found his daughter, an initiated witch, shortly thereafter, who had, he told me later, he said, I, I couldn't believe it. Here I was, I went to Baylor University, I was a minister in the Southern Baptist Church, and Baylor did everything, but hit me over the head that there was no devil and no witches and no demons in this day and age, much like many fundamental Bible colleges I know today. He said, so I had to relearn all over again. Instead of taking man's idea, I took the word of God. I found that Deuteronomy 18, 18, 19, and 20 gave a list of witchcraft in the occult world. 
and that Acts 16, 16, 17, 18, and 19 gave the power over witchcraft, what its power was, and how to handle its power and the power over it, which is the taking authority over the devil and the demons that are in witches. That's how they get their power. The stronger the witch, the more demons that they have allowed in. When they take a young person and they train them for witchcraft, they give them what lovingly, I guess, call it homework. They give them assignments that they're to do. And the assignments tear down every moral fiber and training that the person has. And just literally, they become a human chalice. They fill up with demons. As they do these things, they break down all the barriers holding the devil back. And when they're done, they have a very programmed, very brainwashed, and very powerful supernatural witch or wizard. So he prayed and he fasted. I heard Jack Howells the other day. I guess I never realized until I heard him how little Christians pray and fast. He's been around a long time and says he's only met a handful of praying and fasting Christians and I can believe it anymore. But this minister prayed and he fasted. He said, God, let me cross Lance Collins' path. And that was my occult name. He prayed and he prayed and finally he felt this is the time and he got up one morning, Saturday morning, a few days before Labor Day in 1972, and he went downtown and he started going through the occult stores. Now I'm never in the occult, was never in the occult stores there much. And the one building that I lived in, there were two occult stores in that building, downtown San Antonio. One day, one of the managers that Saturday morning had had an overdose of drugs, was critical and couldn't make it in, and I had to go unlock the place for the sales girl to come in. And I just unlocked, got all the cash fixed up and everything, was getting ready to leave, hadn't been there more than about five minutes, and his pastor came in. I knew he was a Baptist the moment he walked through the door. They carried a big black Bible. You have to be in southern Texas to understand. They don't go any place without a big black Thompson or something like that. He carries Schofields up here. They carry Thompsons down there. As one pastor says, I like a rapid-fire Bible. But he came in, and I remember telling Linda, the girl that was with me, oh, boy, here comes trouble. He walked up, and he said, I'm looking for Lance Collins, and kind of braced myself, and I said, I'm Lance Collins. Can I help you? And he said, well, I want to tell you about the love of Jesus. I said, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. You take your Christian garbage and you go somewhere else. I remember the words very distinct. So he started preaching anyway. They figured he was there. He just dug his heels in and opened up. Well, I gave him about two sentences and the spirits in me took over and they started cussing. He just kept on preaching. So I started reciting chants, demonic chants, out to block what he was doing. Usually it got Christians scared and they ran off. He didn't touch. He stopped and he said, well, I see, Ephesians 6, 12, I'm not warring against Lance Collins, I'm warring against the demons inside him. So, since they want to talk to me, I ordered them to be silent in the name of Jesus. And he just started in a very powerful prayer, pleading the blood of Jesus Christ, and finally ending with this. He says, I order, in the name of Jesus, the devil to stop giving you any power of witchcraft, and to stop giving you any of his benefits and took one look at me and saw that I was on drugs and said, and stop giving you drugs. Now, parents, listen to me. If your kids are on drugs and you've got a problem, stop preaching to them. Just order the demon inside them and the devil to stop supplying them the drugs. You'd be surprised, we've done it, how fast the pushers and dealers they're getting their drugs from get busted all of a sudden. Try it. It works. And when he was done, he says, now I'm going to pray and fast for you, Lance, until you get saved. And I, I don't know why I said it. I, I just said, you're crazy. Get out of here. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. I remember I've told dozens of witches, I'm going to pray and fast until you get saved. Don't do that. One thing a demon does not like is prayer and fasting. He turned around. He walked off. One thing that had intrigued me, I, I kept trying to convince myself that I had shut up to listen to him because he was so weird. But what it was, was simply he had taken authority over the demons, and I had shut up, and I had heard the whole thing. I went on upstairs, very shaken and not knowing why, very sick and not knowing why. I'd never felt like this in my life. I'd never come up against a Christian like this. Usually I said, I'm a witch, and they couldn't wait to find the nearest bomb shelter or crawl under the bed. Or get the straitjacket out. Well, something about my eyes back then, they never questioned when I said I was a witch. They just took off running. So I went upstairs, took out my drugs, my needle, did a fix. No problem. 
I had sent all the rest of my drugs out that night, big shipments that we had stored around the area, to other states because we had a huge shipment coming in that night. I said, boy, this will teach that dumb preacher. I ought to go over and drop off a, a kilo of it on his door just to teach him that the devil doesn't exist and I don't get my drugs from the devil and he can't stop me from getting drugs. Besides, there's nothing wrong with drugs. I'm just literally dying eating away from him. There's nothing wrong with drugs. This is how the young people are today. Their friends are overdosing. I've, I've talked with people 14 to 15. I said, how many friends have you, do you lose every year? Oh, 10, 20. They overdose on, on angel dust or something, killer weed, different things. But there's nothing wrong with drugs. I had asked one girl why she was so bummed out. She says, well, this is the fifth girlfriend that's ended up in the mental hospital not knowing who she is from taking acid and having a bad trip. I said, do you take it? She says, sure, but I don't have any bad trips. There's nothing wrong with acid. When I get saved, I didn't have a friend that either wasn't in jail or wasn't dead. It'll do you something to you to walk into your friend's apartment and see him laying on the floor, needles still in their veins, and dead from an overdose or from strychnine being added to the drug because they wanted him out of the way. I went on upstairs, as I said, I did the drug. Not to worry, more drugs coming in. Except midnight, my phone rang and I was still speeding. I, wasn't, I hardly ever slept, hardly ever ate. Answered the phone, and I said, yeah, yeah, what's going on? Private number, I knew it had to be somebody that knew it. And they told me a story that I didn't like too well. We had paid off the Border Patrol. Everything was taken care of, standard run of drugs. Except that night, the ATF had heard that some illegal aliens were coming across the border. They called all the Border Patrol over, you know, from the regular stations, and had put on reserve units. And a guy that was so spaced out, he had sampled a little of pure speed, there was three huge carts about this big, close to a million dollars worth of speed, in the back of the car, just sitting on the back seat with the lid off, where everybody could see it. He wasn't worried. Drove up to the thing, and the guy wheels out a gun and says, you're under arrest. It's all over in a matter of moments. I'm sure he never even realized what happened. It was all because a preacher took authority over the devil. When I got that call, I come flooding back. You know, this guy's weird. You know, here he is stopping my drugs. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, that's just an accident. But it never had happened before. So I realized after, you know, calming down about the situation that I was going to be going through withdrawal pretty soon. So I made some local calls. Nobody had anything. Most people around there were on heroin and not speed. So I made some out-of-state calls and finally found in the state of Ohio some of the drugs that we had sent on had arrived and they would get them down there. But it would be like Tuesday morning because of legal police actions they were having up there. But that's too long for somebody on drugs, as bad as I was. Sure enough, by Monday night, I almost didn't know who I was anymore. Bound and determined that I was going to get drugs no matter what had to be. I got a handgun, went in my car, started the car, started the drive out. I was going to go to every area around that I knew if I had to kill the person, I was going to get drugs. And wrecked the car trying to get out of the parking lot. Just got out of the car, left the gun and everything just sitting there. Started walking down the street kind of in a daze trying to get myself together and came upon a movie theater. Big bright lights attracted me. Just paid my money. Wasn't paying attention to the movie. Nothing. Went on in. Got about three rows back right from the screen. Here was some idiot up there ray waving a Bible all over the place and flash bulbs going off and it was a movie called The Cross and the Switchblade. As I got mad about this what am I into now and stuff, I started getting intrigued with a character named Nicky Cruz. And I guess I probably got everybody in that theater mad at me because I kept yelling at Dave Walker, so stay away from him, preacher, dumb Christian, leave him alone. He's just fine the way he is. All the way through the movie, cussing this guy out and telling him to leave Nicky Cruz alone. Finally, something very weird happened. Now, we knew that Christians talked about being born again. But then, born again was a phrase used by the Masons and a phrase used by the witches. Didn't mean anything. But we had been taught by the doctrine of astrology, which, by the way, it takes three things to practice witchcraft. Astrology, herbs, and jewelry, or talismans. So witchcraft or an astrology I learned from a very early child. One thing I'd been taught was I was born a set personality. The stars had decided what my personality was going to be like. And there was no way, no right in witchcraft, no nothing that would ever change my personality. If I was bad, I was bad. Besides, I didn't consider myself too bad. I mean, I could have always been a Christian. That would have been terrible. So I sat there and I watched him, and he changed. He wasn't just as saying, I'm born again. He changed. Now listen to me tonight. 
If you've walked the aisle and you've given your heart to God and there wasn't a complete turnaround, a complete change, and you went back to the way that you were five minutes before you walked that aisle, something is wrong. I'm not a Billy Graham that will have you say three words and say you're saved. It's in the fruit, and if there has not been a change in your life, something's wrong. And I got up and I walked out of that theater in utter confusion. Here was another thing that was in the Word of God that was happening. I walked on out. man walked up. About a dozen of us, I guess, were walking out of the theater at the one time. He walked up and he passed one track out. He gave it to me. He turned around, didn't say much. He just said, this is for you. Turned around and walked off. The track was called Bewitched. So I sat there and I read. I said, hmm, this guy's pretty smart. He says that Bewitched was put on by the witches. Well, I knew that. My foster mother was one of the producers. I practically grew up on the sets. I sat there and I watched the rest of the track, Ouija board being run by demons. Well, we knew that. That's why witches didn't use Ouija boards. We let the Christians use it. So I read on, but the one thing I could not get over was this hell thing with the flames and the devil, because witches don't believe in the devil. Satanists do, not witches. So I said, ah, oh, this guy's so right, but he's probably just a dumb Christian. Threw it in the water, walked on. Started going to go back to my apartment, got in the casino building, heard the music coming from one of our nightclubs there called the Club Aquarius, decided to go on over. Nobody there that I knew except the staff, so I went on back and locked the door to the manager's office, and I sat down. I said, i got to think this thing out. I'd like to talk to a Christian. I was talking to a man on the phone today, Jack Chick, and he was going over all the people that he had found in his investigations that were on the Illuminati pay roll that were ministers, supposed to be fundamental ministers. And I said, yeah, I know, Jack. As I sat in that manager's office that night, he knew my testimony. I said, my biggest problem was I spent two hours trying to think of a pastor in the town that we did not have on our payoff. Well, they were pastors. That's why I didn't know them, because they weren't on our payoff. And finally, I remembered that just the night before, one of our witches, which was a prostitute in the area, in downtown San Antonio, had come in screaming in the Club Aquarius, and I wasn't in the mood to hear any screaming, particularly from her at the moment, going through withdrawal. But she was complaining that she was going bankrupt. And what the problem was, was her area was over by the Greyhound bus station, and she'd be over there prostituting, and some idiots from a Christian coffee house would come over and preach to the guys as she would proposition them. That could really put you out of business. I mean, no serviceman's going to walk off with a prostitute with somebody telling them about hell at the same moment. So she decided we had to do something about the place, and I told her to get lost, but I remembered it. And I said, well, that's only eight blocks away. It's only two in the morning. Nobody would be in bed at two in the morning. Which is a night, people, you know. Took off walking on over there. The place had a reputation of its own. Just three months earlier, it had been a burlesque place, show bar with strippers in it. Baptist preacher said, enough is enough. We don't need this down here. He goes in, jumps up on the bar stool, up on the bar, shoves two strippers in the middle of their act off the bar, and starts preaching. Fifteen minutes later, the two strippers have pulled the curtains down off the wall, wrapped them around them, kneeling down at the bar, giving their heart to the Lord. They're still Christians this day, by the way. I, I know them. The man and woman that owns the place is praying, giving their heart to the Lord. Three members of the four-piece band are two of the three bartenders and about 15 of the customers. That's a quick revival. I like to have that quick. So I went on over there. Now, they had turned the, tie, the deed to this place when they got saved. This is what I mean about a change in your life. They could have rented the building out. They took the deed and they gave it to one of the Baptist churches in the area and said, do what you want with it. Just turned it into a Christian coffee house. What better way? So I went over, opened the door, and it was supposed to close at midnight according to sign, but the door was unlocked. So I went on in, and one guy was there, bent over the Coke fountain. You know, they trained, changed the booze over for Coke. That's what some Christians haven't done. And he was sitting there working on the Coke fountain, and I went in, and we started talking. And he started witnessing to me. Now, I have nothing against the four spiritual laws or any set plan like the Roman trail or anything like this, they, they're fine. They've won thousands of souls. But that particular plan didn't mean anything to me. I wasn't even interested in it because for mainly I didn't believe totally the Word of God. And I wanted something that would deal with my immediate problems. And I wasn't hearing anything. Finally, he realized that he needed some help, so he called up his pastor. Now, as everybody knows, nobody calls their pastor at three in the morning, do they? No, just all the time. 
So he called him up, the pastor says, well, we've been praying and fasting for this guy along with some other churches. We'll get right on him. I imagine he probably called up a bunch of people. And he come back and said, now, Lord, this is out of my hands. The man's name was Claude Elmer. He said, this is out of my hands. I don't know the first thing about witchcraft. I don't know the first thing about the devil's kingdom. But you do. And he quoted Luke uh, chapter 10, where the Lord had saw the devil fall from heaven, and we had power over the devil. And he said, now, you were there when it happened. You educate me right now. What scriptures do I give this man? And he said, I'd like to read you something. He opened his Bible to 2 Timothy 1.7. It is the best scripture in the world to witness to anybody in the occult. Because when you're in the occult, there's one thing that you do not have. You do not have a mind without fear. 24 hours a day. You live in a nightmare world and you try to convince yourself by brainwashing yourself that you're not unhappy. And he sat there and he said, God can remake your mind and take away the fear. And when he said, take away the fear, I said, let's get with this thing right now. And he started praying with me, and he led me in a prayer of salvation. And I remember when I closed, I said, Lord, I want your forgiveness. I want to miss hell. I believe in it now. But I want you to take this fear out of my life. And I was sitting there shaking, scared to death. Somebody's going to walk through the door anytime and see me in this place and report me. I said, Lord, take the fear away. And when I got up out of there, I didn't have any fear. In fact, I walked back, went right on in my apartment, sat down, took a Bible with me. And when I went down the next day... I was reading the Bible, walking into the occult store. The fear was so far gone, I almost got myself killed. When God does it, he does it right. Now, we've been trying to minister to people in the occult for a long time. We've really been spinning our wheels for five and a half years. We've gotten about 500 people saved. About 50 of them have been killed. When I was here last, we'd been in prayer for two weeks about a new idea that we felt would work. And that was a retreat for the occult to go to. This Monday, on their New Year's Day, couldn't have been arranged better. We didn't do it on purpose, but it was perfect. While their grand jury were meeting, our rehab center opened. First candidate is already in it. Right now, coming from Maryland, is a girl that's the second most powerful person that had ever left the Illuminati. Philip Rothschild's own girlfriend, teenage girlfriend leaving left of the occult from the eleventh richest family we found out about the house going to be open before our plan to release the news through chick publication tracks and the phone numbers to go with it ever came out. They're not even off the press yet and the occult world already knows and is calling hotline numbers that aren't even published yet. They somehow found the numbers. Another girl was saved two days ago, I don't even know who she is, I'm holding my breath because she knows me. Jack Chick got a call today, so the girl walked into a Christian bookstore and says, I hear John Todd's still alive. The guy said, yes. He's been alive for five and a half years? And he said, yes. Well, if he can be alive for five and a half years, I can be alive for five and a half years. I want to become a Christian and get out. Now, that is sweeping. That type of news is sweeping. You may not understand what that means. But if you were in East Berlin trying to get to West Berlin and there was a wall of death between you, you'd know what it means. If they tore that Berlin Wall down, you can imagine the East Berliners, how many would be flooding to West Berlin. Well, that wall of fear and death that the Illuminati has so strongly built up has just been shattered. We have done in the last month things on purpose that they have promised the occult world would never happen. Isaac Bonowitz, the Rothschild's own enforcer and one of those 13 top witches, lives in Frisco. He promised that the number one witchcraft city in the United States I would never preach in, San Francisco. We preached there two Sundays ago. He's got a lot of explaining to do. And the word is getting around. We need your prayers. There's a revival breaking open in the occult world now. They've gotten the word. There's a way out. I'm just going to have to start praying for three or four more buildings. Because if this car load gets here, we're not going to have much more room. we got a four-bedroom house. It can fill up pretty quick with a bunch of witches in it. So, by the way, we need your prayers just for that. You've never been in a situation until you have about 15 witches all around you at one time, all with different problems. My poor wife, she couldn't come with me tonight because she's setting up trying to get this one girl through it right now. So we do need your prayers. I want to thank the people who did take envelopes and send them. I think something like 500 envelopes were taken that night and we received them. But those 10 helped get that house open. And I want to thank the people who sent them. But I'm asking your prayers. We need 
your prayers. Now, if the pastor comes up, I want to say a couple words. You may not be in witchcraft. You may not think that this message has anything to do with you. But you're missing the whole point. I was in a world where it was impossible to become a Christian, and Jesus made me one. I was by one of the girls that I used to live with when I was in the occult world recently. She was at a very important witchcraft meeting that we happened to find out about, and I pulled into the parking lot for a few minutes to see who was there. And she walked by the car and had a couple of Christian brothers with me. She looked in the car and just smiled, kept on walking, never recognized me. That's the difference between the way I am now and the way I was then. When the Lord changes you, he totally changes you. Now, we give our testimony for several reasons to show that no matter what, whether you were raised a Christian and you, you know, all your life, or you were raised in the worst frame of life, it's still the same miracle. God still saves you just the same. Sometimes I think it's harder to get the PKs and the Christian kids saved than it is the witches. But at the same time, we try to flag you down from going the same direction we went, with drugs. You'll never know the feeling to lose so many friends that should be with you today and so many loved ones because of drugs that we kept convincing ourselves was all right. This isn't some preacher getting up here and telling you that's never been in it. I wished I had a half hour to talk about the worst thing that the occult world ever planned out and carried out. That's called rock music. But I'm going to say two quick things. Parents, the rock music does not belong to you, your kids. If your kids are in your home, it belongs to you and you're answerable for it. And if you want to believe they're garbage, that it's all right, and you want to forget things like Kiss saying that their real name is Kings and Satanic Service, and that rock music is actually satanic spells being cast, and being planned by the Satanist Church, and that's a direct quote, then you go right on ahead. Right now, the Manson, one of the Manson family girls is in trial, and she said the number one thing that the occult world used to brainwash them was Beatle music and rock music. If you want to leave it in your home, I won't go into details why you can't, but if you want to leave it in your home and all the demons that it attracts, fine. If you want your kids to buffalo you, that it's all right. But I recommend you go home today get a cardboard box and break the records and burn those covers and get it out of your home. And you'd be surprised at how fast your kids come around after they finish throwing their two-year-old tantrum. But I wish that I had the time more on rock music, but believe me, it is the work carefully planned out in the occult world. We spent $8 million to produce Jesus rock music and paid the man who started it named Chuck Smith just because Christians were destroying rock music and we were afraid that it would be banned from the Christian church. So we carefully put it in the form of Christian rock music. So if they would spend $8 million to keep rock music in your hands, then the hardcore rock must be even worse. And it is. I'm going to... Okay, Pastor. I don't mind. I drove all day so I could say these things. I, have a, I was the manager of Zodiac Productions, which Zodiac Productions name has been changed since then. I'm not even sure what they call it now, but it's the largest music conglomerate in the world. It owns RCA Records, Columbia Records, Motown Records. owns almost all the concert booking agencies in the United States. And that's not even the, the name of the company that owns it. The name of the company that owns it is Brenner Enterprises. And Brenner Enterprises is owned by Chase Manhattan. Chase Manhattan is owned by Standard Oil. And Standard Oil is owned by the Lords of London. You can track it on back. You kind of get the idea after a while. But I was the managing president of Zodiac Productions. It was one of my jobs as being one of these 13 people. Thus, I got to know many of the people who produce music and sing the music and play the music that you play. Recently, one of the top people in rock music from the group, um, um, I can't think of the name of the group now, it's one of the top rock groups still in existence that's been around a long time, was just saved. And he told how when they play in their concerts, they would control through witchcraft spells in their mind the people to do different things in the audience. And they'd work the audience up, not with the music, but with their mind and their music combination. Now, one of the closest friends that I got during that time that I obtained was a man named David Crosby. Crosby still nation young. And I saw David the day before Christmas last year. talked with him. I got him away from this witch that he had with him. He told her to go shopping. We were in West Hollywood, and I was witnessing around to people I knew. We went off in this store, and we started talking. I said, David, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. I said, I already know the answers, but I've been gone for five years. I'd like to know if certain things are still the way they were when I left. I said, did they, now I have to explain some of this when I'm done, because you're not going to understand it all unless you know something about music. 
I said, do they still take the master to the temple room? Dave said, yeah. I said, do they still have the colon conjure demons into the master? He said, of course. I said, now, i got to know something. What's the main reason for rock music? He said, come on, Lance, you know what the reason is. I said, please, David, I don't want to guess. Tell me what the main reason is. He said, the same as when you were in, so that we can place spells on people that we couldn't cast spells upon. I'll explain what that means in a minute. I said, okay, one last thing. I've been hearing that you must be an initiated witch now to get a record contract. He said, that's right. He said, many of us that weren't total witches have to be witches now in order to produce music. I said, thank you. The master is a tape about as big as the top of this podium that looks like an overgrown eight track that the album is cut on and is placed in a machine that produces and presses the records and the eight tracks and cassettes that you buy. After it's been recorded, it's taken in. This is why a master's cut months in advance before it's released. On the full moon, it's taken in to a temple room about the size of this auditorium that is in every one of the major music companies behind locked doors up in the executive offices. And it's placed on an altar sitting in the north of the room and a pentagram engraved in the floor. And 13 hand-chosen witches and witch wizards and a coven come in and conjure a principality or a power up, usually Regia or something like that, and order him to tell the demons under him to follow every record and every tape coming off of that master. As I tell many Christian parents, you can go home and count your kids' records, probably yours too, and count how many demons at least are there. If that's too hard for you to believe, I'm sorry. That's why they do it. Now listen to me. This is why rock music is addicting. Have you ever seen kids that got rid of their music? They go around like this. They can't wait to find a rock station somewhere and they sneak off just like getting a cigarette or a fix because it's addicting. That's why they can't give it up. The rest of the conversation was this. You can't cast a spell on a Christian, but you can get a Christian to cast a spell on themselves. If you give the permission for the spell to work, being a Christian won't block it. And rock music is not just a song. It is supernatural music that which is carefully designed by their spirit guides or familiar spirits in the form of spells. Now, although the devil's music's par is the music and God's music is the words, much of the songs are written in what we call witch language. Give you kind of an idea. You talk, on, many of you talk on a CB, unless you know what you, what a smoky is, and uh, a tin four, and uh, uh, a front door and back door and rocking chair and these type of things, you don't know what you're talking about. Same with witches. When you're in the first and second level, you have to learn over 2,000 words that said by anybody else means something totally different than when you say them. Elton John has said he's never written a song or sung a song that wasn't in which language. Now I want to show you something. See how many kids in here will be honest and adults. How many remember and have heard at least several times a song called Hotel California? Somebody tell me what it meant. Quickly, somebody tell me what it meant. Huh? That's pretty close. But from the words, what did it mean? Well, that's more of a guess. See, most people can't tell you. That's why when people do drugs and they listen to songs in which language, they get some of the meaning. But most of the time, they can't tell you. Stop and think how many songs are out there that you really like and you don't have any idea what the person was talking about. Beyond the Yellow Brick Road? How about The Destroyer by Kiss? Can anybody tell me what it's about? Kiss said in it, kids, tell your parents. They're talking about Helder Skelter. Beatles sung Helder Skelter in which language nobody knew what it meant. Manson did because he belonged to the process. Helder Skelter is a several, several thousand year old word. And they're believing that it's going to happen in a year from now, from this very date. Most of the music is either about Helder Skelter or a place called the Night Winds, which is what Hotel California is about, and different doctrines of witchcraft. You listen to them, your parents let you listen to them, and they have no idea. Kiss openly bragged how they were gaining control of people through their music because the people played their music. They told how they didn't form their own group. Their church, because they were ordained ministers of the Satanist church, placed them together. And that's how most of the music is done. David Crosby, when him and Crosby, still nice and young, produced the record Two-Way Street, they ordered the Principality of Medea to order demons of rebellion to go into the record and everybody that heard it would be rebellious against law and order and government. And it was one of the reasons for the great upheaval in the 60s was that one album. And they take open credit for it. I can go on all night, but that's mainly it. Parents, get this stuff in and destroy it now. I guarantee 
your kids will straighten up. They may pout for a while, but they'll straighten up. <laughs> okay. Sorry it's so late. All right. We've had live action here. We're a bunch of nine owls now. <laughs> this ain't nothing. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you believe he knows what he's talking about when he talks about rock music? Huh? Not enough of the kids, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Well, I sincerely believe he knows exactly what he's talking about there. Um, and I hope you'll listen to him. I hope you'll hear where he's coming from. And if you continue listening to that junk, where well, you're going. We just cannot tolerate it as Christian people in our homes. You can't stop it from being played and sold all that, but we can't tolerate it. Uh, you mentioned a time or two the Illuminati. Could you, in just a few words, summarize what you understand the Illuminati is? Okay. Many people call it the Great Conspiracy, which is kind of true, but actually the Illuminati is about a thousand conspiracies all running at one time. Therefore, a lot of them backfired. But it was formed about a hundred years before its original birth date. The birth date is May 1st, 1776, which has always started everything on May 1st. That's why even the communist birthday is on May 1st. That's their New Year's Day. But it means the holders of the light or the light bearers. Now, witches have another name for it, too. Since it is a death penalty to use the name the Illuminati, you must say Mariah, which means the conquering, destroying wind. But its, its belief is that Lucifer is God and that everything else is imposter and that Lucifer can bring peace to the world by his lifters or upholders conspiracy. And they're going to conspire and conspire and conspire till they have a world government. Sometimes I wonder why they could be so dumb that they're doing exactly what is going to lead to their destruction. But then that's usually how the devil is. He keeps everything in darkness. But that's the Illuminati. It's a world conspiracy, and I might add, an extremely powerful one. The occult is, is its religion. Now, many of you are doctors, lawyers, mechanics, construction workers, businessmen, whatever. Most of you are Christians and Baptists. Okay? But he's your minister. Or at least if you're from this church. And the Illuminati, they all have jobs. But the witches are their ministers. But they're all Luciferian. The witches are the ministers and they're the church members and the religion is Luciferianism. Now, the real Illuminati, the organization itself, is financially powerful and politically motivated. Through their finance, they have an old witch's room, which is kind of a saying, a poem. They say, let the kings be kings, let the bankers be bankers, and let the priests be priests. Translated, it simply means that it doesn't matter who rules, as long as the bankers have the money, they'll own the person who rules, and the priests will run the bankers. That's the Illuminati. Okay. You mentioned John, uh, some publication, you said it might be out in about three months. What, what is that again? It's called Riot and Revolution. It's by Tom Berry, a classmate of my pastor, Roland Rasmussen, graduate from Bob Jones, a doctor in divinity. And it, it takes the plan of the Illuminati for Helter Skelter and gaining control of the world. It takes some of my testimony to justify it. And then it gives an answer to Christians what to do during Helter Skelter. Now, where did the material come from and how did he get it? Some of it came from me and some of it came from another minister named Joe Boyd. Some of it came from Jack Howe. He's gathered it. Also, he had about 20 pages of notes when I met him, which he said he gained by going through about 2,000 books. I think we're on the Illuminati and the Bilderbergers. Okay? Yeah. Satan worshippers believe in Satan, uh, which is the lower three levels believe in God or else God's self in ESP and so on. They believe in plural gods like the mother goddess Isis and so on. Or the higher levels are Luciferians which believe in one God and the minor gods being in the Rothschild. Okay? That's the difference. You mean the average uh, witch is not taught that there is such a being as Lucifer or oh, the no. devil? Uh -uh. Well, for one, when you believe in Lucifer, you don't believe it's the devil. Okay? Uh, no. They believe in the mother goddess, which is called by many names, as the poem about her goes. Diana, Isis, Asherah, which was the female side of Baal. And they believe, actually it's Baal worship. There was a male and female god. Asherah, and, uh, and then the horned hunter of the night is the way he's portrayed in all countries, which is more or less kind of the underworld god, the devil, or whatever. Okay. All right. Anybody with a question or two before we... We're going to take a love offering here. There's no difference. What was his question? The difference between rock music and soul music. There's no difference. Okay. All right. Some other question. In the back. They didn't come up with it. That, that was about a hurricane that somebody named Mariah. Okay? okay. Yes. Yes. What are the 
In the Satanist church, Christ and Jesus are the same person, okay? No, that's the teaching. In the Satanist church, Christ, Jesus Christ, and Satan are the same person. That's the Satanist belief. And the Luciferian, they believe that Jesus Christ is the God of evil, okay? Like we would feel about the devil, they feel about Jesus. And Lucifer, they feel towards him like we'd feel about Jesus. That's what they teach, okay? Oh, they... I don't know what he said, but it must have been good. Well, a pastor didn't lead me. A Christian worker led me to the Lord. Uh, the person that helped rehabilitate me was Jack Taylor, but he wasn't around much because he, he was a pastor. He had to run around the country speaking. It was actually his music director and the youth director. Ann Rowitz was the youth director and the music director was Malcolm Granger. And I stayed with Malcolm and him and his wife worked with me and the music, I mean, the youth director worked with me quite a bit. But I don't envy him. I've sat back now, and I guess I kind of blocked my mind out how bad I was. But watching all these kids go through rehabilitation, man, that was no easy job. They had to be on their knees a lot, I'll tell you. Oh. Black Sabbath. You talking about the music group or a Black Sabbath? Well, the music group got its name from it. A Black Sabbath is a witch's Sabbath, okay? It comes eight times a year. Beltane, if I can get the first part, Bell, Beltane is their New Year's Day. That was May 1st, okay? Halloween is Shaham. That was also one of theirs. There's eight of them, okay? And they come around the year, and it's more or less their big party day. Their super, super day. Now, if they're in the human sacrifice, they also do human sacrifice at the time. But it's a big time to have an orgy and a big drug party and this type of thing because everybody wiped out. That's the witch's Sabbath. No? Well, not the Satanist church, but the witchcraft church is. Uh, a very, very powerful witch has a song out about witchcraft now called The Force. His name is Tom T. Hall. Uh, I just heard a very sick song recently. Somebody let me hear. It was by Tammy Wynette, and it was talking about Jesus Christ appearing on um, Midnight Special or something like Saturday Night something. Anyway, I'm afraid that if he appeared on that rock show, he'd probably bring the Cat of Nine Tails along with him. But um, there, some of the music... If it wasn't for witchcraft being behind rock music, I'd hate the country the most. Because I don't see how Christians can listen to it when it's talking about adultery and fornication, getting drunk, cutting people up, running around with everybody else's wife, and things like this. And that's all I ever hear on it. Okay? Lynn. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what they were referring to. Yeah, they did. No, I'm not going to tell you. Okay? I believe uh, Vic and then Russ. Mm -hmm. Human sacrifice? Uh, that's pretty... Oh, the occasion. So, oh. Well, the occasion was on a Sabbath, okay? That particular Sabbath happened to be uh, February the 2nd, Candleman, okay? Uh, what about, what was the rest of it? Well, it's done, that particular one was done because of an initiation ceremony that was being done, mine. But most of the Colvins just practice eight times a year if they're in the blood sacrifice. Uh, like, uh, See, the lower witches believe that the power for witchcraft comes from orgies and sex. The higher witches believe it's attained by human blood. Okay? Russ, how many you had your hand? It's a revolution that they have planned within the United States. Most people feel that something like that will never happen in the United States. They're lying to themselves. It will happen. And it's not very far off. Well, by 1980, there'll be... Helder Skelter is only an excuse. Okay? The excuse is to be able to declare martial law. That's the whole reason for it. They promised the one side that they will be able to gain control of the United States through revolution, when the whole time is they're just simply setting them up to be able to declare martial law and suspend the Constitution. And by 1980, they plan on being under martial law. Now, I'm not saying, don't all of you start lunching me at one time, I didn't say it was going to happen, I said, this is their plan, okay? I'll leave it up to your own prayer life and watching the newspapers whether it's going to happen or not. Maxine. Just like most other cults, the, see, Jesus Christ requires just one way. Only one way. The devil will use any way to keep your eyes off that one way. Okay? And he uses the same tactics wherever it branches to. I have no idea if the, they, he came out after I got out. I have no idea. They were back in groups like him before, the Krishners and so on. I can't see much difference between them and those two groups. So they probably back him too. Okay, Mike and then Bob. Yeah, the Council of Foreign Relations. Yeah, and it's, it's, inner brainchild that runs it. It's called the Trilateral Commission. Okay? I'll leave Bob and then Barbara. 
Yeah, there's seven principalities, about uh, 200 powers. Then it starts getting down into lower people we never pay attention to, the lower spirits. Mother? Yeah, um, I want to go to all, just recently, about three weeks ago in April, the day before Jack Howes came to our church to speak, and the day after he left, I came, uh, both times I came walking out of the church at Faith Baptist. One time I got in my car, started to drive off in the parking lot, about 30 people were standing around, and a passing car opened up on us with a gun. And then, that was Sunday night, then Wednesday night of that week, I was walking out into the parking lot prior to the church letting out with a couple of brothers. And when we dug the bullets out of where they hit, they had fired twice at us and the bullets were 44 caliber, 44 magnum. So they don't play around. And the range was so close, it was from the back of that wall to here. You know that the Lord is in it. It really makes you appreciate his divine protection, let me tell you. Bruce? That world takeover plan ended with World War III. But one of the teachings is that when Lucifer sets up his kingdom, okay, that through World War III, most of the civilized world as it exists now will be in rubble. And the one protected capital that they have purposely kept all missiles away from, from both sides, is Jerusalem. And they plan on using Jerusalem to set up from there, okay? Do they believe that Adam's original home, or the Garden of Eden, rests where Jerusalem is? So that's going to rule from there. Uh, Mike and then Robin, we better let that maybe... <laughs> Very quick. Uh, the church that I attend, and remember of it, Faith Baptist in Canoga Park, Dr. Rasmussen, uh, the work where it's at, the house, has got to remain a sound. Okay? Very well. All of our church walk around, people trying to find out where it's at, and everybody, shh, it's like the unspeakable secret. Okay? Everybody right. knows, but nobody says. He was a member of the Process Church of the Final Judgment, which in California is called Universal Trump Tri Church Triumphant Summit International. They always like these names. Okay. Okay. Let's see, Randy. Not anymore. I try to keep out of communication as much as possible with them. Um, my foster mother has a huge contract on my life, and my brother's trying to collect it, so I try to stay away from him. By the way, Randy, you cannot communicate with them. You're communicating with demons. They imitate them. They cannot speak to you. Let's see. Uh, yes, brother. All I could... You mean in counting all eight Sabbaths, they last year, from May, May 1st to May 1st, probably 500, and that's only a guess. I'm probably way under. Dwayne has uh, one of his books, Chick Publication, I believe it is, and in the, it's made up like a comic book. It tells you... Here it is. Broken Crop. Yeah. That's the one I wrote. This is the one that tells you one of their main methods of how they get victims to offer up in blood sacrifice. All right, Robin, I think we better let this be it. Okay, give me about a minute on this here. Uh, repeat her. Question. Okay, you heard at a Christian school. What one? Oh, I'm high school. Okay. You heard that C.S. Lewis was a Christian, right? Okay. First of all, Christian Accelerated School has, what I'm about to tell you, have investigated what I said. Christian Accelerated Education, and because of it, are now ordering all their schools to ban Lewis's work. They checked into it very carefully. So did my pastor, because he was getting hit very hard with it. He found everything I said to be true. When a witch is ready to be initiated, she must not just read, but she must study the complete work of Lewis, fictional work. Lewis has said that the way to God is like a hallway with many doors. They all lead to him. Okay? Now, the fictional works of Lewis are very real to witches. They're not fictional. They're history to witches. They really believe them. Okay? They believe their guidelines. Now, Lewis was a member of the Golden Dawn. Now, that's been proven along with a fellow brother of the same coven named Token, who wrote The Hobbit. They were in the same time. Now, the Golden Dawn is the private church that the Rothschilds must pick every member of that church personally. It's in London. The oldest coven in the world. Okay? That's Lewis. Whether he says he's a Christian or not, that doesn't mean anything. That's where Christians are making their terrible mistakes. Could it be that he was like that, and like you said, he got converted, now he is no longer that? He would have had to tell it. When Lewis name was on the Golden Dawn records right up to the time that I got out. I mean, there's no betrayal there. He never did leave them. Okay? I want to say something real quick that will answer this. Many people supposedly are getting saved from the Manson family and from other things. Let me tell you something real quick so you, there will be no misunderstanding. You come out of the occult, you come out of the Masons, you come out of anything in the Illuminati, there's one distinct thing. Anywhere there's a vow of secrecy, that vow of secrecy must be broken. Not in part, please. 
When somebody breaks their complete vow of secrecy, they're out. But until they do, they're not out. Okay? Charlie, this is it. That's right. Then a double what? Which is language. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Did you hear his question? How do Masons relate to all of this? Okay. Listen closely, you Masons. Council 13 is the highest council in the Illuminati. The council right below it is the Council 33. That's called the Grand Masters. There are the 33 highest Masons in the world. To be a member of the Council of 33, you must take a human life in a ceremony to prove your worthiness. We have in our hands copies, and Chip Publications is releasing this in their new book, Angel of Life. Copies of a 32nd, 33rd level book which proclaims Jesus Christ, the God of brutality and sin and evil, and Lucifer, the God of love, beauty, and peace, and the true God. Yeah, a little shocking, huh? Different from the way it's portrayed. But don't be mad at the lower masons. It also says in the same book that the lower masons are sheep to be sheared. Now, many masons are getting saved through our message, lower and higher, because they recognize when I, and I didn't tonight, gave my initiation to become a witch, and my vow of secrecy is the same as theirs, all the way through, the same, no different. Now, masons were started by the Illuminati. It's all through our history that they're tied with the Illuminati. Their rights are witchcraft rights, when witchcraft had to go underground. We've had people come in and tear up their membership cards and get right with the Lord. Mainly because, if you didn't know this, Charles Finney was a Mason, and when he got saved, he said, I can't be a Mason and be a Christian. It is impossible because of the vows I must take are non-Christian vows. Okay? People are getting saved right and left, and they all have one thing to say. When they leave the Masons, the reason they didn't leave before is they were afraid of what the Masons would do to them. Now, if it is a good group, why are people afraid to leave it?